it's it's 10 o'clock by by my, by my watch um welcome to this meeting of hertfordshire uh, county council um and i'd like to welcome uh, uh, we have several guests who will be speaking today i'd like to welcome them too and uh, there will be no prayers um, um preceding this council meeting so on to chairman's announcements the first one regards um covid 19 it's a standard uh, declaration at the, be at the beginning of these meetings at the moment. Um, who knows for how much longer? So regarding the attendance at this meeting, due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding the, this meeting electronically in accordance with the relevant regulations. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of the Council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish. It's helpful if you don't. If you experience connection or other technical issues, it may help also to switch your camera off. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking in the meeting. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raised hand function Use of the meeting chat function is exclusively for, for voting. And at the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should use the electronic voting forms, which will be loaded to the center of your screen, and that will be the white square. And also at the bottom of the meeting in the chat bar at the appropriate time, but we will prefer it if you use uh, the white screen in the middle of, the, uh, of, of, your, of your screen, as it were, because that will help uh, with the um, recording of the votes, which is essential uh, for the budget part of this meeting. So it, you can select and submit your vote and I will declare the result after each vote. And we will also show uh, within the budget debate, we will show how people have voted by name um, after each, each part of that, that voting. Um, breaks of five minutes will be held every hour and will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished speaking. If we are voting, the vote will be concluded before the break is taken. Other breaks will be incorporated um, as appropriate. And we will be taking a lunch break, hopefully at about one o'clock for 30 minutes. So moving on in the agenda, I haven't, I haven't received any apologies. And in view of the coronavirus pandemic, pandemic, any members not present at this meeting are considered to have given uh, um, their Apologies. Um, moving item to item one minutes. Uh, uh, can I ask our members to confirm the minutes of the meeting held at 10 a.m. on the 15th of December uh, on, in 2020? So does the council confirm the minutes of the meeting on 15th of December are a correct record? Can Agreed. you? Agreed. Agreed. If there are any objections, we put them in the chat box now, but I, no dissenting so far so those minutes are agreed moving on to chairman's announcements at this stage um item item two and regarding thank you we don't need any more agreements on the on them on the minutes okay thank you right um Chairman's announcements and my first uh, duty is a sad one, really. It's about the death of a former county councillor. Sorry, cha Chair, there is something missing from the minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I've put my that? hand up. It's Councillor Bennett Lovell. Um, so I, I think if I've, unless I've mis misread the minutes, there is missing in them or from them, sorry, uh, the recorded vote on the motion that I put forward. I'm not sure that there's uh, confirmation as to who voted for, or against, or abstained on that. So I'd like that to be corrected in the December minutes, please. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. That will be looked at after the meeting, if that's if that's OK with you. OK, right. Right. Have we finished with the minutes now? Yes, Margaret, I have seen you. Right, moving on then to um, agenda item two, chairman's announcements. And I say, I'm sad to, uh, to inform members of the 
death of the former county councillor and honorary alderman Alan Searing. Um, this is the first opportunity that we have had as, 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 a, as a councillor group to reflect on Alan's time um, as a councillor. So, Caroline, uh, Ad, Alan passed away several weeks ago. He served as a member of the County Council for over 20 years, serving five terms, first as the member for Sheshan North from 1997 to 2001, and then for Hoddesdon South from 2001 until he retired from the Council in 2017. During his time as a county councillor, Alan served in a number of roles, including as chairman of the Resources, Prosperity, Partnership and Consultation Select Committee, chairman of the Children's Services Cabinet Panel and chairman of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. And during this time with the county council, he also served on a, num with, on a number of other meetings, including the Community Safety and Resources and Performance Cabinet Panels and the Pensions Committee. An active community champion, Alan also represented the council on several outside bodies, including the Hearts Educational Foundation, Lee Valley Regional Park Authority, and the Hearts Young Mariners based, uh, that's the Cheshire Sailing Base, so for which he continues to serve as a director after retiring from the council. Outside of the county council, Alan's voluntary work included activity as a trustee for the Dame Letitia Monson Trust for over 40 years, where he served as its chairman for the past 27 of those years. He was appointed as an honorary alderman of the County Council in 2017. And I'd now like to invite uh, tributes um, from the chamber, the virtual chamber. And I believe, Dave, Dave Hewitt, could I ask you uh, to speak, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, I first became friends with Alan well over 40 years ago, years ago when we uh, met at our local Conservative clubs. Our kids actually grew up together, went to school together and socialised together. Later, Alan even headhunted one of our sons to be the sales manager of a new Range Rover dealership of which he was a financial director. When my father suddenly died, Alan, as the trustee of the local arms house, Dame Letitia Monchin, which you've already mentioned, Chairman, he was able to offer my mum a flat in Broxbourne so she could live near us, and she lived there happily for over 11 years. It was Alan that recruited me to stand for Chesant County Councillor 16 years ago and was always on hand to give me advice, guidance, in those early years. I joke with him that he never told me how much time being a county councillor would involve, but he just laughed and said, if I'd have done that, Dave, you'd never join. As soon as possible, the trustees and the friends of the Young Mariners base at Chesant will hold an event in memory of Alan and the work that he did there as chair of the board. I will always remember Alan with great fondness. He was a good and kind friend who treasured his family. His first, first and foremost, he was a thoroughly decent chap and he will be much missed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Dave. And I, I, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with, with some of the comments that you've made. You know, he was a, a very thoughtful person to work with. Um, could I ask Nigel Quinton, please? You're speaking on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group, Nigel, yes? Thank you. Um, yes, it's, it's slightly odd for me to be speaking on this because I actually never met Alan in person. Um, but And I didn't know him as a county councillor. I knew him through discussions about the Young Mariners base, which mostly took place during lockdown last year. And I have to say, he was, as Dave says, just a lovely man. Um, we struck a chord immediately, helped that I'd actually learned to sail at Cheshire when I was a very young scout. Um, and we talked for probably 45 minutes just on the first call, just, just talking about this, that and everything, putting the world to rights. I didn't even know he was a Conservative County Councillor at all until I saw the notice of his passing. And it was just very saddening, um, knowing that I would never get to meet the man that I'd struck up um, what I thought was it was the start of a, of a, of a good uh, relationship last year. Um, so, yes, just to endorse everything David said. 
Um, and I think I think actually responding to one thing David said, we all have an Alan who got us into this. <laughs> and, uh, uh, mine is Malcolm Coward, but uh, it's uh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, from what I little I know of him, I'm, I'm absolutely certain he'll be sorely missed. Thank you so much, Nigel. Um, Sharon Taylor, I believe you're, you're going to offer the tribute from the Labour Group. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, uh, my uh, knowledge of Alan goes back a, a very long way to when he was a member of the Hertfordshire Police Authority. Um, Alan was uh, and the lovely tribute from Dave Hewitt ab absolutely encapsulated him. He was uh, a kind, gentlemanly, courteous uh, man who uh, we were all very fond of uh, as officers. Um, he was always part of the performance scrutiny team uh, for the police authority, uh, along with um, along with Richard Smith and others. Um, and Alan had that kind. He was he was a, a gentleman. He wasn't one of the uh, loud members of the police authority, but uh, he had that, for those of you that remember Columbo, he had that kind of Columbo touch on performance scrutiny. So you would just think that you'd uh, you'd managed to get through an item and he would say, oh, just one more thing and come back in with another question. So he was a real terrier uh, on the performance scrutiny committee. And it was all the better for that because he's, he, um, he was very incisive and probing in his questions. I think his charity work speaks volumes uh, about Alan, his long 40 year association with um, the Dame Letitia Monson Trust and Arms House Charity, his work with Lee Valley Regional um, Park Authority and the Hartshung Mariners Base, uh, tells you uh, all you need to know about uh, what what a, a kind and generous person uh, Alan was. But um, he was also, uh, I discovered, an author. Um, and I, I didn't know that about him until I started to do uh, some research about him. He wrote a number of books, um, Tips for Success from A to Z, How to Live a Better Life. He had a bit of a thing about 21. So he wrote a number of books about 21 things, 21 positive affirmations. And the one I think we should all uh, perhaps have a look at um, uh, in, in light of this morning's meeting, uh, Chair, is 21 tips to avoid procrastination. Uh, so um, uh, a very, uh, uh, very fond memories of Alan uh, and working with him uh, on the police authority. And he was always kind and courteous in his treatment of opposition members on the county council. So uh, a, a remarkable career in public service and in business. Uh, and uh, we'll all miss him. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And, uh, Proposition 21 is in my mind, let's put it that way. Um, and I finally, uh, Paul Mason, uh, one of the local members uh, for, for Broxbourne area, um, also would like to pay a tribute. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I had the pleasure of knowing Alan for, for, for 20 years when I was, uh, since I was first elected. Um, he always proved reliable and hardworking colleague and someone you could truly depend on. And as Sharon just said, he was very, I mean, he was a gentleman and it, very courteous and polite um, and whatever role he undertook he always gave a hundred percent commitment which was a testament to his character whether whether it was the conservative club which he was chairman of for many years which he oversaw its redevelopment project which involved the moving to new premise back to the young mariners base um, he was concerned because it was uh, suffering financially as a result of the pandemic and he was particularly really grateful to the financial contributions that were made um, by the members and it was the members across the the, 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 the chamber and he was grateful that they'd supported him um, you know you know during that very difficult time um, for those that didn't know Alan and saw him from a distance you always thought he was an unassuming man okay a quite unassuming man but there was another side to him you know at the bar always with a uh, a jug of uh, uh, or a pint of IPA in in hand and he had this sort of real sort of cheeky sort of I mean Dave was saying um, about sort of when he laughed when he said sort of well I wouldn't have told you how you know what's what was involved otherwise you wouldn't have joined up and that was sort of typical of Alan and you can imagine his cheeky little grin or laugh that he would have given and there was that there was a there was a really sort of funny side to him um, but as I said, he, he was always putting on trips and arranging things and whatever he'd done, he, he gave it his best and it was always meticulously organised. And I'll give you one, 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 one event, uh, Madam Chairman, if I may, that he organised a, um, a tour of uh, the, the House of Commons or, or, or the 
um, about 10 years ago, and there's about 40 of us, and uh, it involved uh, a tour of the Commons and the Lords with a three-course meal in one of the dining rooms when the house wasn't sitting. Uh, on the way down, you know, t typical true Alan-esque style, had a little raffle, raised a bit of money, um, had a wonderful tour of, of, of both the houses, had a great meal, wine fr thrown in, and it sort of transpired a few days later. Alan's going, f calling around, saying to everyone, "Of did you did you have any drinks?" And you know, sort of, well, we had the, you know, we didn't order any additional drinks. We just had the drink, you know, the wine that was on the table that was supplied as part of the meal. And I said, "Well, I, you know, never saw anyone ordering around me or opposite me ordering any drinks or anything." You know, a few of us sort of sp spoke to Alan about it, and it transpired. We'd ended up picking up someone else's drinks bill to the tune of three hundred pounds, and that, the day was only saved because our treasurer was there with credit card on hands. All this had been paid for and booked, and poor old Alan was so embarrassed by it. But we we ended up having a laugh about it in the end because it was only I suppose you know how else would have would they manage to have uh, raised the money to pay for the refurbishment? But 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 in all honesty, he was a really I mean da da David said he was a really decent guy and he was a decent guy and he will be truly sadly missed by his, by his family and by all his friends and colleagues uh, so yeah we hope he rests in peace uh, madam chairman thank you right thank you very much paul um i'd now like to invite um council to we get to hold a, a minute's silence a moment of, of reflection on clearly a life well lived in public service so one minute then Right, thank you, colleagues. Right, moving on to item two of the chairman's announcements uh, regards Holocaust Memorial Day. And members may recall at last February's County Council, we marked Holocaust Memorial Day uh, with a, a, min, a minute's silence. Um, Holocaust Memorial Day is marked every year to remember the six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust, alongside the millions of others killed under Nazi persecution and in the genocides that followed in areas such as Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. Each year, Holocaust Memorial Day is held on the 27th of January, the anniversary of the liber liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest Nazi death camp. And this year's theme was Be the Light in the Darkness. Sadly, as we know, even today, prejudice and hatred still need to be challenged by us all. At the Council last February, we came together to support a motion demonstrating Hertfordshire County Council's commitment to rejecting racism, hatred and discrimination, and to advancing equal, equality of opportunity and the promotion of good relations uh, between our communities. And many councillors spoke at that meeting and gave very moving um, orations almost on, on why we were there that morning um, talking about that particular topic. The Council Chamber has sought to deliver on the commitment through the launch of its workforce diversity and inclusion strategy last year. The Council's strategy focusing on diversity and inclusion in regard to its service services and work with communities and partners and is due to be considered at the resources and performance cabinet and sorry resources and performance panel and cabinet uh, next month in order to reassert the commitment the council made um, last year i will now invite you uh, to mark uh, holocaust memorial day uh, with a minute's silence so colleagues 
from Before there. we do, Chair, could I say something? I have my hand up. I'm sorry, Judy, I didn't see you ha your hand. Yes, of course. Thank you but very brief. much. Thank you. It will be brief. I just wanted to say that a number of local count district councils held a very moving Holocaust Memorial Day events on the 27th of yes, January. Did. I was particularly proud of what we were able to do in North Hearts, and it's still available if people want to see it on YouTube. But the point I really wanted to make was that it's one of those strange events where Zoom has actually been our friend rather than our enemy because we were able to be joined um, in North Hearts by uh, watchers from India and from Israel. Um, and I think it's one of those areas of our work where maybe we continue to use Zoom and look for these marvellous opportunities. So I just wanted to add to not subtract from what you've said. Thank you, Judy, much appreciated. And our minute silence will start now. Thank you, colleagues. Right, moving on to item 3A, which is uh, public questions, understanding order 8, bracket 10. I'd like to advise the council there are four public questions have been have Four public questions have been received and in, in accordance with standing orders 8 bracket 12 and 8 bracket 13, the questions will be asked and responded to in the order in which they were received. The period of time allocated to public questions shall not exceed 30 minutes. Any questions remaining after that period has elapsed will be answered in writing within five working days after the date of the meeting. And could I invite uh, Mr. Kevin Ambrose to ask his question. Kevin. Thank you very much, Chair. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you, Kevin. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask the portfolio holder for resources and performance to explain how the recently revised speed management strategy provides value for money for the county's taxpayers. The type of heavily engineered 20 mile an hour zones that comply with this strategy cost over 10 times more than the much larger schemes in other highway authorities, such as Lancashire, Cheshire and Oxfordshire. We note that the recent police and crime commissioner funded study in Watford, undertaken by Mott MacDonald, showed that over 3 million had already been spent on small area 20 mile an hour zones, covering just a third of this very small authority. And we can project from that that the County Council has already spent over 25 million on speed management across the county in recent years. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr Ambrose. Um, could I invite Ralph Sangster to respond, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Mr Ambrose, for raising your question. You raise an important principle regarding value for money. Uh, the Council is focused on ensuring that Hertfordshire taxpayers receive the very best value for money for every pound it spends on their behalf. Uh, it actively promotes service transformation, seeking to redesign and re-engineer service delivery as a mechanism to improve value for money. Uh, this approach has yielded annualized savings uh, of 367 million pounds, amounting to a total of 2.7 billion over the last decade, which has been reinvested in existing service delivery, ensuring service levels are maintained and improved. The Resources and Performance Cabinet Panel regularly calls for reports on service areas where they are concerns over value for money. Uh, in the past two years, we have looked at areas as diverse as carriageway maintenance, children looked after, adult di uh, disability services, communications and SEND transport. It has been my experience that over this period, the one thing which remains common 
to them all is that it is not possible to draw simple benchmarking comparisons with what seems to be similar service provision in other council areas. There are too many variables which affect service delivery, and it is even more difficult to measure and compare outcomes. In regard to the delivery of 20 miles per hour zones, there are not only the normal variables which must be considered when comparing different modes of delivery, there may also be different objectives to consider and the impact and influence of third parties policies on deliverability. I understand from uh, officers in the highways department that in, that in approaching the de development of the new speed management strategy, they consulted widely with local stakeholders such as the police service and considered the latest research and published advice from the Department of Transport. Uh, at the conclusion of their consultation, they identified two alternative approaches to the, product, to the introduction of 20 miles per hour zones. The, prefer, the preferred approach was to implement a strategy in which speed was limited by the local road environment, which gave drivers the right message that they, that they were more likely to ab abide by and, uh, uh, the stated sp speed limits. For many urban roads in Hearts, this was not considered a problem with minimal signage required, but for some areas it would take physical changes to the environment to encourage the right behaviour. It was also uh, uh, recognised that when undertaking changes to the highway environment, they would be in the, the potential to introduce measures that would support active travel. The alternative approach, which was not considered to offer the same safety assurance and associated change in actual behaviour, was to just erect 20 miles per hour signage. The police service have stated that they will not enforce 20 mile per hour limits and from published research they would that they would only have a marginal impact on actual speeds. The only res, uh, principle, the only perceptible be, uh, benefit was that uh, over time the local community might start to observe the new limit. The DFT research study produced by consultants Atkin and Aikham in 2018 shows that there were average speed that where average speeds exceed 24 miles per hour this approach had no real impact on either vehicle speed or accident re uh, record i have considerable respect for the engineers and officers who manage the council's highway service they are respected throughout the local uh, 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 authority network and are often consulted by department of transport on issues of national policy and practice I am satisfied that the decision to include the chosen 20 miles per hour implementation policy in the speed management strategy is, a, is sound and reflects best practice, particularly regarding safety. Uh, in regard to value for money, the strategy has only recently been adopted and will require time for projects to be evaluated and where appropriate implemented. I think that at the appropriate time in the future, when we, had it, when we have enough information to evaluate the, effect, the effectiveness of the policy, the resources and performance panel will want to undertake a value for money review. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, Mr Ambrose, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, if I could follow that up. Um, the data, uh, I, I deliberately chose the two examples there of Lancashire and Cheshire, because using Department for Transport data, uh, the last 10 years shows that in those two or highway authorities, both conservative controlled, uh, the number of killed and seriously injured on their roads have gone down over the 10 year period. In contrast, Hertfordshire, the number of killed and seriously injured has gone up. The cost of implementing the SMS around the rest of the county uh, would be around 40 million pounds. And I've pointed out that Lancashire spent just 6 million covering the whole of their county, which is a larger county by population than Hertfordshire. And Cheshire, Cheshire Western Council, uh, much smaller population spent 800,000. So there's both a cost element to this, and there's also an output measurement in terms of road safety. Uh, no mention was made of either of those in the financial implications reports that went to cabinet. And so I'm asking that you, you liaise, uh, undertake an independent review of costs and benefits using the external auditors value for money arrangements to ensure there's economy efficiency and effectiveness in terms of the, the this issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Ralph, do you wish to reply? Um, I, I, I will make some comments regarding uh, uh, my, uh, my my view of uh, data and its and its and its use. Uh, I know that it's become fashionable to ignore or seek under or, or to undermine well-researched and, and informed views 
on technical issues by expressing an alternative narrative, which often has limited academic support or base is in fact. Uh, I hope we can move on from the era of climate change deniers or the uh, observe or the, the subversive actions of the cohorts of anti-vaxxers. The success of science-based COVID vaccination programs has once, for, once and for all proven that decisions based on well-researched information, which has been rigorously peer-reviewed and challenged, will deliver better outcomes than relying on uh, anecdotal or, pre or preference-biased observations or inappropriate and misleading comparisons. The speed management strategy, including the section on uh, introducing the 20 miles per hour speed limits, has been based on the best information and research available. And I'm confident that the engineers who, com uh, who compiled the document will continue to monitor, review and amend it in light of new evidence based information that may be brought forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, and thank you very much, Mr. Ambrose. Um, right, moving on to item 3B. Can I invite Mr. Anthony Helm to ask his question, please? Hello. Hello, Mr. Helm. I can see you and hear you. Right, OK. Um, thank you, um, Chair. Um, trees are in an increasingly essential part of the urban and suburban environment assisting with pressing issues such as air pollution, mental health, climate change, biodiversity and heat waves. The government's England Tree Strategy Consultation 2020 says that, amongst other things, we wish to see more trees planted in urban and suburban areas overall. In view of this, when precisely can we expect to see a significant net increase in the number of street trees in St Albans and how will HCC achieve this? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Helm. Um, can I ask Phil Bibby to respond, please? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your question, Anthony. The County Council recognises the vital roles, role that trees play within Hertfordshire's towns and countryside. Trees are likely to form an important part of the County Council's response to the climate emergency, which would be delivered through the Sustainable Hertfordshire Strategy, or SHS for short. The County Council responded to the Government's England Tree Strategy Consultation 2020 and is currently awaiting feedback from the Government. Within the County Council, the departments and services with a responsibility for managing and maintaining trees on the public estates are highways, countryside and rights of way service and property, which comprises estates, rural estates and facilities management. The nature and location of the tree stocks managed by these services is diverse and as such suitable management varies considerably. Their management plans will need to align with the county's overarching strategy approach regarding the evolving SHS and the tree resilience and recovery strategy. The County Council's highway service manages approximately 196,000 highway trees, predominantly in Hertfordshire's urban areas through planned and responsive work streams. About 99,000 of these highway trees are managed and maintained under the highway service, with the remaining 97,000 managed and maintained by borough and district councils as agents on behalf of the County Council. Trees in urban areas play an important role in flood prevention, urban cooling and improved air quality. The Highways and Environment Cabinet Panel at its meeting on the 16th of September 2020 endorsed the approach of considering changes to the Council's overarching tree and biodiversity strategies in the round as part of the response to the climate emergency via existing and emerging strategies, including the SHS, a tree and woodland strategy, and a tree resilience and recovery strategy for Hertfordshire. Under the SHS Action Plan, the County Council intend to review the Highway Verge and Tree Maintenance Service next financial year, including consideration for a highway tree planting strategy in order to meet the SHS's objectives, e.g. carbon neutral, improvement of biodiversity, wildlife and clean air, without compromising safety.
This is subject to the necessary funding being secured through the County Council's integrated plan for 2021-22. The Council is also undertaking tree planting as part of the A120 Little Haddon Bypass Scheme and have so far planted in excess of 10,000 trees with a further 39,000 planned under the current contract. Around 900 trees were planted in advance of the current contract, including some on the County Council's rural estate. In addition to the above, in 2017, the County Council planted 4,000 new trees near London Coney and funded to plant, funding to plant 37,000 new trees near Potter's Bar was approved by the Forestry Commission in 2020 the first 20,500 of which have been planted this winter. The County Council is exploring the potential to conduct a review of its rural estate to identify areas best suited for a new tree planting and other habitat creation. Given the above, we cannot at this time give a precise date regarding when we will see a significant net increase in the number of trees in St Albans, nor anyone else for that matter. However, we can say that there has already been a significant net increase in the number of trees across Hertfordshire. Going forward, planting of new trees and replacement trees needs to align with the aforementioned emerging strategies and the principles of the right tree in the right place. The County Council considers biodiversity as a key element of our response to the climate emergency we declared in 2019, and we see tree planting as one of the contributors to biodiversity net gain. Ultimately, this is not an issue that the County Council can re resolve on its own. And so we are working closely with our district and borough colleagues through the Hertfordshire Climate Change and Sustainability Partnership to understand what can be achieved through closer working in this area. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr Helm, uh, do you have a supplementary question? Um, yes, um, Chair, please. Um, I think the answer was um, very comprehensive and it um, indicates that there's um, some positive thinking here and um, uh, it sounds like there's, there's, there's good progress, um, albeit uh, that we don't have a, a, a precise time scale. I think one of the issues is that the general Mr. citizen... Mr Helm, Mr Helm, sorry, do you have a question? You, you, yes, I do. Around, I do. So can you move to your question, yes, please? Yes, sorry. Um, in order to help with this programme, um, could the council identify a dedicated officer to work with local voluntary groups in St Albans to select appropriate street locations um, to plant, um, say, um, 300 trees in addition to what would normally be planted during the next planting season, which would be November to February next year. Would that's, you like to reply? Yeah, that's a very, very positive suggestion. Thank you very much. I mean, our officers are always happy to deal with um, people with good ideas and funding behind them to achieve the, the common goal. So please, if you'd like to forward to us uh, a nominated person that we can actually discuss our strategy with and actually discuss what plans they might have for the local environment. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, right, thank you. Right, Mr Helm, thank you very much indeed. Right, uh, thank you. Your question. Um, now, I'd like to invite uh, Ms Amanda Yorworth, uh, please, if you'd like to join us. Good morning. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so my uh, question is also to Councillor Bibby. In 2018, 26 people were killed on Harpertures roads and 418 were seriously injured. Both of these figures were up on the previous year. So against this backdrop, please, will this council actively promote and organise at least one event or issue a press release or other public statement to support the UN Global Road Safety Week, which this year is the 17th to 23rd of May? The World Health Organization it states that 20 mile an hour limits improve safety, sustainability and greenhouse gas emissions. 20 mile an hour speed limits for places where pedestrians, cyclists and motor traffic mix will be a key call in the UN's road safety speed themed week. So will this council be joining their call? And if not, why not? 
Thank you. Um, Phil, uh, would you like to respond, please? Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Madam Chair. Hertfordshire County Council, or HCC for short, together with members of the Hertfordshire Road Safety Partnership, will be promoting this year's UN Road Safety Week, which will focus on managing speed to reduce fatal and serious road collisions. The campaign is already on the partnership's 2021 calendar, alongside many others, including seatbelts, mobile phones, drink and drugs, and reckless or inappropriate behaviour, together known as the Fatal Five. Exact details are yet to be finalised, but will involve at least one event, press release or other public statement in support. The core principles of HCC's approach to speed management are covered in the recently revised Speed Management Strategy, SMS for short, which was adopted by Cabinet on the 14th of December 2020. HCC's approach to adoption of wider 20 MPH areas is specifically covered in Section 6. HCC acknowledged the public desire for implementation of 20 MPH speed limits over wider areas and has recently announced an additional £7 million over four years for more 20 MPH areas. The place and movement framework within the SMS provides a means of identifying suitable areas where lower speeds are likely to be achieved through consideration of the local road environment, the mix of pedestrians, cyclists and motor traffic and existing speed measurements. Yeah. We believe the SMS supports the principles of the UN's Stockholm Declaration and HCC will continue to support it. However, we recognise there are areas that will require additional engineering measures to change behaviour, ensuring compliance and effectively reduce speed. Simply changing speed limit signs won't be effective in all circumstances. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, do you have a supplementary, Ms. Yoris? Just, just a quick question. So um, I try and cycle wherever I go because I'm concerned about the environment. I do find Hertfordshire's roads terrifying. Speed is a major factor in that. So um, could um, uh, Councillor Bibby just say how um, the council proposes to get more people walking and cycling to, um, uh, to, to help with the targets that they have regarding um, active travel um, and make them feel um, safer whilst they're doing so because they're terrified at the moment, like I am. Thanks, Amanda. And that's exactly what, what we're trying to do. I mean, to actually make cyclists and pedestrians feel safe when walking and cycling, you actually have to reduce the speeds of motorists. And unfortunately, we have found um, around the country, uh, professional research has confirmed, and we also see in our county, that if you don't actually provide measures, whether it be natural um, changes to the road environment, up to engineering measures in, in extremis, the speeds of cars do not actually reduce. And pedestrians and cyclists, they have a perception that speed should be lower, but in practice, they're not. So they make them less safe. So our strategy is designed to actually reduce speeds and not just tell people that's a speed limit. And hopefully by that, pedestrians and cyclists will feel a lot safer. And also we're spending a lot of money um, on active travel, making sure our existing footways and pathways are kept clear and passable for, by uh, cyclists and pedestrians. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you Ms. Yorath. Thank you. Right, I'd now like to invite uh, Ms. Deborah Tyler to ask her question. Good morning, everybody. Um, within my role working as a nurse team leader in emergency medicine, I have witnessed the physical and emotional trauma of both serious and fatal road injuries over many years. It is essential we are proactive rather than reactive to road trauma, and it's important on loved ones and the wider significance on society, the economy and the individual. Within the NHS being under unprecedented pressure due to COVID-19, further exacerbated by hospital closures, poor health modelling for our ageing population, road trauma adds to that load. Active travel and social distancing have rightly been on the Hearts County Council agenda during the pandemic. However, why has Hearts County Council been so slow to acknowledge or even fully explore the benefits of mandatory 20 miles and our default speed limits to protect the communities Hearts County Council serve. Global road safety campaigners advocate 20 mile per hour limits to save lives and cut serious injury by 2030. 20 miles per hour limits are the global initiative to preserve life, the environment and provide sustainable living for communities. 
We believe 20 miles an hour is a public health issue for Hertfordshire, one that will take strong leadership to guide and sustain by effective multi-agency working. I would like to ask the Cabinet Member for Public Health and Prevention if he agrees that reducing the default speed limit in built up areas to 20 miles an hour is a public health issue. In view of the much publicised guidance in relation to the benefits of reduced speed limits, please would the Cabinet Member advise what measures in relation to raising the profile of road safety they are prepared to take in the next three months to protect Hertfordshire residents and therefore reduce the burden on the NHS? Thank you, Mr. Haller. Um, Tim Hutchings, please. Good morning, and, and thank you for your question. <clears throat> the County Council does support 20 mile per hour speed areas, as you can see from the speed management strategy. My officers have been involved in developing and supporting our approach and will continue to do so and to keep the evidence and need under review. The County Council Speed Management Strategy, SMS, in section six covers our approach to adoption of 20 mile per hour speed areas. The strategy was adopted by the cabinet on the 14th of December, 2020. The strategy acknowledges public desire for implementation of 20 mile per hour speed limits and lower speeds over wider areas. The place and movement framework within this provides a means of identifying areas suitable for 20 mile per hour speed limits, considering the local road environment and existing speed measures. The SMS highlights principles and cons consistency, the importance of compliance and the appropriateness of the respective limit for physical environment in which it sits. An additional £7 million has been committed over four years for more 20 mile per hour areas. We are not taking, def we are not taking a default approach to dropping the speed limit to 20 on all 30 mile per hour roads. And we believe there are good reasons for this. Those reasons are A, a blanket approach which introduces 20 mile per hour signage on all 30 mile per hour roads will have a limited impact on speed compliance unless it is enforced or supported by engineering measures on every road. And at present, there are neither enough people nor resources to do this. The aim for the public, from a public health perspective is to reduce avoidable death as much as possible. A prioritised approach will be more effective than a blanket approach. A default approach introducing 20 mile per hour signage on all 30 mile per hour roads may well encourage an increase in active travel, but given what I have said that ab above, this then exposes a higher level of vulnerable road users to vehicles travelling in excess of 30 miles per hour. In effect, it creates a mismatch of user expectation and won't be safe enough. Public Health have been working actively with Highways colleagues on speed management strategy, and we will continue to do so. But for the reasons explained above, we want to implement them where we can ensure there will be a good compliance with the signed speed limit. We need to make sure there is a right environment and a streetscape so that drivers can and will abide by the 20 mile per hour limits. The County Council, together with members of the Hertfordshire Road Safety Partnership, will be promoting this year's UN Road Safety Week, which will focus on managing speed to reduce fatal and serious road collisions. The campaign is already on the partnership's 2021 calendar, alongside many others, including seatbelts, mobile phones, drink drugs and reckless or inappropriate behaviour, together known as the Fatal Five. Exact details are yet to be finalised, but we will involve at least one event, a press release and other public statements in support. I believe this approach is consistent with the evidence and is also consistent with the aims of the Stockholder, Stockholm Declaration. From a public health perspective, I will keep this under review, but at this point in time, I believe this is a proactive and proportionate response by the County Council. Thank you. Um, do you have a supplementary question, Ms Taylor? Yes, I do. Um, you keep mentioning compliance. However, we have been closely looking at the model that um, the Calderdale um, County Council used in line with Paul Butcher, who is the Director of Public Health, and their compliance was met by multi-agency working with the police, the health authorities, 
fire services, ambulance services. It was a proper multi-agency approach. So I, we personally feel as a group of 20 plenties campaigner that you really need to engage the police in this. The police are the key to um, bringing in safe roads. Thank you. Well, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. There's certainly an important part of it. Uh, and we're always keen to learn from wherever we can. So we'll, we'll take on board your comments. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you both. Right. Thank you very much. Could I just thank all of the all of the speakers uh, who, who asked their questions uh, this morning for adding to uh, to this meeting and moving on to item four on the agenda, public petitions, understanding order 15. There are no uh, public uh, petitions. I am going to call a break now um, prior to uh, uh, item five, which is uh, uh, the debate on the integrated plan and we will be starting uh, well actually I'll give you more than the five minutes we will start, be starting very promptly at 11 o'clock okay thank you
Right. right, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back into the meeting. Um, item five is officers' reports relevant to executive portfolios. Item 5A, the integrated plan 2021 to 22 and 2024 to 25. Members are advised uh, that in respect of the debate concerning the Council's integrated plan, including the setting of the Council tax precept, the Standards Committee has exercised its power to grant a dispensation to all Hertfordshire County Councillors from the requirement to declare any disclosable pecuniary interest or a declarable interest. Accordingly, there is no requirement for any councillor to make any declaration of interest in respect of this item of business. Members are reminded that Section 106 of the Local Government Finance Act 1992 provides that if a member is in arrears of council tax for two months or more and they are present at a meeting where the council's budget or precept is being considered, then they should declare this and any such member must not vote on any matters relating to the setting of the council's budget or the precept. The provisions of Section 106 of the Local Government Finance Act 1992 apply even if there is an arrangement to pay off arrears. I will now ask if are there any declarations under Section 106 of the Local Government Act, Finance Act 1992 concerning non-payment of <coughs> council tax? <coughs> and there has been no response. Um, can I advise Council the procedure for debating the IP motion is set out in your order in your order of business. The time limits for speeches in the IP debate are as follows. Executive member for resources and performance has unlimited time. Second or original motion of original motion 15 minutes. The lead speaker for each opposition group who, will, who would also move any amendments 15 minutes first amendment only. Seconders of any opposition group amendment have 10 minutes first amendment only. All others, including executive members, have five minutes and any right of reply is five minutes. So can I um, now move, go to uh, Ralph Sangster. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it was about this time last year, Madam Chairman, when we looked back at 2019 with a sense of relief. It had been a difficult year, but, with, uh, uh, but when reviewed from the perspective of subsequent events, now seems almost mundane. The fact that we are holding this year's budget debate in virtual reality is a recognition of the changes we have all had to accommodate in a year, I truly believe can be described as uh, extraordinary. What at first seemed, to, uh, seemed strange became commonplace, a new vocabulary to absorb, shielding, furlough, support bubble, PPE and lockdown. Words which describe the stark reality that the very nature of our lives had changed. Dark days when the NHS seemed to be at the point of collapse and brighter ones when we all celebrated individual and collective acts of self-sacrifice. Care workers choosing, yes, choosing to leave their families and live at their place of work rather than put their vulnerable uh, residents at risk. Health workers who, after a long and heartbreaking shift, broke down in tears when faced with empty supermarket shelves, but chose to pick themselves up and carry on. The nation has learned a lot about, its, about itself over this last year, Madam Chairman, and so as a council have we. In response to this pandemic, the council has repositioned existing services, established new ones, and reinforced and supported external service providers. Our workforce has had to adapt to new working environments, absorb uh, new technologies and rethink its interaction with colleagues, clients and residents. And with people's lives at risk, Madam Chairman, we did it at breakneck speed in an environment not previously experienced in peacetime. In those first few weeks of lockdown in March, the government set out its pandemic related priorities and assigned local government the responsibility of securing the county, the continuity of existing vital services and supporting key vulnerable groups. To ensure those who, sh who, who were shielding received vital food and medical supplies, a new service based at our Hearts Full Stop Depot at Mundells was created and delivered 108,000 packages of food and essential, essentials to households, 
together with supplementing com community groups with a further 10,600 parcels of essential supplies and distributing over 9 million items of PPE to care providers, education establishments and the fire service. Care homes hardest hit in those early months received an unconditional commitment from the county, from the council to meet their, their additional COVID related costs, allowing them to focus on securing well-being, the well-being of their residents. And as one of the first councils to do so, we were held up as an exemplar of good practice in the sector. There were many more examples of our staff and managers go to, to management teams going the extra mile charging, changing roles, working remotely, rolling out new technology and remaining a lifeline for so many of our residents, particularly those who found it difficult to cope with isolation and an unfamiliar and stressful new reality. I'm sure you would like me to thank our amazing staff, suppliers and contracted service providers for their resilience in the face of unprecedented circumstances and their, and their dedication in supporting our most vulnerable citizens throughout this pandemic. On behalf of us all, thank you. The pandemic, as well as impacting our personal lives, Madam Chairman, has thrown many aspects of our social and economic life into disarray. Across Hertfordshire, businesses large and small have been severely impacted. Individuals have seen jobs or in the immediate prospect of jobs disappear and whole households have been put in put under enormous financial pressure. COVID-19 has been a public health crisis, the likes of which we have not seen in our lifetimes, but the extent of the shockwave that has also hit the Hertfordshire economy must be recognised, and in particular its effect on our young citizens who make up the class of 2020 will be profound. To assist in supporting businesses through the pandemic and protect employment, Local government was, uh, was tasked with respon the, the responsibility of distributing financial support across the economic sector. Through the pandemic, district councils, uh, colleagues passed on the, the struggling, to struggling firms and companies some £519 million in grants and business rate relief, bringing the support from government across Hertfordshire to a staggering £661 million. And our business communities have shown what ca what can be achieved by making the most of a poor situation. There have been countless examples of Hertfordshire's business pivoting their operations to provide what was needed to assist with the national effort from sterilizers to food supplies. Individuals and businesses have, have innovated and adapted to the new circumstances and new ways of working from the mass migration to home working to sole online traders taking on the big supermarkets. <coughs> Looking ahead, we need to plan a good economic recovery for Hertfordshire. We must harness the lessons of the pandemic and use them well, most urgently to create new jobs, but also to define a trajectory for recovery and growth that reflects our wider ambitions. In this endeavour, we need to work with our local partners, our local enterprise partnership, the Hertfordshire Growth Board, our district and parish councils, our university and further education colleges, and of course, our business communities. We must, however, remain cautious of this vir virus and recognise that the full socio-economic consequences are still impossible to anticipate. We remain, however, in a good place. We have all the buildings blocks in place, ready to ensure that Hertfordshire's economy slingshots out of this, the, the ravages of this pandemic and delivers new jobs, new growth, new opportunities, new innovation, but most importantly, new hope for our residents. Madam Chairman, I would like at this point to pay a particular tribute to the public health team led by its director, Jim McManus. They have been at the epicentre of the pandemic in Hertfordshire, offering advice to other service departments, issuing briefing notes to organisations and stakeholders across the county, and consulted by central government on issues of public health policy, an operational and pro, uh, operational process and procedure. They have worked around the clock, providing guidance and support for all who needed it, and we undoubtedly owe them a considerable debt. In a year like no other, Madam Chairman, managing and controlling the, the council's finances has been more than challenging. The dislocation of existing services by the council's response to, to the pandemic 
and the requirement for the County Council to deliver over £173 million of additional COVID-related services, have services stretched the operational departments to the limit and has made the function of financial control even more essential. This year, combined COVID and business as usual budgets for the County Council will exceed £1 billion. I would like to record my appreciation to the finance team led by Assistant Director Stephen Pillsworth for the professionalism they have displayed in managing the, the Council's finances this year. They have, with the cooperation of service departments, once again kept spending under control in a year that can only be described as extremely difficult. But I can say with growing confidence that the Council will deliver a financial outcome which will once again be within its budget. <coughs> That cannot be said of all councils, Madam Chairman, and it is to Hertfordshire's credit that we have been able to do so once again. The ability of the council to manage its finances over an extended period through a decade of funding consolidation and financial constraint has placed it in an envious position. The public health and economic effects of this pandemic have created a perfect storm for council finances. Councils which have not managed their finances as well as others have had to include draconian savings proposals in their budget consultations, which, if implemented, will cut deep into the services provided to their residents. Thankfully, the residents of Hertfordshire will, will be spared that jeopardy because of the excellent judgment exercised by officers and this Conservative administration over the last two decades. Published reports by auditors of the most high profile council failures have identified common factors which have contributed to their financial downfall. Amongst them and high on the list are failure to take action over political decisions affecting service delivery, poor financial governance, in particular the inability to track and monitor service transformation and the use of reserves to support unsustainable spending and reoccurring budget deficits. <coughs> The strength and sustainability of this council's financial position has always been a key priority for this administration and will continue to be so into the future. We have always been prepared where needed to take those difficult political decisions on service provision, even in the face of sustained criticism from opposition members. But we have done so only as a last resort and when the financial integrity of the council was at stake. We have actively promoted and favoured service transformation as a preferred alternative to policy driven saving, savings, seeking to redesign and re-engineer service delivery as a mechanism to improve value for money. This approach has yielded annualised savings now standing at £367 million, amounting to a total of £2.7 billion over the past decade, which has been reinvested in existing service delivery ensuring service levels are maintained and improved. Much of our reserves, Madam Chairman, are held on behalf of third parties or to support specific future spending commitments or to cover contingent risks or as a general reserve in compliance with the determination of the Section 151 officer. Mm -hmm. The use of reserves for one-off commitments or to support transformation programmes is appropriate. However, their use to support ongoing revenue spending is both inappropriate and unsustainable, and we will call out those who continue to propose such uses, which intrinsically endanger the financial stability of the Council. And members will recall that over the last few years, opposition parties' alternate budget proposals have used the Council's reserves as a war chest to fund their spending commitments. And I note this year is no exception. I also note that Labour's budget amendments once again this year includes a proposal to cripple the organisation by rewarding the senior managers who have, who have shown outstanding leadership throughout the pandemic and add so much value to the organisation by culling their numbers just when we need them to manage an expansion of in services to support our hard pressed residents. Uh, no way to run an organisation, Madam Chairman. And the Liberal Democrats' big idea this year is to dispose of council assets in what can only be described as a fire sale reminiscent of Gordon Brown's ill-fated disposal of the nation's gold reserves in 1999, realising a fraction of their subsequent value. 
Neither Labour nor Liberal Democrats, Madam Chairman, have considered using the funds that might be generated by their ill-conceived proposals to close the Council's future budget deficits, but as usual are using them to support additional spending, clearly showing that a future budget deficit should not get in the way of a, of a political imperative. But there is one issue highlighted by those audit reports which are, if allowed to become systemic, will undermine the finances of any organisation. The failure to set and set and deliver balanced budgets will eventually sap strength the strength from even the we most well-funded council. Hertfordshire, under this administration, has set and most importantly delivered balanced budgets for as long as I can remember and has done so again this year, despite disruption caused by the pandemic. Those who attended the council meeting in December will recall that there, there were several statements by my fellow executive members and myself previewing some of the additional investments proposals to be included in this year's IP. I was then asked by a member of the opposition uh, where we had found the magic money tree. You may also recall that I suggested the member await the publication of the IP, which would show that the administration's ab the ability to support new spending commitments and sustain existing ones stemmed from its management of the council's financial affairs and not some mythical talisman so much relied upon by opposition parties to fund their own wish lists. This year's IP has at its heart significant additional spending capacity, Madam Chairman. The overall increase in the revenue budget is 18.6 million, and this is enhanced by embedded transformation savings of 16.5 million, with the overall increase totaling over 35 million pounds, Madam Chairman. And that's how we can increase spending on our res residents' priorities and avoid the cuts to services most other councils are having to consider. Madam Chairman, this year's budget is being set at a time of considerable uncertainty. COVID will remain a difficult financial burden to quantify well into 2021. The local government funding settlement announced in December was once again only for a single year, leaving considerable doubt over the council's funding in the medium term. I can, however, reassure members and residents that this year's budget remains robust against the uncertainties facing us. It has embedded within it several layers of protection. We have increased our contingency budget to, over, to overcome the anticipated COVID costs, which will be uh, impacting uh, existing service delivery. We are carrying forward the balance of our COVID grant announced in 2020 for 2021, and will carry over unused 2021 contingency and yet to be deployed care home support funding to cover their anticipated costs of COVID during the coming year. There is a total of £45 million of savings embedded in the medium term financial plan with a further savings gap of £25 million still to be identified by 2024-25, totaling £70 million. Any delay or failure to deliver those savings would significantly impact frontline service delivery. To cover this important and potential impactful risk, the dedicated transition reserve has been maintained at £19 million during this year's annual review, recognising its importance in protecting services if risks do materialise. We also hold uncommitted reserves in our Investor Transform Reserve, this, these will be essential to funding in funding transformation initiatives as we seek to close the budget uh, deficits in future years. I would ask you all to remember its name, Invest to, trans to tra transfer, Transform Reserve, and the important reason for its existence. And when the opposition deliver their alternative budgets later, please note where they propose funding some of their proposals from. Madam Chairman, councils have been under pressure, uh, under extreme financial pressure for over a decade. Those who have managed their finances well, like Hertfordshire, have maintained service levels and where possible improved them. Ten years, however, is a long time and the needs and priorities of our residents have evolved and we need to look to the future with a new perspective. We must, however, recognise that, that as the virus re releases us from its grip, a new reality will emerge in which many of our residents will require our support and understanding as they seek to re-establish their lives. As a consequence, we expect the council tax base to shrink by 0.6% in the coming year, 
as those residents who find themselves in financial difficulty seek relief. <coughs> Before any increase in council tax is factored in, the aggregate tax revenue in 2021-22 is projected to fall by 8.8 .8 million, a combination of the reduced tax base and shortfalls in the tax receipts for the current financial year. <coughs> in proposing the council tax level for next year, the administration has considered the need to respect the difficult financial circumstances in which some residents find themselves and, their prior and the priorities and aspirations of many other residents to see this year's budget set a new course for the council. One which, in addition to responding to a challenging social landscape, embraces and prioritizes the protection of our environment. The administration has also taken into consideration the council's responsibility to ensure it has a sustainable revenue stream, which will meet all the challenges of the coming year, including those from residents who will find themselves in need of its support for the very first time. Having taken all these issues into account, it is proposed that the standard council tax rate will rise by 1.99% and the adult social care preset by 2%, postponing the remaining permitted 1% until 22-23. This will mean that a Band D properties council tax will rise by an annual rate of £56.43 or £1.08 per week. Now, Madam Chairman, I would like to turn to the key elements of this year's budget and how we intend to use the additional funds at our disposal to support the residents of Hertfordshire. I will be outlining the various priorities which have shaped this year's budget and individual executive members will be focusing on the detailed measures in their individual portfolios. The first priority this budget has been to sustain existing service delivery and recognise that during the pandemic demand has been artificially suppressed in key support functions. The budget anticipates that over the next year there will be a resurgent need from vulnerable individuals and families which will require an expansion in related support services. The budget responds to these anticipated pressures by increasing financial resources in frontline delivery such as domestic abuse, increased numbers of children in care and the additional funding to the voluntary sector. Our second priority has been to recognise the need to prepare the Council for a new post-COVID reality. Changes in working practices accelerated by the pandemic will require new improvements in technology and ways of working. <coughs> These changes will require a review of the Council's estate in the light of changing working patterns and how that will impact on the use of our office and other workspaces. It will almost inevitably require significant investment in technology and the means of communication throughout the organisation and how we store, retrieve and use information. Changing demographic and social pressures have created, a, have created new demands in a, in a number of our service areas. Addressing these demands in another, is another of this budget's priorities. Last year, we announced new investments in children's service placements and our social care <coughs> accommodation and specifically in, in raising low pay. This year we are going further, announcing significant additional investments to overcome these new demands in education, waste management and community safety, highways, growth, public health and the living and the levelling up of pay rates for care workers to a minimum level of the real, real living wage. We have also been able to introduce because of improved tax base and projected council tax collection rates, additional funding proposals in the latest IP papers approved at Cabinet on Monday. An £11.5 million fund has been established to address pandemic related and systemic inequalities in service provision. This fund will apply across all service departments and will include, but will not be limited to education, homelessness, employment, gender and ethnicity, social isolation and mental health, domestic abuse, public health, pro poverty and hunger. <clears throat> to, improve out, at the, to improve outcomes, we will seek to align our proposed interventions with national policy and programmes. It is too early, therefore, to make judgments 
on, for instance, free school meals, as we do not have the information on the government's po position on summer schooling. <coughs> and last, Madam, but certainly not least, we are meeting the concerns of many of our residents in bringing forward proposals to address those issues which are adversely affecting the environment locally, nationally and internationally. I would like to compliment <coughs> the environment. <coughs> I would like to compliment the environment team who have been working on the council's major policy initiative, Sustainable Hearts, through a year of disruption and lockdown. They have been able to develop and gain approval for a comprehensive program and a suite of action plans which deliver at, directly to address the protection of our environment. The budget proposals include the doubling of the team's operational funding, a £10 million capital fund to support pilot projects to, act, to access external funding streams, provide matched funding for community initiatives and support the overall sustainability program. A further £2 million of revenue fund has been established to drive forward the action plan, including enabling the Council to facilitate the preparation, submission and submission of bids for national environmental programmes. And we have been able to announce that the Council's first application, submitted by the property team, has already secured a £15 million grant to fund energy conservation within the Council's estate. The budget also proposes new funding to support active travel and has set up a £10 million fund to manage the impact of climate change on our highways. I believe, Madam, this budget, Madam Chairman, that this budget is one of the most aggressive, uh, progressive and radical in recent times. We have recognised the need to address real and pressing issues with significant investments without putting at risk the long term financial stability of this Council. However, beware, Madam Chairman, of those who would promise even greater spending. Uh, it may seem enticing and may be drawn and you may be drawn in by the plausible rhetoric, but those promises will be worthless if they also undermine the, the stability of this council's financial position. Before winding up, Madam Chairman, I would like to acknowledge that for many of our residents, this year has been both difficult and stressful. For many, relief from the monotony of lockdown has come through exercise using local nature trails and rights of way. Those tracks, as a consequence of their additional use, became well have become well worn and with adverse weather in need of considerable maintenance. I am pleased to be able to announce this afternoon, Madam Chairman, that we will allocate £1 million from the future COVID cost fund towards addressing the condition of the county's rights of way to ensure they remain open to those who find them so beneficial in these difficult times. Madam Chairman, although this year's budget has been prepared at a time of unparalleled uncertainty and judging the balance between the need to exercise caution and embracing the need for change and improvement has been difficult. The track record of this administration is second to none in making those judgment calls. And we stand tall and remain proud of our record of outstanding service delivery, unrivaled financial control and inclusive vision for the future of the county. Although we have faced some dark moments over the past year, Madam Chairman, the residents of Hertfordshire have been supported throughout by a council which puts its responsibilities to protect their interests front and centre. Madam Chairman, I commend this budget to the council. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well done. Thank you very much. <coughs> Can I invite David Williams to second the motion? Chairman, thank you. I wish to second the motion, uh, but reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite Paul Sikowski. Uh, lead speaker for the Liberal Democrats, the Liberal Democrat group to move the first Liberal Democrat amendment. And Paul, you have 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, our budget announcement amendment looks to make our county fairer, greener and healthier, produce a better Hertfordshire, a change that's desperately needed after a year like no other. Our amendment's ambitious, forward looking, pushes to change the fundamental funding of capital repayments uh, from revenue by leveraging the assets that the council has on its books. We need to change how we do things. Uh, the old ways of working are behind us, 
and we need to be visionary and ambitious for our county and for its citizens. Addressing the climate change emergency is a theme that runs through our amendment and the sustainability ambitions of this administration are simply not good enough. Our amendment takes a small but significant step towards addressing that emergency and delivering against the challenge that faces us in terms of climate change. See, the administration has suggested uh, it cre would create a, an inequality reserve, but then doesn't seem to ensure that funding for our poorest children's food in school vacations is delivered. I note that in his speech just now, uh, Councillor Sangster uh, said that we shouldn't be putting, uh, making a decision in a budget meeting on um, summer vacation free, for free school meal recipients, as we don't know what the government intend. Well, I'm not sure the government know what the government intend in the next five minutes, let alone next summer. Um, we need to actually give those people certainty and, 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 and some assurance that we have their back. And actually, the Liberal Democrats do, and that's why in our proposal we see as a, as a core decision the funding of free school meals for the next financial year, not just the summer vacation. Uh, residents are also facing flooding issues right now. We see time and time again, as I'm going around my constituency and going around uh, other places in Hertfordshire, roads, A roads, uh, major roads that are underwater uh, from, from, uh, from verge to verge. Um, we see flooding issues again and again, and it's time we actually put a little bit of extra money in there in an emergency fund to try and um, um, address some of the massive neglect we've seen of our drainage systems uh, over the last few years. There are more and more homes are at risk from that sort of flooding, and we need to put some additional funds in, and that's what, what our budget amendment does. COVID's put an enormous strain on everyone's mental health. But first and foremost in our thoughts are our children. Our children really need our support in this. So our budget delivers an additional 50 school nurses to provide much needed mental health support for our children uh, in schools. And that's really going to be needed after the 8th of March, assuming on the 8th of March that our children go back to school. They're going to need that help and support. Uh, and our, our, our budget amendment will start to deliver on that. We're going to put five and a half million pounds over the period of the IP into supporting the changing needs of our community and tackling inequality uh, and, and give people an opportunity uh, to come forward from the voluntary sector and from other sectors to, to bid against that money um, to get the support that our communities need to actually get over uh, the issues that, that COVID, the COVID legacy will leave in our society. And we're also going to put some funds into supporting low income families with the cost of school uniform because we know that high achieving kids are sometimes prevented from attending outstanding schools because the uniform is unaffordable. That can't be acceptable in a society that values the ability uh, to achieve uh, for yourself rather than a legacy of, of your background. That's not what our society should be about. And actually allowing our kids who, who can get into those selective schools to up, take up those offers uh, has clearly got to be a positive. So how do we pay for all that? Well, actually, we do use a bit of reserves, but I'm sure Councillor Sangster will congratulate us on, on our amendments in our IP because it actually contributes in total to reserves of over £1 million over the period of the IP. So this idea that we're using the reserves and, and we're, we're spending money that we're then not replacing just isn't the case when you actually look at the numbers in, in an RIT amendment. Um, and I, I look forward to, to um, uh, Councillor Sangster's um, congratulations on that, that uh, aspect. We're going to reduce the corporate communications team funding uh, because why are we putting so much funding into slapping ourselves on the back whilst free school meal kids are going hungry? That just doesn't make sense. The redirection of that funding to uh, those who need it most is clearly what we should be doing. There's going to be a reduction in costs, in security costs for empty property, because, of course, if we've sold or disposed of those properties, then we won't need the security and the um, upkeep and maintenance of those properties uh, to be falling on the public purse. So there's a, there's a saving there. There's income also from significant investment in new solar generation capacity. We're intending putting, I'll come on to that in the capital section, money into solar generation capacity 
And the estimate of income in our amendment may well significantly underplay the return actually generated from that. Uh, we've got new ways of working that are going to be coming forward, um, which mean that large sections of particularly office buildings in, in the uh, county's uh, property portfolio are unlikely to be needed into the future. They, run, they will be surplus to requirements. We need to leverage those assets and generate income from them through renting them out and, and utilising them in different ways. And, and our proposal has, um, has that uh, uh, as one of its uh, key ambitions. Dimming our LED street lights in the morning as well as in the evenings uh, can also generate further savings uh, on our power bills. And why wouldn't we want to do that? We, we know that from the evening um, dimming, that that's a, an acceptable uh, approach to dealing with street lights. Why wouldn't we do that in the morning as well? Well, we think we ought to be doing so. There's also an increase in the IP for highways correspondence, an £87,000 additional cost uh, for highways correspondence. And we don't see the justification for that. That's just not reasonable. So we'd uh, save that money by keeping the funding for highways correspondence at its current level. There's then also windfall funding from the increase in council tax base and collection fund surpluses that the administration intends to put into yet another new reserve. We think that should be directed at tackling inequality now, not at some uh, um, nebulous point in the future. Um, we need to put that in when the need is, and the need is now. Our free school meal recipients need our help now, and that's what our amendment looks to do. Rebalancing revenue around, allows our county to be better, it allows it to be fairer and greener and healthier. And with the council's support, we can achieve exactly that with our amendment. On the capital side, to make Hertfordshire a fairer and greener and healthier place, we would increase HLB, our highways locality budgets, the money that each councillor gets to direct towards highways in their area, to £100,000 a member. That would enable more member-directed footwear repairs. Now, the current situation is that without HLB funding for uh, footwear repairs, we're looking at something like 130 years between resurfacing of each any particular given piece of footwear. And that's just not good enough. The budget increase uh, shows commitment to localism. And actually, that's what the highways locality budget does. It really embeds and enforces localism, the idea that local people get to choose what locally happens. Um, we really need to do that and it delivers on our sustainability by directing that money towards footways. Because if we want to see that modal shift, we really need to be generating the, um, the surfaces and, and facilities that people want to use uh, as an alternative to using our, car, our cars. We'd fund new on-street electric vehicle charging points. We desperately need to assist the move away from fossil fuel powered cars. And this goes a little way towards uh, providing for the infrastructure to do that. We'd plant, some, we'd plant an enormous number of trees. We'd inst instigate an urban and highway tree planting program. Um, trees absorb and sequester carbon. Um, they're also a real community benefit. And, and in terms of mental health of people, having a green and pleasant place to be is clearly important. We need to be planting more trees and our amendment does that. We start installing solar powered street lights on selected off road cycle and walking routes. If we want sustainable transport, as I said earlier, we need sustainable transport infrastructure and dark alleyways, especially in the winter, are not conducive to encouraging a modal shift. So let's provide street lights that are solar powered and sustainable in that way. Our sites, our, our, our um, buildings and properties that constitute the council's uh, facilities need to be generating power. They need to be generating power through the use of, of uh, solar uh, and other uh, alternative energy sources. We need to invest in that generation. We put a million pounds a year into delivering that um, shift in, in uh, approach. We'd also reverse the, the cuts we've seen to the unclassified roads programme. 
Uh, in my own division, we've got a major feeder road into a large urban area that currently resembles photos of the lunar surface. Resurfacing of that scheduled for next year has been cut as part of the cuts to the unclassified roads program. Those roads and their proper upkeep are critical to our economic future. So we would restore the cuts this administration have made in those areas. The school energy saving program needs significant additional investment and political will. Savings in terms of costs and of carbon will certainly follow. It can't be right that we see floor to ceiling single glazed windows still remaining in some of our school properties. It's just not sending the right message to the young people in our communities. We come on to section 106 contributions and um, the um, approach to cycling infrastructure. One of the things that we see too often is section 106 contributions for cycling infrastructure that include a certain section of cycleway and no more. And what it gives us is these disjointed sections of cycling uh, infrastructure that don't actually lead from anywhere or to anywhere. We need a fund and we uh, propose a fund to actually make those join up to make sure that our cycling infrastructure network is actually a connected network. And we also need to leverage those Section 106 contributions better than we currently do. So we're proposing a two year programme to deliver better project outcomes. Now, all that is going to take a significant uh, in income, a significant uh, saving. And our approach to that has been to look at our property portfolio. Now, Councillor Sangster suggested that we we're about to, I'm about to suggest a fire sale. Nothing could be further from the truth. If his idea of a fire is something that takes 25 years to burn, then clearly that's what's happening in the, in the county at the minute. It can't be right that a, a site that's declared surplus today may not actually be disposed of in this council until the year 2045. Now, I'm using that particular length of time as an example because a site that is currently uh, proposed for development, finally, was originally uh, declared surplus 25 years ago. And decades and more of properties sitting on our books, taking up security costs, taking up maintenance costs, is not acceptable. It really, it simply isn't. It's land banking by any other term. The council currently owns 6,000 hectares of Hertfordshire, 60 square kilometres of Hertfordshire. Of that 6,000 hectares, 775 are on public record as being declared surplus. A very conservative assessment of land value of just £1 million per hectare suggests there may be £775 million worth of surplus land in the land bank HCC currently has. Our proposal suggests disposal over the IP period, four years, of just 10% of the currently listed surplus assets. Just one plot in my area is an old school site. Six and a half hectares of land adjacent to and surrounded on two sides by existing development that's declared surplus. It's been on our books. Oh, you have one minute. We really need to leverage the assets that we have for the benefit of the citizens and residents of Hertfordshire. Our plan is ambitious. We should be ambitious for our citizens. We need a fairer, greener, healthier Hertfordshire, a better Hertfordshire for everyone. I commend this amendment to the council. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, can I invite Stephen Giles Medhurst to second the amendment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I formally second and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I invite Mark Watkin to move the second Liberal Democrat amendment? And Mark, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I'm just getting myself sorted here. Apologies if I just do that. Right. Uh, Chairman and fellow councillors, I hope that whatever you may think of our other amendments, there will be cross-party support for our proposal to continue to fund free school meals during the holiday periods once the existing commitment by this council runs out at the end of the summer half term. 
In our November debate, it was accepted that there was a desperate need to support children on free school meals during the holiday period. Our debate largely centred on the length of time this council should continue its support of any direct action from the government. Well, since that debate, nothing has improved. More firms closed, more families are struggling to pay their rent and close their, chil their children. In November, officers told us that 22,000 children from Hertfordshire were eligible for free school meals. In the last three months, this number can only have increased, and the government has given no indication of funding free school meals after April. In our unequal society, these children are the most deprived. The children at the bottom of the heap. These are the children whose attainment gap remains alarmingly high. They grow up in families who in turn time struggle to provide the essentials even when their children do receive free school meals or the equivalent weekly vouchers that they are receiving now. And as the Guardian reported recently, when schools were closed, many poorer families and the extra costs of feeding and entertaining children at home has pushed up spending. To its credit, this administration recognised just how important <coughs> the meal is for these children and committed funds to provide it. All we're asking is that in the absence of any action by the government, this council steps up and extends its commitment for the rest of the year. In so doing, it will strike at the greatest cause of hardship and neglect among of our children. In its IP proposal, the Council is creating a five and a half million inequality reserve, taken rather appropriately from its collection surpluses. I can think of no better way of using this money. As this Council has already shown its commitment to support for these children in their desperate circumstances, and as the Conservative government is committed to providing a more level society, I trust there can be no objection to the leader on behalf of his cabinet writing to the Chancellor asking for commitment to provide holiday food meals as a standard element of their support for the most needy families in our society. Please be open-minded and open-handed and support our government to give these families some certainty for the next year. So sorry. Can I invite Ron Tyndall to to uh, to move the second Liberal Democrat? Sorry, to second the uh, uh, that uh, motion. Thank you, Chair. I'm pleased to be able to second the second Liberal Democrat amendment, and I reserve my right to speak. Right. Thank you, Ron. Now, can I invite Sharon Taylor? Lead, lead speaker for the Labour Group to move the Labour Group amendment and Sharon you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much Chair and can I start by um, thanking Stephen Pillsworth and Scott Crudgington uh, for their support in pulling together the opposition uh, amendments. It's been an extraordinary year for our country, our community and for local government and I want to start by thanking our amazing community in Hertfordshire for the exceptional support they've given to fighting this terrible virus and to, for supporting their families, friends and neighbours throughout the pandemic. I also want to say a heartfelt and very genuine thank you to every member of our team across local government, officers and members for the extraordinary efforts they have made supporting our community and to our partners in the public, private and community sector who have given everything it takes, gone way above and beyond the call of duty and so shown exemplary service to our county and its people. Of course, it's always invidious to single out individual people and in mentioning two people by name, I hope that in no way detracts from the magnificent efforts of others. But our Director of Public Health, Jim McManus, and our Chief Fire Officer, Daryl Keane, who has led our local resilience forum, have been so extraordinarily tireless in their efforts. They have inspired and energised the rest of us and it would be wrong not to thank them specifically. So we come to our budget today in the context of unprecedented times. Times we could not have foretold when we were all in the chamber last February making our budget proposals. When I spoke on the Labour budget amendment last year, 
I spoke about the government's empty rhetoric on climate change, fine words on climate change that hadn't been matched either by powers or funding for local government to enable our activity. Since then, we have been stricken by the more immediate emergency of the pandemic. Just two weeks after our budget meeting last year, on the 16th of March, one week before we went into lockdown, Community Secretary Robert Jenrick addressed 300 council leaders in a conference call on coronavirus. This government stands with local councils at this difficult time, he assured them. Everyone needs to play their part to help the most vulnerable in society and support their local economy. The government will do whatever is necessary to support these efforts. There is no doubt now that that promise was broken. In fact, Councillor Sangster has said it was broken at full council. Local government was left to pick up the pieces of the failed attempts to deliver support from Westminster. Over and over again, we picked up shielding, test and trace, supporting our businesses, putting a roof over the head of everyone rough sleeping, making our public areas safe, making care homes safe, supporting the vaccination programme, dealing with increases in domestic abuse and safeguarding. We have done whatever was needed to help the vulnerable and support our local economy. It's the other side of that bargain that has been comprehensively broken. When the spending review was announced in December, government was trumpeting an increase in core spending power of 4.5%. What they did not say was that 87% of that core spending power increase was to come from council tax increases. So it is clear now that far from providing the security and stability our residents need so badly, they are faced with increases in council tax to pay the bills for COVID and failure to fully fund the COVID pressures councils will face well into this year and beyond means savings have to be found to plug the gaps. Worse than this is that all the public servants who have given their all this year are faced with a government imposed pay freeze. While this doesn't directly impact on local government because our pay is negotiated separately, the government intention is clear and failure to fund us properly means there is little scope to reward our staff's extraordinary efforts. All this feels uncannily familiar. Claims of the end of the period of austerity are, it seems, greatly exaggerated. It's clear whatever the government's rhetoric, its actions are not the hallmark of a government committed to building back better, levelling up or tackling the inequality and insecurity in our economy. In fact, what is happening as forced council tax rises have to be imposed by local government on its financial knees is that in Tory Britain, you pay more and you get less. It's to this council's credit that it has supported our workforce in adult social care by putting in place its comprehensive package of COVID support, that it has invested in and supported public health initiatives, mm -hmm. and that plans in children's services are now reducing the eye-watering burden of out-of-county placements on our council taxpayers. The addition of a specific budget to tackle inequalities is also welcome, but without the funding support from the Tory government, they do this with their hands tied behind their back. There have been massive cuts in funding for schools and meeting the mental health needs of our children and young people. The much needed root and branch review of adult social care is long overdue. We've seen a painfully slow response to the climate emergency and even the funding being put into the budget for that today is just a finger in the air, not part of a comprehensive plan to deliver the climate change action plan. Highways repairs and speed policies fall short of the needs of our local population. Flooding hotspots remain neglected for years and the pandemic has thrown a very bright spotlight on the fact that staggering inequalities still exist in Hertfordshire, where our diverse communities have been disproportionately impacted. We must look now to the support we provide to our community as we move through the transition from lockdown to opening up our economy and our communities again. Our Labour group has a vision for hearts. There is a better way. And our budget amendment spotlights just some of the issues which will be a priority for Labour councillors elected in May. We want to see a prosperous, caring and socially just county for all our residents, a county actively engaging with all its citizens so they are able to fully participate in decision making. A county focused on community wealth building to ensure more of our residents benefit from the public funds spent here and a, a fairer and more equal community that builds on the foundations of the community spirit that have been laid during these last 12 months. Our budget amendment takes some of the key priorities of Hertfordshire people to demonstrate that only a full and complete budget review after May will tackle the long-term issues we all face. 
Our first package of measures is aimed at tackling the increasing inequalities that have been highlighted by COVID. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation in its report in December 2020 showed how the pandemic had exacerbated the conditions which mean over half a million children in our country live in poverty. It's simply appalling that it took the actions of a 24 year old footballer to impress the need to feed poor children in the school holidays. These will often be the same families whose home learning has been hampered by lack of digital equipment, broadband and quiet places to work. Our proposals to give more support, increasing locality budgets to enable the local organisations that support these families to do more, support for our food banks, a funding pot to enable local organisations to develop community assets and more support for our wonderful Money Advice Unit who provides such invaluable service to local residents. We know that our young people have had a particularly tough time during the COVID pandemic. Hearts Community Trust report a sharp decline in referrals and a study in The Lancet reports that up to 45% of young people with probable mental health problems had not sought help because of the pandemic. 22% of children and 29% of young people with probable mental health problems reported they have no adult at school to whom they could turn. Our budget provision is for some mitigation to this, while the issue of COVID related mental health among young people is properly assessed. Our proposals recognise the impact of COVID on the potential career paths of some of our young people and recommend a package of career support provided with our partners. We feel strongly that the decimation of youth services in the county was a step in the wrong direction and should be reversed. And for some of our communities, programmes to tackle gang and knife crime have sadly become necessary. We should show our support for these programmes, put our money where our mouth is and work with the police and other partners to deliver them. The views of our own children in care council expressed through our scrutiny process were that financial support was top of the list for those young people. We have been promised on more than one occasion at full council that concession on council tax for young people leaving the care system would be actively considered. Here we are four years on from those first promises and no further forward. Time we kept our promise to those young people. We also believe it would be a great symbol of our intent to include and involve young people in the work of the council to appoint a Hertfordshire youth chairman to be an ambassador and representative of our young people on public occasions and at our council meetings. Youth mayors appointed in other areas have found this a wonderful learning and development opportunity and it helps spread the knowledge of democratic processes when our schools get involved in carrying out the election and selection processes. The fragmented and complicated picture in adult social care continues and COVID has shown just how urgent it is the long awaited review is brought forward and yet the government continues to dither and delay. We have welcomed recent signs that the County Council is now recognising the benefits of direct provision of adult social care. Uh, but in the absence of any comprehensive response from government, we think it's time we looked at this for Hertfordshire. You never know, we might just find the answer that the government are looking for, an adult care co-op, who knows? Our budget proposal will help to fund that study. Our firefighters have performed a magnificent role throughout the COVID pandemic, always willing to support our community and partners in any way they can. We know they remain concerned about the four man crewing and other aspects of their health and safety. We owe it to them to make sure they feel safe and they are safe. Our next package of budget measures are all broadly related to building back from the pandemic in a way that is more sustainable and puts a booster underneath the very sedate pace of delivery uh, that we uh, that we see on climate change action in Hertfordshire. We were delighted to see the comprehensive programme brought forward by Julie Greaves to the last council meeting, but it's vital the public of Hertfordshire have a say in how we move forward on our climate change ambitions. We propose providing a funding pot that communities can bid into from the Climate Change Fund, a real focus on improvement of our footways and cycleways from sustainable travel funding, simplifying the process for 20 mile an hour zones, and honestly, Councillor Sanks, the comparison of uh, campaigners on 20 mile an hour zones with climate change deniers and anti-vaxxers is quite disgraceful. Allowing the public to contribute to the debate on flooding, on where flooding hotspots should be tackled and a focus on the key areas of air pollution in the county. Reliance on experts and risk assessments definitely has its place, but building back better absolutely means building back greener and we can do that better by engaging local people so they have a real say in prioritising projects for their areas. 
The withdrawal of some of the services at our household waste recycling centres has been deeply unpopular with the public. This disappointment has been even more acute during COVID as people have had more time at home to have those long delayed clear outs. We all know that recycling and reusing is far better for the environment than goods going to landfill and our residents are heartily sick of the fly tipping in our county. Now that this service is back in house we can be more flexible so we propose a pattern of six day opening at the recycling centres with at least one of those days being a weekend day. Our final proposal addresses the long-standing gap in our public engagement in the county, and that is to have regular forums for our residents where we can hear their views on county council services and share information about future plans and changes. Our recent experiences with increased use of virtual meetings have shown that we can be more inclusive and promote wider engagement that has been the case in recent years. Our budget proposals set the direction of travel for Hertfordshire. We make prudent use of reserves in a situation of national emergency. That's what they're there for. And we look forward to outlining further when we publish our Labour manifesto in a couple of weeks time, what our ambition is for Hertfordshire. And I'm sure that before the budget debate goes much further, the administration will make some sneery remarks about the opposition amendments, uh, even worse than the ones Councillor Sankster just did, um, and, uh, and will give themselves yet another huge pack on the back, pat on the back, because that is certainly your specialism, and then vote all our amendments down. Well, well, we all understand that part of democracy, but here's the thing, we all care just as much about our county, about our places and about the people we represent as you do. We may have, we do have different priorities and different ways of doing things. But surely, if we've all learned nothing else in the last 12 dreadful months, we all do know more about working together and listening to each other than we did before. So my plea is this, perhaps you will vote our amendments down. Perhaps you'll bring them back at some future time as though you thought of them in the first place. That has happened. But please hear what we say. There is still work to be done in Hertfordshire. Children living in poverty, families without the support they need, older people frightened of the cost of their care, young people worried about the economy and jobs for their future, business owners praying they will make it through to the recovery, our environment that needs urgent action. We care passionately about all of that. We hope you do too. We hope you care enough to support our proposals. I move our Labour amendment. Right. Thank, you, Thank Sharon. you, Sharon. Right. Can I invite Judy Billing, Judy Billing to second the Labour Group amendment? Thank you very much, Chair. And I think I've just made the snap decision to not follow the precedent of the morning. I think I would like to make my seconding remarks now, straight after Sharon's excellent exposition of the proposals that we wish to put before you. We and in doing so, I know. Yeah. And in doing so, um, I won't repeat the outline of what she's proposed, some of which we've been talking about for a very long time, um, such as relief for care leavers on council tax um, and other things where we have long records of commitment and um, integrity and, and fighting for what we know to be right for the people of Hertfordshire. But I also want to start with a commendation for the efforts, the commitment and the success, the huge successes of our council officers and our councillors across the county, working in partnerships that they would never have imagined, developing um, alliances, strategic alliances, officers who are doing their usual jobs in the most terrible circumstances or have been repurposed, which in some ways has been an even greater um, challenge for them. We've seen partnerships grow, we've seen food provision discussed between districts and the county, we've seen politicians actually until today, which is why I'm so terribly disappointed, working together, dealing with a pandemic that none of us could have imagined, learning ways of working that none of us could, and although as councillors our jobs haven't changed actually, we are still supporting and, and helping our residents in every way we can. We too have had to learn very new and different ways of doing that. And I think across the board, in a non-political way, we have managed to do that. And I have seen some of the best collegiate working in local government that I've ever seen. Our struggles throughout the year have been with central government, not with each other. And it's terribly disappointing now 
to see the constant struggle and tension between central and local government, 10 years of austerity, misleading promises to fund our COVID efforts back last March, terrible missteps by government that we have had to cope with in terms of schools going back or schools not going back, in terms of free school meals that they couldn't decide about for weeks on end. And Sharon has clearly laid out our amended budget proposals. But what has been so disappointing already this morning, and I can feel lots more of it coming on, has been the deeply insulting um, tone that Ralph has set out in his responses before we even put our um, alternative budgets by talking about um, increased expenditure instead of actually recognising the validity of different priorities from different groups to do different things. I find that hypocritical, I find it dishonest and I find it insulting. Unlike Sharon, I wanted to refer to the way Ralph spoke to a member of the public who came to put a perfectly valid question about a desperately important matter to do with 20 mile an hour zones. I've been um, campaigning for those for the last 11 years and to have my efforts, the science behind them, the debates that we have compared to anti-vaxxers and climate deniers was just totally dreadful. As it is to hear the hypocrisy of accusing us of wanting to spend money um, which has in fact been fully costed. And the reason I'm particularly sensitive about that issue at the moment, I suppose, is that I recently was involved in a budget meeting in another place, in North Hearts District Council, where the Conservative opposition proposed a quarter of a million extra non-funded expenditure at the same time as saying that there should not be a council tax increase this year for anybody, even a 50 pence a week, which was what we was being proposed at North Hertfordshire. Now, four of the district councillors, the Conservative opposition district councillors, who voted against the tiniest increase um, and put forward extra expenditure, are here as twin hatters today. And it'll be really interesting to see um, if they oppose the county council budget on the same grounds um, and are able to suggest that different priorities are of valid use to us all. So how very disappointing that Ralph has thrown out the trust, the team working, the collegiate spirit of coping for our residents with the most terrible circumstances I have ever known in local politics, in government, in public health, in any of the services that we run by throwaway insults at a time of such terrible seriousness. And I think I will leave it there because other members of the two opposition groups will uh, be ready to argue vociferously about the specific um, budget um, imperatives that they've put forward. I also think that we will probably be insulted by members of the um, ruling group who I see are putting up their hands to speak in great profusion. But please, when this meeting is over, could we try and revert to the positive ways that we've been working in partnerships for the last year and remember that we may have different priorities and we may have different services that we think are important, but there have been moments in the last year where some of you have behaved more decently than you are today. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'm now going to call a, a short break. Uh, we will reconvene at 12.15 uh, when we will then open the, the debate to members uh, on the IP plan and we do have uh, quite a few hands up um, already. Um, so bear with me if, I mean, I've got um, 10 people indicating at the moment. So, so I'll go for our break now and back here promptly at 12.15. Uh, Thank you.
Right, colleagues, it is 12.15. We are resuming and we are, we are now live again. I've got quite a long list of speakers. All of you will be called in the order in which your hands appeared um, um, on my chat screen here. We've done a quick calculation while we while you've been out and it looks as if we're heading for a, between a four, four o'clock and 4.30 finish because don't forget that after the um, IP debate has finished and the voting has taken place. We then have half an hour lunch break and we then have um, and at some point we also have an hour for executive members questions. So I'm just giving you some some warning about where we are uh, with this. Now, moving back to to the debate, um, members have only one speech apart from the mover who has the right of reply at the end of the debate and you all have five minutes. So Phil Bibby, can you uh, speak please. Thank you Madam Chairman. As previous speakers have alluded to there's no question that last year will be seen as probably the most challenging we will hopefully ever experience and Covid has thrown up unprecedented challenges for the highway service. They say when the going gets tough the tough get going and that is certainly what our officers, contractors and engineers have done so I'm pleased that members are joining me in giving sincere thanks and gratitude for what they have achieved and will continue to achieve. The first priority is always to maintain our highways in a safe and operational condition. So I'm pleased to report the following. The condition of our A, B and C roads continues to compare favourably with national trends. As a result of our focus on unclassified roads, we have spent an additional £21 million so far under Invest to Improve and our original target to improve the condition by a half has been achieved two years early. For the fourth year in a row, we have sustained top tier performance for the DFT Maintenance Incentive Fund. If we hadn't, our funding would have been cut by 70% or £12 million in the year. Spending on footways and cycleways has increased from 11% to 13% of our core maintenance budget. We also commenced our programme to renew and renovate ageing assets to keep them safe and in working order. In addition, we have installed social distancing measures in 15 town centres and high streets in response to the public health emergency, work with districts to allow the hospitality industry to put tables and chairs on our footways and introduce pop up cycleways and cycle parking following our successful bid under tranche one of the active travel fund. On the major scheme front, the following are in progress. The A120 Little Haddon Bypass and Flood Alleviation Scheme, the A602 Upgrade and the new River Bridge in Hoddesdon, which should be opening shortly. Next year, apart from continuing with our primary responsibilities, we have three other key priorities. And I'm delighted to say that our IP being debated now includes £20 million over the next four years to fund these. The increasing prevalence of unprecedented rain events, no doubt due to climate change, has highlighted some serious flooding problems, which need substantial investment to solve. Most of our drainage infrastructure was not designed for what we see today, heavy, sustained rainfall and overdevelopment. We need to increase funding for maintenance of our footways and cycleways to facilitate active travel. Our review of our speed management strategy has highlighted that to actually reduce speeds on some roads within existing and proposed 20 MPH zones to make them compliant, self-enforcing and safe. Sometimes significant costs are involved in traffic calming measures, so fully committed to these under LTP4 ambitions, we wish to be able to fund viable schemes. Apart from overall prudent financial control by this administration and the professional support of our finance team, with sound budgeting, we have been able to make these commitments, partly by redeploying £8 million from the original £37 million Invest to Improve funding, given that we have already achieved our target. We have still committed £8 million over two years to on existing commitments, which will further significantly improve the condition of unclassified roads. On top of this, £6.4 million has been secured under tranche two of the government's active travel fund, to provide some more strategic segregated cycleways and six schemes are now going out for consultation. Madam Chairman, I'm always 
proud to be part of Hertfordshire's highway service and whenever comparing notes with other authorities, I'm always appreciating what we do and with many of our strategies and work practices leading the way with our officers receiving national recognition. Clearly, with unlimited funding, we could solve all of our highway issues, but this will never be possible. However, continuous improvement is important to us, and we have recently completed a value for money assessment, taking forward actions to, provide, to further improve what we do for the taxpayer. This, together with our reviews on hierarchy, drainage strategy and general maintenance, will help inform our new highways contracts in 2024. Well, I can, can say about the opposition's last minute budget proposals. Well, there's not a lot I can say, actually. Our draft IP was published in good time for debate and scrutiny, but we are expected to consider these suggestions overnight. Well, I have, but there is insufficient time in this debate for me to answer individual points. But in summary, I would point out that these are either inappropriate use of reserves, ill-conceived strategies, Phil, without you're out of time. revenue funding in additional capital funding. Phil, you are out of time. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, now call Nigel Bell. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I speak to support our local uh, our Labour amendment, so admirably proposed by Councillor Sharon Taylor and also seconded by the very wise, wise words of Councillor Judy Billing. But may I start off, like others have done, to thank all our officers throughout our council across this county for their valiant efforts over the last year, whether it be children's services and social workers, adult care and care workers and our care homes, highways, and again, public health officials, they have all done their bit and they're still doing it with all the many volunteers in our towns and districts who have stepped up to the plate. As councillor for West Watford, which covers Watford General Hospital and the football club and deputy leader of the Labour Group, thank you. Our alternative amendment takes into account our concerns for the most vulnerable members of our county, starting off with our responsibility as corporate parents for our children in care. We once again have included the council tax discount for our care leavers, as it must be getting on for three years now since the council's deputy leader said she was going to look to introduce this here, as in other conservative and labour authorities across the country. We also want to make family centres, as they properly were under the Labour-introduced children's centres, the first point of contact for our young parents and carers to ensure early help for our young families and their children, not just in the pandemic, but in the recovery. Again, on children's well-being and education, we feel it vital to include CAMS and mental health counsellors, as we have been made aware, as we all know, of the issues arising from the year-long lockdown, as well as the waiting list issues on CAMS even before the lockdown. It is right that we use the inequality fund mentioned by Councillor Sankster in the Cabinet yesterday and the 2.1 million of investor transform reserve to look after all those in our county who have suffered during the pandemic. Remembering how many of our residents and districts, such as Stevenage and Hartsmere, as well as others, stepped up to the plate on free school meals and followed the example of Marcus Rashford, we have included the funding to help towards alleviating food poverty and holiday hunger. Again, as Councillor Sharon Taylor said, finding more money for our money advice unit is so important as we help families out of the pandemic with clear and practical advice online and over the phone. Others will mention other measures, but this is a Labour alternative budget taking into account the severe effects of COVID and being realistic about the present economic circumstances that the country and the county are in. I ask you to support our... Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Nigel. Richard Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. What a difference a day makes. Yesterday we were in lockdown. Today we're looking forward to beer garden normality. Boris's thrusting crocus is welcome anytime in Hertfordshire's warm spring sunshine. Can I just say, Sharon, your final minute of passion was heartfelt. Judy, your hectoring lecture delivered before we'd actually spoken was insulting. But let's reflect on the seriousness for a moment. COVID-19 has been deadly and cruel, taking loved ones and keeping families apart. Social care and NHS staff have taken absolute battering as they fought Corona for a year now. My humble thanks to everyone who continues to play a part in keeping all our critical care services going. 
And without Hertfordshire's volunteers, we would have really struggled. You have been outstanding. Nationally, the financial commitment has been magnificent, but there's been more than just money at play here. Our long-term commitment with the voluntary sector channeled to the adult wellbeing unit, our relationship with health in primary care and in our hospitals, exemplified by our hospital discharge teams, the bringing together of both tiers of local government have worked so well because the relationships have been in place for years now. This budget is a reflection of our commitment, not just to deliver statutory functions, but provide the leadership and direction that our multi-diverse communities demand. COVID may be with us for years, but the success of the vaccine programme has been the best silver lining through dark winter months. We know that for some there will be economic hardship. Housing and rent challenges, both low and high acuity mental health issues, carers needing a break, and those who struggle like our learning and physical disability residents will all need additional support in the year to come. Some of this is already in place, but we will do more with additional support for the voluntary sector. Why? Because Hearts Help has increased its calls by 289% this year. It is now a seven day go-to help service. The Money Advice Unit and CAB have delivered some 30 million pounds of additional benefits to residents who've been in crisis. Social prescribing, linking care, community and health services has a 90% approval rating. Digital inclusion has been at the forefront of support Digital coaches are currently in training. I think it may be churlish to highlight that the Lib, De Lib Dems were split on their support for our budget in panel, but they were. Importantly, Ron, you were advocating an even higher precept than we are today. We will only take the 2% adult care precept for this year and save 1% for next year. As I said in panel, we have a duty to all our residents, especially those facing hardship and setting unnecessarily high taxes is not the Conservative position. I don't believe it should be yours either. Our ethos is defined as supporting self-reliance, independent living, and an aspiration to live the best life where you want to. We have learned lessons during COVID. We must build on that so that across all our towns and villages, opportunities for work, socialising and volunteering give everyone a chance to succeed. That vision is enmeshed in connected lives. We want the next four years to be truly transformative for those we care for. Better accommodation, better connected, more independence, increased inclusivity, especially amongst our disability residents. New digital technologies have already been rolled out during COVID, but we will do more, spotting ill health sooner and maintaining independence longer. Our ambitious 28 million capital programme all recognises that we already recognises that we need more extra care housing, more nursing homes, mental health recuperation and supported living needs. Wormley Care Home will be delivered on budget in September. Keeping our residents one safe minute, has Richard. always been one minute, a top priority. The additional 700k will increase staffing and speed up casework. One of our biggest expenditures is wages for care staff. Last year, we put in total increases of 19 million, focused heavily on domiciliary care, addressing the challenge of high turnover and vacancies. This year, we will meet the national living wage of £9.50, a significant uplift. This budget reflects our aspiration to improve independence, drive up standards and build for the future with our partners. We think this is the right balance of careful spend and ambition. I commend it to you to ensure our vital work continues now and for the next four years. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Um, Bob Deering. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, as a result of sensible and prudent management by this and previous Conservative administrations over the past 10 years, Hertfordshire is widely recognised as one of the most financially stable and best run counties in the country. I'm pleased today to report on the part played by resource and performance. Resource and performance provides the full range of support services that keep the wheels of this council turning. These include assurance, finance, HR, improvement and technology, procurement, property, commercial, legal, democratic and member services, communications, customer services, policy, births, deaths, marriages, citizenship and coroner services and the delivery of school meals through Hearts Catering. 
Of course, since March 2020, everything, even our successful withdrawal from the European Union, has been overshadowed by the coronavirus pandemic. Resource and performance has risen to the challenge. Notable achievements include 7,000 staff connected to Microsoft Teams and switched to home working within just two weeks. Locality budgets increased by 50% for COVID causes. Nearly 120,000 free food and essential parcels delivered as part of Operation Shield. Working with public health and the districts and boroughs, over 70 sites for testing and vaccination delivery established. This includes 35 roving sites, 12 pop-up sites, and the five major sites now in operation, with another three to come by mid-March. And recently, over 14,500 tests distributed in EN10. What's so impressive is that none of these achievements are business as usual. Many officers have been redeployed. Officers have found themselves doing things they've not done before, often on an urgent basis, and they've done the county proud. Not everything is eye-catching. The registration of births, deaths and marriages has been difficult, but has continued. Court and other legal business has continued. All council meetings now take place virtually. Bulletins have been sent weekly to our MPs. We've launched a new diversity and inclusion strategy and resource and performance has played its part in the council's commitment to sustainability. The Customer Service Centre has continued to take about 600,000 calls a year. Looking ahead, the key priorities include, we will deliver transformation. We know from our experience that transformation is essential if we're to make limited financial resource go further. Spanning all services within the council, our transformation programmes include the future workforce, future workplace, go paperless, digital and next generation projects. We will deliver on diversity and inclusion. We will continue to deliver sound procurement and management of the council's property estate. We will deliver corporate communications, so essential to keep our residents informed. We will lead on supporting commercial opportunities such as further property development through Hearts Living Limited and sharing services where that will add value. We will support the council's sustainability commitment and progress the solar energy project at Smallford Pit we will deliver value for money. Since 2010, resource and performance has delivered savings on its own budget of £29.3 million and total savings of £36.7 million are projected by 24-25. The department's budget for 21-22 is approximately £72.5 million. This will represent a saving compared to the current year of just under £5 million. Indeed, the projections are that even in 2025, the budget will still be less than it is today. That's very impressive. Madam Chairman, resource and performance supports everything the Council does. It's helped ensure that this Council has maintained all its frontline services, uh, while at the same time rising to the challenge of coronavirus. It saved the taxpayer around £30 million on its own budget since 2010 and will continue to deliver further savings in the coming year and through to 2025. This would not be possible without the skill, determination, energy and good cheer of all the senior and other officers who we are lucky to have and to whom we owe a great debt of gratitude. The opposition parties would have spent reserves, sold off assets, culled communications who have never been more vital than today, and indeed culled the very senior managers who have worked to the point of exhaustion this year to meet the challenges of coronavirus. Thankfully, it is this and previous Conservative administrations who've been determined to support our staff and deliver transformation and sound financial management for the benefit of all our residents. And it is this Conservative administration that will continue to do so. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Seamus Quilty. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And it comes as no surprise that I will be supporting the administration budget today. But I feel I should comment, and I do so with an open mind, in relation to 5.2, the proposed amend amendment revenue budget by the Liberal Democrats as it's laid out in the in the order paper on page 10 and how it will be funded. Uh, so it's strange to say that part of their proposals will be funded by income from solar generation. And I presumably um, I presumably they mean here the potential small Smallford pit. 
And uh, now, what's strange about that, Madam Chairman? Well, in my area there in Hartsmere, here in Hartsmere, the local Liberal Democrats are strongly opposing a solar generation farm, saying solar panels should go on roofs, not on open spaces. Two totally opposite views, Madam Chairman, from the Liberal Democrats which destroys the credibility of their amendment in their revenue budget. Therefore, I will oppose. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Stevenson. Um, I believe I'm speaking as Hertfordshire's only independent councillor, and so I'm unfettered by party lines either way. Um, I, I want to speak up for small businesses in Hertfordshire who are really are suffering and approaching an unprecedented economic crisis. Um, I do think the integrated plan has been carefully prepared and followed the usual approach of balancing the budget in difficult circumstances. And I know the officers do a huge amount of work to bring all that uh, into place. Um, I am in favour of a hypothecated social services council tax. In fact, I'd be in favour of a directly elected social services commissioner, and we'd have an excellent candidate in Richard Roberts, who I think would lead that area very well. However, I do have some concerns about any increase in council tax at this point in time. I think the opposition have put forward uh, some points that have merit. Making better use of property assets in an accelerated fashion would be a very sensible move in these unprecedented times. I have an old British school in my own division, which I've actually tried to get our local arts organisation to buy, but we've just faced years and years of stonewalling from property services. Um, and I think there's also merit in more food parcel relief. I know in my own division, I have a, a charity, a private charity with their own funds. They distribute 3000 food parcels each week. They've distributed now more than 200,000 meal portions for families through schools. And this has made a huge difference to many families. That's not far different to the entire public sector effort. Uh, they were recognised with the Lloyds Bank uh, National Award, in fact, for their efforts. Um, so I think because of this unprecedented economic crisis, there really needs to be a re-evaluation of how the public sector works, especially in local government. We have heard a report that we could save 140 million by eliminating the middle tier district councils. I think now is the time to give that an absolute priority. The madness of having many, many triple hatters and internal party politic meetings and plottings can be a complete waste of time and money. And certainly I've seen in East Hearts, we, the strategic planning has only been frustrated by the presence of a middle tier stopping our sustainable travel town scheme moving forward. So anyway, in conclusion, all I want to say is that I think that now, just now is not the time to impose council tax increases on Hertfordshire residents, and that this should really be deferred until we've got through this unprecedented economic crisis, which in fact is only beginning and is unlikely to really be understood till September or October. Um, and that is really all I have to say on the subject. Thank you very much, Andrew. On the point of accuracy, um, Andrew, quite rightly, as he said, is, is an independent. We do, in fact, have two, and the other one is Roma Mills. Francis Button. My apologies to Roma in that case. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, the public has endorsed what Conservative-controlled Hertfordshire County Council has been doing in the last 12 years, and it's spelled out on page 54 of these uh, papers. 86% agree with streamlining services, and we've had constant corporate reviews and changing the way we work, huge investments in IT and technology, and we've saved almost £350 million in the last 10 years by doing this. 85% agree 
with our moves towards working in partnership, and that's already been referred to several times. The great networks that we have set up have been invaluable this year. 87% agree with helping people to help themselves. Online reporting of highways issues, we've done that. Huge expansion of and our support of the voluntary sector and our increased locality budgets this year for COVID related issues. So great public endorsement for our clear, strong leadership and direction since 2009. And that does include creating um, our investor transform funds so we could uh, change all our street lights to LED. That saved us so much money now, approximately £5 million a year at current electricity prices, I gather, because it's cheaper to run LED. Um, hugely reduced our CO2 emissions, so we've green well ahead of the uh, green agenda. But looking forward, this budget continues our endorsed strategy. I am concerned that both opposition parties are based, have based their budgets on raiding reserves. Um, Ralph has commented on this in his budget. I was surprised, I was very surprised, or maybe I wasn't, yep, I was very surprised to see such a rapid change in position from the Lib Dems. Four weeks ago, they wanted to, and I quote, significantly reduce the borrowing requirement by asset disposal, and again they repeated the words in writing, to provide for offsetting future borrowing requirements. But today's Lib Dems proposals are looking for £8.3 million from property sales in 21-22, i.e. the year we're talking about, which they propose to spend, nothing to put aside for reduced borrowing. And then in the following year, 2022-23, they propose to spend another £9.8 million from forecast property sales, again, not using it to reduce borrowing, but to spend. So I have two points. There is no consistency, no strategy, but a last minute change of plan in the Lib Dems budget. And similarly, a seeming lack of comprehension on our property strategy, which they unanimously supported. And I'm referring to the creation of Hearts Living, a property company to develop our own parcels of land surplus to requirement and we're constantly reviewing those pieces of land. We do very detailed business cases to ensure that we retain financial benefit for our taxpayers but also operational benefits. We review very carefully whether to develop or sell today or whether there's a greater benefit if we hold and develop later and a classic case in point the mothballed Little Furs School in South Oxy just down the road from me We've retained it and it's going to become a state-of-the-art residential care home. I'm glad we didn't sell it. In summary, we invest in the future. The opposition spends and it is a difference of philosophy. And I commend our budget unreservedly. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Francis. Fiona Guest. Thank you, Chairman. Richard Roberts must be telepathic because he touched on the wages that we are paying for care workers, as I'm going to do. It's all set out on page 44 of the Integrated Plan Pack, this mighty tome here. Yes. Page 44 highlights that we're not going to be paying 8.72 the national living wage, which we have to by law. It highlights that the real living wage is 9.50. The London living wage is 10.85. But the Hearts in-house wage is going to be 11.21 an hour. It highlights that the Hearts home care wage is going to be 12.43 an hour. And that the spot provider wage is going to be 12.58 an hour and the lead provider wage 12.77 an hour. This is welcome. It shows that we value our care workers and the work that they do looking after the most vulnerable residents of the county. I support this and I support the integrated plan. Thank you Fiona. Maurice Bright please. 
Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, first of all, can I say, um, in relation to Andrew Stevenson, I, I don't feel fettered at all by a, a party line. I quite like having a party line. Um, quite wouldn't mind having a party. Um, I think that the, the Lib Dem view on um, cutting back on press and corporate communications funding is odd, uh, particularly from a party which spends so much time producing leaflets, telling everyone how great they are, and even delivering some uh, during lockdown, personally delivering some. And, and Paul said, we spend too much time patting ourselves on the back at County with our press and corporate comms. And I think that the budget for press and publicity is a minuscule amount of the uh, huge county budgets. You've got a, here, uh, a total county budget of £870 million. Press and corporate comms is £1 million. That's less than or around 80 pence per person per year. Uh, and I think we should not just be proud of our achievements, but we need to explain our services and the decisions we take uh, in the name of our residents through our press and corporate communications. Um, or, is it, or is Paul worried because by doing so, uh, people will read of success and think, oh, it's a conservative administration. Um, press and politics is about informing residents what we're doing. It's about accountability and it's about transparency. And of course, our press and corporate communications, it must be accurate and it must be non-partisan. Um, and as a journalist by trade, um, I respect greatly the work of our county communications people, particularly the work that they've been doing during the pandemic, getting important messaging out there. Their work has been exemplary. We now need them more than ever um, to help guide us through and guide residents through um, the coming out of COVID and what we can and can't do. So I really could not support a budget that would cut uh, this most important of areas. It's a silly little cut, if you think about it, in relation to the total size of the budget. It's, a, it's an easy attack, and it goes against actually the grain of what the Lib Dems really want, and that is to get good messaging out there. So for all those reasons, I'm afraid, I can't support it. Thank you. Teresa Heritage. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's a little bit quicker than I was expecting. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, could I just start by um, thanking the opposition for their um, alternative budgets? But it's a shame that they didn't talk to us about it before. And I particularly refer to Judy Billings' remark um, and that we're not listening. We do listen. And I quite I take it personally that um, the Labour group, Nigel being their representative, didn't actually come and talk to me about any of the items that they brought up in their um, budget this year. And um, as far as I'm concerned, my doors are always open and I'm very black and white, so I'll say if I don't like something. So please, Judy, uh, don't make such sweeping comments. Um, please, you, should, you should have talked to me first of all. However, Children's Services at Hertfordshire is a very high performing service, as we all know, with good outcomes, mostly for children and young people, which is imperative for any council. Our universal and targeted services are regionally and nationally renowned, especially for family safeguarding model. The safety and the well-being of children's children of the county's children of young and young people is always at the forefront of our interventions. And our, our over the next four years, our, our priorities will continue to be um, maintaining the very important prevention work that we've been doing over the last 10 years. Um, this has been immensely helpful for the county because we've been able to keep young people out of care. We will be, we will be continuing to provide the family's first front door, um, our, our MASH service. And can I give um, a shout out for our newly formed during COVID, 1st of April, um, SASH service. This is our safeguarding adolescence, uh, safeguarding hub where we've been actually, our, our youth workers have been out there on the street during COVID, working with young people to try and keep them in their homes with their parents so they don't need to come into care. And also dealing with those very tricky behaviours sometimes. We'll also continue to, transfer, to transform our 0 to 25 service for young people with special ed educational needs and disabilities. And I know this is very challenging for parents, especially around EHCPs, but we're gonna keep on working on it. Don't think that we've ever forgotten about your trials and tribulations. 
to ensure we have sufficient placements for children looked after, both foster care and residential. Um, we'll keep working on that and Scrutiny did highlight their concern around the foster caring service. But please note, um, everybody, and I hope most people attended, that we've actually started a new fostering strategy and we're actually bringing on far more foster carers. We've also got our residential care home strategy, um, which um, where we have had a 5.4 capital investment so we can try and bring more young people back to Hertfordshire to live near their families. We want to deliver improved um, outcomes and um, an improvement basically for care leavers. We know how difficult it is for them. But as, our, as, our, as we are their corporate parents in effect, we need to do the best we can. And this is including in finding appropriate accommodation for them. Um, the Labour Group referred to um, council tax for care leavers. Um, I did report back on that, I thought. If I didn't, I apologise. We did look at it a few years ago. And actually what stopped us primarily, um, obviously was cost a little bit, but if all the districts in the county had played ball with us, we could have delivered it. Now, we're a partnership. We keep talking about partnerships. So our district and boroughs are also corporate parents and we need to remember that. We can review it again. One minute. OK, thank you. Um, we continue to deliver contextual safeguarding and a strong in emotional and mental health offer. To assist with recovery after COVID, um, as I previously mentioned, we will be developing a family poverty strategy to assist with the county COVID recovery. And I'm very grateful to the 11.5 recovery fund. So I'd like to thank at this stage all of my officers. You did brilliantly, including those residential care officers who um, stayed in the homes with the young people during COVID. Thank you so much. And thank you to our foster carers for the trem tremendous work you've done at keeping our young people safe. Very quickly, just to touch on climate change. We are not short of ambition on climate change in Hertfordshire. Um, we want to do the best we can. We are Terry, listening to residents. Terry, you're out of time. Sorry. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Sarah Bedford. Sarah Bedford. Right, I'll move on then. Um, next person on my list is Josh Bennett Lovell. Thank you, Chair. Chairman, um, there can are you a few hear me points now? I want to make, but, but sorry, sorry, Chair, who's speaking? I don't know. Carry on, Josh. If if Sarah sorry, turns I'm, up, I was I'll, trying to... I'll call her. Carry on, Josh, please. OK, right. Yes, yeah, sorry. There's, there's a few points I'd like to make, but overall, I'm going to be making my speech to council as I began my first, and that's in opposition to the plans of this authority. Although the executive member referred to services being maintained, this is simply false. In the last decade, we've seen services demolished. Children's centres have been closed. We've seen triple figure plus losses of fire officers and other council posts reductions in operations, with many being outsourced to private contractors and a continuation of grotesque levels of inequality in staff pay. Whilst lower paid staff providing council, um, uh, that's my point, providing council services to take home close to the living wage, and that figure is disputed, the salary afforded to many senior, office in the, uh, senior officers and the chief executive comes close to, and in at least one case exceeds that of the prime minister. And all that before previous year's four figure performance bonuses have been included. Now, this is all money that could have been used to continue running services, keep lower paid staff in jobs, improve workplace conditions for all and properly maintain services. In the last decade, what has been spent by this authority on providing more to the very highest paid officers has directly forced job cuts and worse conditions on most other staff. In my view, there are no fundamental differences between this budget and previous ones. Cuts will continue, and yet again, the top line message is the savings gap. Each year, this has been plugged by additional service cuts and accounting tricks, but never through what is so desperately needed. Real term increases in government grants sufficient to halt and reverse all cuts. We're told that representations are being made with national government to seek extra funding, but that there isn't any more available. 
However, in the last year, we've seen billions doled out to private firms by the government, with one contract going to the failed Serco track and trace system worth around £22 billion. Now, if you add up what has been provided to every local council in the country against what we collectively spent and needed to cover COVID-19 costs, you'll find only fractions of the sum spent on the Serco track and trace system, billions less than the cost incurred by local councils during the pandemic. Now, all this despite local government staff having proven themselves absolutely critical to the running of essential services. This government has starved local government when it most needed support and equally bears responsibility for austerity in Hertfordshire. Now, although I understand that some councillors can't support the Tories budget, I want to make a final plea for them to oppose this by voting it down if it gets to that stage. In my view, no piecemeal one or two percent increases in adult care spending uh, met in the most part, I add, by regressive council tax increases can make up for this being at least the 11th year of underfunding in a row for all other services. Arts County Council staff and the services they and our community require need and deserve better than the Tories budget. Resisting cuts requires us to be consistent in all arenas and on all occasions. And that means not giving a single inch to those who have made it their mission in the last 10 years to devastate them. I certainly won't be. Now, finally, as a group spokesperson for community safety and waste management, I would like to specifically commend the Labour Group commitments to raising crewing on fire appliances back to the previous level of five, which we've spoken about at length previously, as well as increasing the opening hours of waste and recycling centres. These are both significant. The first will directly enhance the health and safety of fire officers when, fire officers when attending incidents, and the latter will improve local recycling rates helping us to meet the demanding requirements to mitigate and reverse climate change at a local level. Whilst holding the spokesperson role, I have made a specific and continued commitment to be vocal in supporting fire officers in Hertfordshire and measures to tackle climate change. So I am hopeful that these aspects of our proposals in particular are taken up and commend, me, commend these in particular to the council. However, overall, I must end by saying that I was elected to this council with a commitment to oppose austerity and at every opportunity. And it's on that basis, Chair, that I'll be voting on the substantive motion today. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Sarah Bedford. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me this time? I can hear you, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak on the parts of the Lib Dem Amendment which are about children and young people and their futures. But firstly, I'd like to comment on two previous speakers. Two years ago, Councillor Heritage had to apologise to me for blaming the districts for not supporting the financial relief to care leavers. She apologised in writing and to the meeting. I hope she would do so again for repeating that comment. And secondly, Morris, the Lib Dems write and pay for and distribute under COVID secure rules our own literature and publicity. We don't expect it to be paid for by the ratepayers. Richard Roberts spoke about living your best life and having opportunities. For the disadvantage in our communities, this has been made even more difficult by the effects of the pandemic. For many of our children and young people, their life chances have been set back hugely in the past 12 months. I have been a supporter of measures to relieve child poverty for many years. I proposed school uniform grants go into the Lib Dem budget seven years ago and they have remained in the budget ever since. A shame the administration have not been able to take that up. It is a relatively small sum. A study from the Children's Society last year found the average cost of clothes for secondary school was £337 compared to the £105 that parents thought was reasonable. In my first year as a counsellor, I, I was contacted by a parent whose child had won an academic place at Palmetter School, which is in my division. They were very proud about this as their, uh, their family had no background in formal education whatsoever. However, the parent was at home caring for a severely disabled child and was on a very low income. She debated not allowing her child to take up the place. But thankfully, I was able to find grant at the school. I'm delighted that the Lib Dems are now matching that commitment to ensuring children can attend schools with expensive uniforms to properly supporting feeding our poorest children in lockdown and the school holidays. To have anyone in fuel poverty in this country is a disgrace. 
to have our children not having sufficient nourishing food is almost beyond description. Finally, children have been needing space to play outside in the past year, to walk and to cycle to open spaces, to get some recreation, to get some fresh air into their lungs, to burn off some of the energy that they're not burning off in the school playground or playing field. Many, many parents feel very worried about the speed and amount of traffic on our roads. And whilst the amount of traffic may have reduced, the speeds of the traffic have often increased to fill the space. That's why many parents tell me that they support 20 mile an hour zones in their neighbourhoods. To hear a senior Conservative Cabinet Minister describe those who support such traffic calming for the safety of the children as like climate change deniers and anti-vaxxers is totally insulting to those parents and also totally wrong. Please support the Lib Dem amendments to ensure that our poorest children are decently fed and able to afford the uniforms to attend our best schools, and also the support for pupil shattered mental health, which is supported by, I believe, most of the public health sector. Our children need us now more than ever, so please let's not let them down. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Steve Jarvis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ralph, thanks to talk to the additional uh, spending that is in the administration's budget. Um, but if we look at the sustainability funding, we say that it was only setting out to improve the energy usage in fewer than one in 20 of the county schools. The additional funding for 20 mile an hour speed limits will uh, largely be just the council refuses to follow the lead that's been shown elsewhere, not pay for more than a tiny proportion of the 20 mile an hour limits that are required across the county. And the funding that's proposed to deal with flooding will deal with but a tiny proportion of the incidents that we are aware of. And that's why the Liberal Democrat amendment uh, proposes making increases to the uh, funding to deal with energy reductions in schools, which will have benefits from a carbon and sustainability point of view, and also save those schools money. It proposes adding additional funding to address the revenue uh, impacts of highway flooding, the failure to maintain what's there already, which needs to go alongside any future investment in improving the highway drainage infrastructure. And of course, we solve the problem of the 20 mile an hour uh, installations uh, by changing the speed management strategy so they could be installed at much lower cost. Now, the normal criticism we get is, of course, that we might be depleting the reserves uh, and, and that we're spending capital on revenue items. But we've set out quite clearly how we can pay for the programme that we have proposed. And at the same time, increase the council's reserves and substantially reduce its borrowing by selling a proportion of the property that the council owns, but doesn't use. And in many cases, hasn't used for many years. Now that will fund the capital elements of the programme we've set out and it will reduce the amount of borrowing on what is otherwise the Conservatives proposed on would increase in, in the Council's indebtedness. And that will enable us to spend a greater proportion of the Council's resources on providing services and a smaller proportion of it on paying the interest on those borrowings. Now Ralph Sampster calls that a fire sale. But I don't think that fits with my definition of a fire sale. What I think we are doing is making sure that the assets that the council has deliver benefits for the people of Hertfordshire. And that's why I believe that the Liberal Democrat amendment produces an outcome that will be better for the people of Hertfordshire and why I hope members will support it. Thank you, Steve. Asif Khan. Uh, thank you, Ma Madam Chair. And um, can I thank, before I begin, uh, officers for the work that they've carried out uh, during this pandemic, as well as the frontline uh, key workers, the teachers, the NHS staff, the LSAs, the care staff, all of those staff. And I'm sure everybody will join in thanking 
I mean, and that can also thank and know the work of the councillors uh, who've led, uh, often led their communities during this particular pandemic. And that leadership needed to be shown during this uh, global pandemic. And finally, but not least, can I thank all those armies of volunteers that have supported those who have been affected by this wretched uh, disease that's affecting us. But this uh, pandemic has changed the economic outlook, the, the, econ the economy. Poverty has increased and increased exponentially. And I'm afraid this budget doesn't go far enough in dealing with these gaping inequalities that this pandemic has exposed. Some speakers mentioned that the decade of austerity has led to what we can see today, but it's not, it's exposed it more. Those inequalities have come. The health inequalities have been exposed. The rise in poverty and child, child poverty has also been exposed and has increased. And if using the reserves in a global pandemic is not good enough, when will reserves ever be used to sort out these particular problems? So it is the right thing and the good thing to do in this particular time. Fundamentally, it's the national government's failure to fund local government and local services has led to councils making cuts and not going far enough when they should need to. That's where it is. And this is where this administration, which shares the same political party as the government, needs to go knocking at Downing Street and asking for the fair funding, as other Conservative councils have done up and down the country, and other uh, parties have done, for a fair funding of local government. Our proposals are prioritising those key areas of dealing with inequalities, whether it's within the Bain community, whether it's within child poverty, within schools. And that's why I urge everybody to vote in favour of our amendments to this budget and work for a much fairer society, a much fairer county, a much fairer uh, people, so the problems are solved. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Asif. Tim Hutchings. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Apologies for the delay. I'm doing everything one-handed at the moment. Um, thank you. Um, I think to say that 2021 has been a public health challenge is probably the understatement of the century. But it's with great pride that I reflect not only on the response and leadership that has been demonstrated, not only by my officers, but also that of our partners and colleagues in districts and borough councils around the county. Our friends in the NHS and the magnificent support we've received from a host of volunteers in general and the general public in particular. I make that statement uh, as a cross party statement. I think we can all look back on the last 12 months with some pride. Without it, the light which we now see at the end of the tunnel would be a great deal more distant. Forgive me for mixing my metaphors, but whilst it is fair to say that we're not entirely out of the woods, Subject to continuing vigilance and any other unexpected twist, we would now, as the Prime Minister confirmed yesterday, seem to be on the home straight. In making this point, I recognise the need to be prepared for ongoing challenges arising from the pandemic. I'm sure that these will be with us for some time to come. We cannot know exactly how they will manifest themselves, but by working with our partners, I'm confident that we will overcome them. Whether that will be in finding additional support to overcome an increase in mental health problems or others uh, as yet unseen public health issues, we will apply the same energy and agile thinking that was applied throughout the pandemic. The announcement this morning by the Executive Member for Resources will be extremely helpful in enabling us to do this. We have been tested and will take a great deal of learning from the past year or so. But beyond that, I believe the experience has provided absolute affirmation of the importance of not only satisfying the demands of today, but also a pursuance of a strong public health agenda with embedded objectives of improving the health of our residents by promoting preventive actions and by doing all we can to support the reduction in, of health inequalities. As we move forward, 
We do not know as yet the size of the public health grant, but as in previous years, we move forward with some confidence that our expectations are realistic and that where necessary, reasonable provision has been made. By doing so, we will be in a position to continue the support we already have in place to run a full range of programmes, which include activities such as support for family centres, which incidentally, as far as I'm aware, none have been closed uh, other than temporary closures during the COVID crisis. Drug alcohol is, uh, and alcohol services, weight management programmes, sexual health clinics and smoking cessation services and so much more uh, are all in the plan and will continue. In addition, we will, in partnership with districts and boroughs, continue to support the development of healthy hubs across the county, as well as the Behaviour Change Unit, which is already providing significant contributions across the authority. Madam Chairman, I mentioned, mentioned at the outset our clear ambition to support health prevention methods <coughs> and the reduction of health inequalities in the county. In truth, all our activities should, and in fact do, make a contribution to this. A fine example is provided by the smoking cessation work of our health improvement team, who have not only contributed to a big reduction in smoking in the county in recent years, but have also introduced much copied initiatives to support smokers throughout the pandemic. They have also introduced a new programme to assist in the reduction of smoking in pregnancy. Measures such as these not only promote good health in individuals, but also contribute to improved household finances and will ultimately reduce the demand on NHS services. In truth, there is no silver bullet when it comes to reducing the impact of health inequalities. It requires long term and persistent effort. I'm delighted that in supporting this uh, already significant work in this area, we were able to announce further funding which will be allocated from our reserves. Madam Chairman, I started by alluding to the fact that this has been a challenging year and in finishing, I must say that in reality, every year has its challenges. But I say with some confidence that we're in a good position to move forward. I enthusiastically support the proposed budget. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Drida Gordon. Uh, yes, Th thank you, Chair. Um, I speak to support the Labour amendment and particularly want to address my comments to um, the adult care uh, proposal um, as a spokesperson in my group for adult care. And I want to uh, just first of all say that uh, our proposal in terms of um, bringing or looking to bring the uh, services back in house are not new. So um, they will, members of this council will be familiar with the fact that we have put this forward as a budget item on many an occasion because it really is at the heart of Labour policy. Now, the Labour Party nationally is committed to creating a national care service along the same principles as the NHS, that is funded through taxation and free at the point of need. These are fundamental principles that saw an NHS established in this country, a cherished surge service that we've had to rely on so much in the year that Councillor Sankster has called a year like no other. And we want to see some parity with, uh, with the services of the NHS and our care service. Now, we recognise the challenges faced by our ACS team and how they've risen magnificently to those challenges over the past year, which has been particularly difficult for everybody. And I'd like to add my um, praise um, to, the, uh, to the comments that have already been made for all our officers and how they have uh, reacted so well um, to, to the challenges that have been posed throughout the year. However, the pandemic has also highlighted how precarious the whole situation that some of our private care providers have faced. We need the security of a system that is not subject to the vagaries of the market. We in hearts know what happens when care businesses fail and we have to pick up the pieces. Our proposal is entirely reasonable. What we're asking for is a feasibility study um, to be put in place so that when current contracts come to an end, we will consider providing services in-house or with a charitable trust or cooperative. 
the other point in our budget proposal is that we look to providing free personal care for our users. This has been a policy in Scotland since 2002. Anybody 65 or over um, is entitled to free personal care. Now, isn't it really time that this iniquitous situation was, was solved and that we could be trailblazers here? We could provide that free personal care to the users of our care services within our county. It's all been properly um, funded and uh, worked out how that will be funded. So I, I would like to think that members will be able to support these very reasonable recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Breda. Right, it is uh, 1.15. I'm now going to call lunch break, so we'll be very prompt for a half hour. I've, there's still quite a few people who, who have registered to speak. I would say if anybody else wants to put their name forward now, then I hope that you would have something original and important to, to add to the debate. Not the time, you know, all, all of the contributions so far have been, have been great, but we do have a, you know, it would be good to try and move on um, uh, with this and, and uh, start getting uh, t towards the end of the debate itself. Thank you. See you in half an hour at 1.45.
members by my clock it's 1 45 and i think we're going to be going live any second now Right, right. Welcome back to this uh, the afternoon uh, session of this, of this council meeting. Uh, we still have several speakers um, to, to get through uh, before we move to the vote. So let's crack on. And the first speaker is Margaret Eames Patterson. Margaret, are you there? Yes, Chair, sorry. Right. Off you go. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to echo uh, Sharon Taylor's alternative budget and Judy's speech just to say thank you very much to all the officers and all they've done in COVID in what has probably been the most difficult year of the Council, I should think, since the Second World War. But um, I just want to say thank you because I think it's been um, amazing seeing people pull together. And my point has been really just to say in this budget how much we could save by doing better joined up working and having in-house services, which actually comes into our budget. I'm going to illustrate just by, first of all, um, on page 19, we we actually mention simplifying the process for no traffic zones around schools um, and the 20 mile an hour zone which we've heard from three members of the public and the fact that that covers four cabinets that, that to do 20 mile an hour speed limits properly and well and efficiently within our council we should be doing joined up working that involves not only resource and policy but highways, public health and community safety. And I remember when I first became a county councillor, I was a bit appalled to hear that the only way we could really enforce lower traffic limits was if there were fatal accidents um, on the junction we were talking about uh, or in the area we were talking about. And I've I really feel from a public health point of view, that's, that's appalling. We shouldn't see people die before we reduce the speed limit. And I felt very much for Deborah Tyler, uh, our member of the public, who felt she had to address Tim Hutchins in public health about road accidents, because we're seeing the consequences of no joined up thinking. And um, so I would like to just say that our budget really is also emphasising in-house services that does lead to better joined up thinking. And that's particularly to do with highways where we are outsourcing things to Ringway that makes it quite difficult to do joined up thinking with other cabinets and with other people inside the council. And there are huge delays as a result to how uh, we implement um, actions that we have decided we really need, but then take two years or in some cases five years or 10 years to get a 20 mile an hour speed limit implemented. And it shouldn't be like that. Um, and I'm just going to give another illustration of joined up thinking to say um, we, we underline children's mental health, which in COVID is terribly important at the moment. And that is joined up working between education, public health and children's services particularly. And we do need to try and do that better. And I'm, I do know that the vision of family services was really to do more joined up thinking. But at the moment, I don't feel we have done that enough with children's services, with, with um, well, it's not just children's services, with m child mental health. I think family, the family um, services, the family centres should actually in COVID become digital drop-ins that, that, that teenagers know where they can turn because they don't know where they can turn to find somebody who will listen to their, their problems. And we need to be more imaginative about thinking what does it feel like for them? Um, and then thirdly, I wanted to mention the sustainability fund, that that really we also need to be much better at joined up thinking. That is going to cover all the cabinets, but we do need projects where we are unafraid to see the joined up cabinet approach. 
and uh, accountability. One minute. So uh, that my point was really that we do stand for more in source funding, in, in house funding, and that will save us money in the end, and that we should be having that approach as in community, um, it, sorry, waste management, we're already doing it in house and seeing the savings. I think that's a very good example. Thank you, Margaret. Nigel Quinton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> There is much to welcome in the Conservative budget um, and particularly the increases to pay for care workers. Um, note, Ralph, that was one of your unaffordable and irresponsible suggestions that we brought forward two or three years ago. Um, and the funding for flood prevention and sustainability is very welcome. Um, but we want to do much more. Um, now, as Steve Jarvis has already pointed out, our proposals do not put a raid on reserves, um, even if Labour's do. But even if Labour's do, I would argue, uh, in the absence of proper funding from the Conservative government, we are not in a good place. We have to respond to the emergencies of climate and there is this, the emergency that we're now faced with recovering from this pandemic. Um, Andrew Stevenson commented that now is not the time to raise council tax. Well, we kind of agree in principle, but if there's no funding coming from central government, then we have no choice. Um, I want to speak to just a couple of the lines in the Lib Dem amendment. Um, firstly, on the solar um, investment. Um, I can't remember it was, Seamus, I think, suggested we were being inconsistent. I mean, please. The case he quotes is one where there's a local wildlife sensitivity. It's got nothing to do with the principle of whether we want to be investing in solar. We want to invest in solar. The industry are telling us now that we can get less than five year payback on this sort of investment. Um, we need to be doing it more. We've put a million pounds in the budget per annum for investment in um, our line CS5. Um, we think that should be generating more than the officers have allowed us to put in the revenue line. Um, but even with what they put in, they're actually agreeing with us that it's close to a five year payback in the first couple of years. For some reason, the returns diminish in time, which is um, beyond comprehension. So there's more money to be gained there. And arguably, we probably could be investing more um, in, in that side. And, and it's, the council has a huge resource, both of land and of rooftops, which are suitable for this type of approach and this return on our assets. Um, we're not selling off the crown jewels, Ralph or anybody else. We're making good use of our assets and managing them properly. On public health, sorry, on just quickly on cycleways on CS8. Um, one of the things that came up in the last year was a petition from um, people wanting to see investment in a proper cycleway between St Albans and Redbourne. I've got several around my division that also need to be invested in to link up properly between our towns if we're to really deliver on LTP4. So we put money into the budget for that purpose, and I think it's a very commendable one. Public health. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Tim. I think I think what he and his officers have done this year has been extraordinary. Um, and all the things he listed that we've got on the public health agenda, I completely support. I think we are going in the right direction. Um, but he'll he'll know I, I probably sound like a bit of a stuck record on this every year i bemoan the fact that the council refuses to do more than the government provides in via the public health grant we could spend more money on public health in the county if we see the need to do so and i think in the uh, response to the pandemic there is a very clear need um on health inequalities as others have already mentioned um really been exposed by by the pandemic we need real active action to put that right and get into the more deprived communities to provide the support that's required. Um, children's mental health, we had a crisis before this started. It's only got worse with COVID. Um, so what we believe would make a real difference here. One minute. Thank you. Um, is a greater number of mental health trained school nurses. So our amendment RS6 addresses this directly. The current cohort of school nurses number just about 28 full time equivalents in the county for well over 500 schools. Um, they do have support from additional um, less qualified staff, 
Uh, but what we want to do is raise the budget over the next four years from the current just under four million uh, by an additional two and a half million. Now, we believe that would allow us to add at least another 50 mental health qualified school nurses. Um, it's it's not quite what I know in public. I think our, our director of public health, Jim McManus, um, has has long argued that we ought to have one in every school if uh, we were really doing this properly. But it's a step in the right direction towards that goal. Um, we need to uh, we need to find funding find funding to put in place these types of schemes, which are really okay, required right now. Nigel. Thank you very much, Colette. Thank, Thank you, Terry Doris. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I want to begin by thanking all our education staff in schools and other departments, together with my libraries, archives and localism colleagues for their absolute dedication during the last 12 months. <clears throat> Let me firstly reflect on our schools programme. We have been and continue to be alert to changing pupil numbers and a plan for these. In the academic years 1920 and 2021, we have supported the provision of 878 additional primary places and 1,182 secondary places at a cost of £35.1 million. In addition, we have invested £6.9 million in improving SEND provision, including the creation of an additional 233 special school places. Looking forward, we are committing £53 million to providing two new special schools, plus the important special resource provision for young people with social communication difficulties. I am especially pleased that we will be rebuilding the Valley School in Stevenage, along with the re-provision of the Stevenage Education Support Centre. Building schools is not something that is achieved instantly. We purchased the land for the brilliant Catherine Warrington School a good number of years before it was finally opened, and we have allocated funding totalling some £98 million to meet the provision of new schools to meet the demand as a result of the Bishop Stortford North development. We've expanded St Albans School in uh, St Peter's School in St Albans, and we work with local planning authorities and developers to ensure that the, we get the right land supply for schools in places where they will be required and at an appropriate time to match the development areas. We have put in place our plans for the first net zero carbon school in Buntingford. In addition to this, you will see from the IP that we're investing £23.5 million in school repairs and maintenance in the forthcoming year. This demonstrates our absolute commitment to providing the best possible education and skills facilities for our young people. Let me also mention the great work undertaken by Hertfordshire Music Service. The advent of COVID has had a dramatic effect on its ability to deliver their normal teaching programme, but within a matter of weeks they had agreed a partnership deal with two online uh, music education organisations, enabling every Hertfordshire school pupil to have access to their platforms for free until September 21. Councillor Taylor refers to the digital provision for schools. The latest information that I have reminds me that to week seven, DfE have provided 8,860 devices and 362 routers to Hertfordshire schools. Councillor Sikoski refers to free school uniforms, especially for pupils at selective schools. It is my understanding that a school including in Three Rivers frequently has a small facility to support parents in such circumstances. We continue to plan for the future and will transfer the operation of the library service to Libraries for Life when the circumstances are right. We have demonstrated our commitment by relocating Hatfield Library to a new retail area premises and our smart relocated libraries at Redbourne, Wheat, Hampstead and Nedworth look forward to welcoming new and familiar faces. We are providing over £2 million for the reprovision of Ware Library. We note the Grimsey report which highlights the impact that a library can have within the high street retail environment of the future. By the same token, we are also pleased to see an increase in online use of our facilities. This past year has been hugely challenging, but all my departments have contributed, have continued to operate, albeit with a constant focus on the pandemic. Our libraries team have created ready-read service minute. while continuing to provide some remote facilities. 
We have diverted our spend on physical books to e-books and audio books, which have enabled people at home to continue to enjoy the spoken word. And we look forward to the reopening of libraries as soon as possible after the 12th of April, when we can actually have people back in um, at the appropriate time to enjoy the various other activities which the libraries in continue to engage in, and also to work with our archives and local studies. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Chairman. Thank you. John Hale. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll keep my comments brief, but first I do want to repeat what has been said before about the tremendous achievement of the officers of this council and the hundreds of volunteers over the last year, because it's worth repeating. Their hard work has been vital in protecting the residents of Hertfordshire, and we owe them a lot. The proposed integrated plan lacks ambition, especially when it comes to delivering a sustainable Hertfordshire. There is much more that could be done, and that I hope a future administration will do to move this council towards net zero. For instance, opportunities have been missed over the last four years to introduce better insulation in buildings and install solar panels on schools and household waste recycling centres. The Liberal Democrat amendment it accepted would do more to make Hertfordshire a fairer, healthier and greener community, hopefully by encouraging energy saving and alternative energy sources. Hopefully a future administration will be bolder and put the county on a track to a brighter, better future. We have heard a series of Conservative executive members talk about what they have achieved over the past year, but speak very little about what's in their integrated plan for the future. And that's because there is so little in that integrated plan. So I can't support that plan as put forward by the administration. And I hope the members will look at the amendments both the Liberal Democrats and Labour put forward and realise that if adopted, they would improve the plan and therefore they should be supported. Thank you. Thank you, John. Terry Hone. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I'll uh, talk, if I can, about my portfolio in particular. So let me start with waste management. Um, following the development and opening of the state-of-the-art recycling in the youth centre at Ware, this portfolio is looking to make significant uh, investments in capital projects that will improve the availability of waste and recovery services we offer to the residents of Hertfordshire. This includes the redevelopment and expansion of our busiest recycling centre off Gunnerhood Road in Stevenage, plus construction of a new recycling centre at Chewing Road in Welling Garden City. In addition, we were progressing the construction of a transfer station in the east of the county to service primarily Broxbourne Borough and East Hearts District Council. As part of our attempts to reduce the number of trucks taking Hearts waste to contract it out of county its recycling contractors, we have budgeted to purchase more compacting equipment that will optimise the volume of material in which uh, consolidated trucks are looking into, and we are looking also into Raya as an option for the out-of-county movement of residual waste. For community safety portfolio, can I start by saying a big thank you to our firefighters for the extra tasks and efforts they put into tackling the COVID crisis, way, way beyond the call of duty and with no complaints they've got on the job. We have budgeted over £30 million for a new Joint Emergency Services Academy at Longfield in Stevenage. The joint venture with the Hearts Police will replace the existing less functional but effective existing site with in desperate need of substantial maintenance uh, and maintenance investment. The new plan facility will ensure that our, fi our firefighters have up-to-date state-of-the-art training that they must have in order to continue the outstanding service they give to the residents and beyond um, in not only fire-related incidents but other than often life-saving call-outs including road traffic accidents, access to vulnerable residents uh, residence properties and even getting horses out of sinkholes. When it comes to sustainability, we have published a waste management prevention agenda which details the many projects being undertaken, including reuse shops at our recycling, recycling centres, online queuing times at the recycling centres to reduce carbon emissions of vehicles visiting the site, and as mentioned, container compacting to reduce the number of out of county HGV trips. The leading by example team achieved a number of outstanding changes to practice at county, county council offices, including removal of single use kitchen utensils and use of reusable cutlery, including knives, forks, spoons, stirrers, single use cups, mugs, crockery and straws, to name a few. In addition, collection facilities were made available for crisp packets for employees and the public at County Hall. Last year, we banned the intentional 
at outdoor release of balloons and sky floating lanterns from, from land or property owned or controlled by us, both of which were damaging the environment and endangering animals and wildlife, plus create a risk of fire. The future, we're looking at internet sales, of refurbished furniture and electrical appliances, reuse of paints, rental of VU centres as charity shops, mattresses and carpet, and carpet recycling too, bike refurbishment to name but a few. And let me add the Hearts Waste Partnership Waste Aware team have been instrumental in putting in place communications and processes to reduce fly tipping throughout the county. These programmes are now used nationwide by many local authorities. Regarding the, the budget proposals from the Labour Group for recycling centres, uh, that they, they may be surprised to know that all our sites operate all over all weekends anyway, even though you mentioned it, they all turn the weekends. And, they're now fully, and now they are fully under control, our control of these sites, we'll look at a number of alternatives for delivery of recycling centre service. Next, a concern regarding crewing of fire appliances. This has been debated on a number of occasions at this by this authority and in this chamber, metaphorically speaking, and reflects current practice in many fire stations, fire services, including us. The PPE, as has been communicated in detail to Labour at this leadership, whilst this is a national arrangement, one minute. I can assure you that our fire rescue team ensures our firefighters have all the PPE they need and a regular test of COVID as appropriate. Um, as the Chief Fire Officer has advised the Labour Group leadership for the safety of our firefighters. Many thanks go to Lib Dem Group, uh, who obviously couldn't find it wrong with our budget, so they've passed on it. Uh, let me say, I should be supporting our budget, including the council tax increase, which is not the maximum allowed, which one authority already mentioned is being used to finance even more committee meetings and spending tens of millions of pounds on investment, the equivalent of a whole year budget, into delayed pet commercial project schemes rather than the services expected by our residents. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Eric Buckmaster. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll just begin regarding Joshua Bennett Lovell's attack on our senior staff. I found that extraordinary. This is a very well-run council and is so because of our policies and ability to attract the very best senior officers who in turn convert their expertise in running our services in the best possible way and getting the best value for money. I also can't believe what I've just heard from John Hale. There are so many positive initiatives in the integrated plan. I'd like to pick up on some of the points raised on highways matters so they're not lost. Um, we have an excellent highway service. In terms of the Lib Dem suggestion of change of approach to responding to defects, our approach to maintaining highways is looked at holistically, investing in programme planning and prevention and works really well. The Invest to Improve programme on our unclassified roads has been a phenomenal success in reducing those needing attention. And as the executive member has said, the targets have been achieved early, halving the number of roads needing attention. And any committed schemes on the integrated works programme will still be fulfilled with four million pounds in each of the next two years. And that frees up resources for other great things that we're going to do. The carriageway condition data actually shows significant improvements on all classes of road over the past seven years, contrary to the misinformation spread by the Lib Dems in their leaflets and faux newspaper. It has come up a number of times but as we've already heard today, the speed management strategy is absolutely designed to give clarity and advice on the establishing of safe and viable 20 mile an hour zones. And there is funding to give further backup where schemes need additional support to be implemented. And I'd like to remind everyone, Chairman, that there was an all party member advisory group looking into this and there was joined up thinking. Through the proposed budget and additional funding in our proposals, there are opportunities for consideration by all members in the appropriate places. The climate change response funding of 10 million pounds over the period to improve drainage and other in initiatives gives us a tremendous package of measures. The suggestion of dimming the LED lights in the morning is marginal in terms of the overall budget and the bulk of the savings have been made already through the conversion pro pro process and including a substantial reduction in carbon footprint. And finally, in terms of trust and team building, as mentioned by Judy Billing, 
I feel I must say we have witnessed, not necessarily from her party, but months of canvassing by the Lib Dems with the most erroneous and misleading assertions during a time when this administration has focused primarily on supporting residents during this extraordinary crisis. And it does them no credit at all to have been seen doing that and in that way. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Nick Hollinghurst. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, before I forget, I would like to express my respect and appreciation uh, to all the officers uh, in the council that I've come across uh, during my period as, as councillor. But I, I'm speaking in on uh, support of line RS6 of the Liberal Democrat uh, amendment, which is to improve uh, mental health facilities for young persons. Mental health problems do create a vast amount of unhappiness, not only for themselves, not of the sufferers themselves, but it tends to radiate through the circle of friends and family and out into wider society. The, things like this need prompt attention. And when I was on the Health Scrutiny Committee, I saw the very good results that came from the Prompt Response to Psychosis Unit uh, that was set up in Letchworth with another one uh, also in Watford. The benefits from the prompt response to mental health problems was proved uh, time and time again. Uh, what a pity, therefore, that uh, these were only uh, pilot schemes. And although uh, some of the work that they did did survive the end of the pilot scheme period, uh, it, it did uh, falter and must be restored. Uh, our proposal in RS 12, 6, uh, is to improve uh, mental health facilities for young people by providing 50 uh, nurses, 50 nurse practitioners. Uh, I feel that we ought to be more ambitious. It really is only the tip of the iceberg as far as our ambition is concerned. We need to have proposals that take us forward uh, and this is what we have proposed in a way which is realistic in the light of present circumstances. But looking to the future, I think we ought to aim at having a thoroughly resourced schools mental services program. Something in line with what one sees in the northern European countries, particularly Scandinavia. A core and cluster basis, groups of five to six schools served by centrally located, by two centrally located, fully qualified psych child psych psychiatrists and supported by a team of four nurse, nurse practitioners, each to the five or six school cluster. This is, as I say, normal provision in many countries, especially of Northern Europe. It should be the norm in the UK too. I would like just to leave that with councillors as an ambition for the future, uh, extending out of our amendment uh, line RS6. Thank, Thank you, Nick. Right, there being no other speakers um, from the floor, um, I'm going to ask uh, Ron Tyndall, a seconder of the second Liberal Democrat group amendment um, to speak. And Ron, you have five minutes. Thank you, Colette. Uh, first of all, uh, very quickly, I'd like to be associated with all the uh, praise and thanks that have gone before me to officers, volunteers and staff of other uh, blue light services, etc. I'm pleased to second this mo the motion on free school meals as it has become painfully clear that the damage to our children over the past 12 months has not only been to their mental health and learning, but also to their general health and well-being. That nutrition and diet are keys to good health have, has been known for many years. After World War II, all children regularly received health supplements at school. Only in the 1970s did the Conservatives under Mrs Thatcher stop free school milk. In his introduction to the budget debate, Ralph Sankster commented on the way in which the council has stepped in 
when the government stumbled and failed. The COVID pandemic has brought back the need to look at the welfare of our children at school as well as their learning. For some time it's been recognised that many low income families have struggled to provide for the needs of the children without help. The growth of food banks and school breakfast clubs testify to that. And I'm sure that in this chamber there are county councillors who have made donations to their local schools. Free school meals have become a vital necessity for many children and often the only hot meal available to them on a daily basis. I do not share Richard Roberts' faith in Boris's delivering on his promises given his previous failure record. Even the key policy of vaccination would not have happened without the extraordinary efforts of the NHS and local government who stepped up. It was also interesting that Richard referred to council tax, which in fact illustrates the failure of the Conservatives to adequately fund social care resulting in a 15% rise in council tax over recent years. Ralph admitted that we do not yet have the government's intentions on the summer provision of three school meals. And I trust that Ralph will acknowledge that our children's future is a real and pressing issue. For a generation to go hungry for six weeks during the summer as we come out of pandem pandemic is not a good view of one of the richest countries in the world. We have to feed our children. And if the government won't do it, then we have to. I urge everybody to support this amendment totally separately from all the other budget discussions because it is an essential amendment and needs to be passed. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Can I invite Stephen Giles Medhurst uh, to uh, seconder of the first Liberal Democrat group amendment to speak, please? And Stephen, you have 10 minutes. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Clett. First, as the Liberal Dem leader of the Liberal Democrat group, I want to have my groups and my thanks to the officers. And I will single, as indeed did some another member out too, and Jim, webinar uh, McManus, as I think some people will now call him, uh, and Daryl Key. But it's all officers at all levels who have stepped up. I was very sp pleased to speak privately to three officers, junior officers, just before Christmas to thank them. It was a pleasure to discuss their roles and their work. However, I do feel I have to call out Ralph Sankster for quite frankly his rude and offensive comments and treatment of a member of the public this morning on quite reasonable questions in relation to the council's issues and failures, in my view, to assess value for money. I'm sorry, linking a member of the public as an anti-vaxxer and a climate change denier was rude beyond belief, and I believe Kevin Ambrose deserves an apology publicly. Now, the Conservatives have a history of voting down the Lib Dem and Labour budget amendments year after year. Uh, but actually, what tends to happen is a year or two later, they introduce various things that we propose, i.e. the extra investment in highways, backtracking or free school mills, supporting cycle routes, and yes, solar energy income. Indeed, one of the items here, small it might it be, has been proposed three times before. Officers say it could be done tomorrow. And that, of course, is the dim of streetlights early in the morning at 5 a.m., rather like they are dimmed at night. But no, the dog in the manger attitude is, no, we, even though we could save the money, we won't do it. Had it already been done, we could have saved £160,000 already. I thank Theresa Heritage for thanking us for our alternative budget. But all the points in this budget, as indeed I've just pointed out, have either been made previously or indeed at panels or at scrutiny. But at least we have an alternative budget. We used to get an alternative budget, yes, on the day from Ralph, when he was a member of Free Rivers District Council and was the Tory leader there. Uh, now the Tories have given up and they don't propose anything. Now Ralph has gone. As for wasting money, let residents not forget the £119,000 wasted on failed pet, pro failed pet project to demolish the district councils. Expenditure that was kept secret from most councillors until after it was spent. Our budget amendments, and thanks to Scott and Steve, through various virtual meetings and in email exchanges, have helped us put this together. It's not only fully costed, it's signed off as deliverable and achievable. Indeed, as already been suggested, I would suggest the solar generation income is underestimated against the planned expenditure, such as the off-grid solar lighting in selected streets, something the Free River District Council already has in place. 
Indeed, unlike misleading statements from some conservative councillors, I suggest they read the amendments, which show a net contribution to reserves of over 1.2 million and a £5 million reduction in borrowing over the life of this budget proposal. And the budget is proposed in just disposing of 10% of the council's massive estate. Yes, just 10% of what it doesn't already use. Our budget looks forward to a fairer, greener and healthier council, and it changes the direction of travel. And I'll highlight just one key area where this administration has definitely got it wrong. Page 178 of the integrated plan, I've got it here, 8.47 million spent on highways correspondence and the only justification for £87,000 extra expenditure for three more members of staff is to ensure the customer journey is managed appropriately. Now, if you don't call that a waste and that excess expenditure, I don't know what is. And yes, we would read to change the priorities and we could do that without increasing costs. We would move forward with town and aerial wide 20 mile an hour pilots. We would ensure that potholes as big as deep, as indeed that was, and that deep, in my own patch, which was only repaired yesterday after 25 days, will be repaired in five days. We want people to walk and to get healthy. And that means sorting out the pond in every single road junction drop curb where it's covered with water. No wonder people opt to use their cars instead. We would use the extra investment to improve our side roads on our classified roads. And yes, there has been some improvement and that's been reported but it's nowhere near enough as the approval we should have. And what's more, there is now a planned budget cut, eight million pounds or 22% of the investment that was promised some years back. And that is a detrimental effect. Try telling the residents in the 61 rows detailed in this report last week that will now not have their streets resurfaced and repaired in the next year because of the cut of that expenditure. Yes, 61 roads removed, it says, due to change in programme priorities, i.e. the cut. So what about those tens of thousands of residents? They're not going to get those roads resurfaced. Perhaps you might say, well, that's why we need to spend 1.5 million on corporate publicity plus 8 million on high-risk correspondence to tell them we're not going to do the job we promised we would be doing. And as for 20 miles an hour, yes, we were part of the MAG, the part of it, as indeed was Judy Billings. And we were led to believe actually this would make it much easier and simpler to introduce these zones and areas. But that really was demolished when one member of the administration said, well, if the speeds are high, then the speed limits should go up. And indeed, it might make it difficult to introduce such zones. That's why the policy, as presented so far, is wrong. And in summary, alternative budget supports a change to a greener, healthier and fairer county. It supports encouraging it walking, cycling, it deals with dangerous potholes and repairs to our side roads. It provides funding for free school meals, at least in the first year, and at least ask for a commitment from the government to support it, if not in the next financial year, in future years. We should live up to the aspirations of people like Marcus Rushford to get this sorted. And yes, we would plant more high wage trees to ensure that we have a greener, more valuable contribution to our environment. And yes, we would ensure for investment into our schools, we'd not only save energy, but we would make them warmer. Now, irrespective of what your views may or may not be in terms of the overall budget, I would ask very seriously for the administration to reconsider the £5.5 million additional money that's a windfall to some extent, that they're going to put into the equality budget, equality savings, and use three and a half million of that to at least give that commitment to the poorest, youngest children in our society that need support in terms of funding free school meals for the full term of the financial year. And at the same time, go back to the Chancellor and say, look, this is a priority for levelling up not only communities, but levelling up the welfare of the most needy in our society. And therefore, please support the Second Amendment, irrespective of your votes, on the first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Stephen. I'd now like to invite David Williams, seconder for the Conservative Group, to speak. And David, you have 15 min minutes. <clears throat> uh, 
Thank you, Colette. I want to start by saying that enormous credit is due to the lead members, Ralph Sangster and Bob Deering and the Section 151 officer, Scott Crudington, and the finance team led by Stephen Pillsworth for having their steady hands on the tiller, both in terms of overseeing the in-year performance of the authority and setting out the plans for this budget. The last 12 months have been extraordinary for this council. It has redefined the way it works, pioneered approaches where there was no precedent, worked extraordinarily effectively with public sector partners, and they've been there for our staff and our residents. In my national role, I've seen council leaders and, and notably Labour leaders slack jawed when they appreciate the bold undertakings given by our, by our council to care providers in the face of COVID last March. We told providers to supplement their workforce, continue to pay their staff for their contracted hours in full should they need to self-isolate, be symptomatic or be required to shield themselves. And for any workers on zero hours contracts to pay them for the average of their last three months hours up to a maximum of 37 hours per week. All these initiatives were underwritten by the council. This is but one of many examples of being forward looking, confident, strong and above all doing what's right. In relation to this budget process, one issue that we do need to address, however, going forward is the reluctance for the opposition budget proposals and initiatives to be aired through the IP scrutiny, but instead tabled as amendments at 6 p.m. on the evening before our debate, allowing no time for any reasonable consideration of uh, their proposals. Before considering the amendments, I must just respond to Sharon's comment on the support local government has received from central government. £8 billion of direct support has been paid to councils, including £4.6 billion not ring-fenced and £1.3 billion for social care providers. After the year we've had, I'm surprised that so few councils are facing serious financial difficulties and the handful that are, such as Croydon, Luton, Nottingham and Eastbourne, face specific local issues. So I want to touch on three issues, the senior management headcount, the management of the council's property assets and the important issue of free school meals. Against the background of outstanding performance and delivery, the Labour Group wants to reduce the senior management headcount. The very officers that the political group leaders have often been directly involved in appointing and yes, Joshua, agreeing their salaries and who have performed so, so strongly over the past 12 months. When Employment Committee recently saw comparative analysis of the number of roles paid greater than or equal to 100,000, Essex had 35, Kent with 32, uh, but Hertfordshire with 18, clearly evidence of a tightly managed cohort. The Liberal Democrat opposition are budgeting for a fire sale of land holdings seemingly oblivious of the legal framework for the disposal or change of use of playing fields and school land, the opportunity to hold and promote land holdings to contribute to and benefit from the housing and employment growth we know is coming, as well as exploiting the Chalk Dean and Hearts Living Limited delivery vehicles that are now available to us. So the opportunities already being pursued by this administration are broad and significant. From a 50-50 joint venture with a master developer to deliver over 3,000 homes and employment land at Baldock North, to planting a carbon woodland of 37,000 trees on 37 acres of Enfield Chase uh, near Potter's Bar. Paul Zakowski didn't mention the surplus site uh, that had been on the books for 25 years, but I can cite any number of examples of extra excellent use of uh, the authority's surplus sites. We have Hearts Living Limited bringing forward 14 homes on a challenging site in Watton Stone. Francis mentioned the much needed nursing home capacity and the 70 homes on the former Little First School site in South Oxy. The former Collingswood School site in Stevenage will be the location for the new Michaela Community School and a new education support centre. 
The Ariston site in St Albans is being redeveloped, the Fire HQ in Hartford, all of these examples enhancing the value of the underlying asset. An aggressive ramping up of asset sales is simply not warranted and certain to be counterproductive in terms of the value secured for Hertfordshire taxpayers. Now I want to turn to the sensitive issue of free school meals, which we discussed at our meeting of the 20th of October and the extraordinary meeting of the 17th of November. This administration is fully committed to free school meals. It is this government that has expanded the eligibility to more children than any other government in over 50 years by offering a free school meal to every child in reception, year one and year two. And most recently during the pandemic to children of families on lower incomes with no recourse to public funds. For over 100 years, free school meals have always focused on providing a hot meal during the school day as this helps children to learn. In the exceptional time when schools were closed to most students, we continue to help them with either food packages or vouchers. During school holidays over recent summers before the pandemic, in partnership with the Fire and Rescue Service and the Hertfordshire Sports Partnership, we delivered Fit, Fed and Red, an initiative developed by Street Games UK. This helped disadvantaged children with free healthy meals and enriching activities. We know from these schemes that some families do, do need extra support, especially in the long summer holiday, but not all the children on free school meals need that support. Indeed, even when free food and activities are offered, the majority of eligible children on free school meals do not take them up. We also know that the best way to support families and children is through work and the welfare system, not through providing supermarket vouchers. This ensures that support is reliably delivered to those who need it most, when they need it most, and in a way which allows family to spend it in the way that will help them best. The welfare system is set up to provide this direct support all year round in a way in which schools are not. During the COVID-19 pa pandemic, the government has provided unprecedented support for those in need and boosted the universal credit standard allowance and working tax credit by over a thousand pounds per year. The government has a fundamental commitment to supporting children in low income households and the billions of pounds dedicated to that end, particularly during the pandemic. Such support is best directed through the welfare system or through specific schemes that target those most in needs, such as the welfare assistance funding access through Hearts Help. This administration has addressed the uncertainty of the school holidays at the start of the new financial year that were not covered by the COVID winter grant scheme. We can, however, look forward to the government's commitment to provide healthy food and enriching activities to disadvantaged children covering the Easter, summer and Christmas holidays this year. Our focus remains on anti-poverty strategy as opposed to a single very expensive measure. The key issue is that it is not manageable nor feasible for a local authority to fill the gaps in the national welfare benefits system through cash transfers from our local council taxpayers, such as the 3.5 million proposed in the Liberal Democrat budget. So in conclusion, I would ask councillors to reject the Labour and Liberal Democrat budget amendments and the Liberal Democrat free school meals amendment. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I'd like, like to invite Ralph Thanks, to, to exercise his right of reply. And Ralph, you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good judgment, Madam Chairman, is being able to anticipate the consequences of actions. I would point out that it's not a, a universal attribute. Good political judgment is sometimes even more difficult to define and discern as it is subject to ideology in ideological influence and predetermination. The Conservative administration, I would contend, has shown considerable pragmatism and judgment in its management of this council's finances for many years, including through extremely difficult times over the past decade, and brought it to a place many other councils would give their eye teeth to be. 
And speaking of good politics, a political judgment, Madam Chairman, what about Brexit? Let's not forget the UK's peaceful transition to full independence on the 1st of January and the deal, which according to opposition parties, could not be done. And even more recently, ex exercising our newfound independence, Madam Chairman, we have successfully inoculated millions of our citizens against COVID, while others in Europe and around the world have struggled. And who, Madam Chairman, were the critics who opposed the government's initiative in placing early orders for vaccines? Not surprisingly, we can start with Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer, who said, you can't justify the money being spent, referring to part of the funding of Astra, in part of the funding of AstraZeneca's vaccine development programme, and continue with Liberal Democrat health spokesman Manura Wilson, who said stubborn will, unwillingness to work with the EU is unforgivable, castigating the government for not rowing in with the EU's vaccination procurement process. I think the proposition, alone, along with the Liberal Democrats' insistence that we should have joined the, European, the, Euro, the Euro, must go down as two of the worst judgment calls in my living memory. And there, are, and there were many more vis visceral condemnations by uh, opposition party spokesmen of the good judgment exercised by the government in securing the nation's salvation, once again exposing their outrageously poor political judgment. That, thank goodness, Madam Chairman, they weren't in charge. And thank goodness, Madam Chairman, opposition members in this council were not in charge when the council faced difficult choices about its financial future. Otherwise, we would certainly not be in the advantageous position we are now. And that is why, Madam Chairman, it is essential today that we dismiss once again their ill-conceived and poorly judged attempts to amend this budget and undermine this council's financial stability. Members of the council and residents of Hertfordshire, after a year in which we have lost many and sacrificed our liberty to save so many more, the residents of Hertfordshire need to have confidence in the judgment of those who take, the, who take decisions on their behalf. Because of our government's good judgment, Madam Chairman, we are poised to emerge from one of the most devastating pandemics since the 1920s. Again, because of the good judgment of our government, we face the future of an, as an independent country ready to take on the world in trade and commerce and once again benefit from our own endeavours. And because of the good judgment of this Conservative administration over many years, it has been in control. We are poised to embark on a wave of investment <clears throat> in new and existing services, which will address the priorities of the residents of, of and protect the future of the planet. Investing in sustainability, addressing climate change, inequalities, domestic abuse, safeguarding, speeding, controlling growth, highways, waste management, education, technology, low pay, the voluntary sector and public health. A renaissance, Madam Chairman, in the support we can provide for all the residents of Hertfordshire. We have an opportunity today, Madam Chairman, to set a new direction for the county for many years to come with a vision of renewal and progress. With the confidence in our country's freedom to choose its own destiny, this council, whilst remembering the sacrifices made during the past year, can look to the future with enthusiasm and optimism. One Madam minute. Chairman, with considerable enthusiasm, and unbridled optimism, I have the privilege of commending this budget to the council. Thank you. What a yeah, crocus. Yeah, yeah. What a crocus. Thank you. Now that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was dreadful. Can we have silence, please? Oh, dreadful. Silence. Thank you. Right. The debate is now um, concluded and we will move to uh, to the voting. And, an electronic recorded vote using MS Teams poll form uh, will be taken on each vote for this item of business. And I will announce the results after each vote. And just to refresh your memories, when the voting screen comes up, you'll see a white square in the middle, which will give you uh, the uh, for, against uh, or abstain. And you make your, um, you make your, uh, there we are, it should be in front of you now and you just uh, indicate which one you want to use and press submit. You only have to do it once. If you do it twice, then that will be, you know, um, that will be picked up. But if you want to change your vote, if you vote incorrectly, um, you can vote again. But wh whatever your last vote is that comes in, that is the one that will be uh, accepted. And by using the 
in fact, the screen in front of me, it's a, it's a black square, it's not a white square. Um, if, you know, by doing using that system, um, this enables the officers to provide you with the information which you want because this is a recorded vote. And it, we, it, after the end of each vote, they, we, can able, we are able then to um, uh, put on the screen the names of, of all of you and how you voted. So can I please ask you now um, to take a vote? It's on the... It's on the Labour Amendment. So this is for the Labour Amendment and you can vote for it or against it or you can abstain. You can submit your votes uh, now and I will let you know when the vote has finished. And uh, so I'll declare the results then and whether the amendment is carried or not. And Democratic Services will show the results on the screen. Colette, may I, may I point out, I've tried several times to uh, 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 to vote against. Um, uh, I've, I've closed down the chat and opened it up again, but it comes back with something went wrong. Please try again. So we've done it several times. Sorry, who's speaking? It's Ralph. Ralph Sangster. Right. Like the okay. Brexit vote. Corey didn't like your speech. Colette, I, I don't have a black square or any square. All I, all I have is your face in front of me, which is very nice. It, it's in the chat function. In the chat function. Uh... In, 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 in the middle of your screen, you should have a no, black. Collect, collect some of them. If it's, not, it's, it's in the chat function. Some just of them. a moment. Next door to the chat function. It's coming in, right in the middle of the screen above the faces is the form now. Hold on, hold on one moment. It's not not for everyone. So I'm just going exactly. to. Right. You can vote in the chat function if you are unable to access uh, the black square in the middle of your screen. Poll oh, function. Okay. Yeah. Does everybody have the chat function on? No. Ah, that might be why you've got a problem. And just remind remind everybody we're voting on the first on the on the Labour amendment and you're either for it, you're against it, or you're abstaining. Chat function. Ah. If you scroll in the chat fun move your if you haven't got the black square, if you move your mouse over to the uh, right hand side of your screen, you'll see um, the Labour is a little later. Uh, uh, table 5a labor amendment if you can't see it immediately then keep scrolling up you know move your scroll scroll bar upwards because there's something underneath it right okay i think yeah that looks like everybody's getting it now ralph um david are you okay David, I can't hear you. Can you unmute? Right, David? No, I, I haven't got it. Um, I've, more actions. Is it down in that drop down or anywhere down there? Have you got your chat function on? No, I, I can't. I don't even know where it will be. Let's have a look. Right. So it's the little square. Um, where you've got the, uh, the people, the, the, where it shows you the number of participants in the meeting, uh -huh. there's, next to it there's a little square with a couple of, of uh, lines in it. If you yeah. press on that, right. that should open the chat on, on the right hand side of your screen. And if at the moment it's showing Ralph Sangster at the bottom and if you look upwards towards the, the top right, you'll see meeting chat and then below it, and then you keep scrolling upwards, you then got the... Um, so you still can't do it, sorry. Right. No, I've just got to, um, by, by going across the participants, all I've got there is the, uh, oh, hang on, more actions again, no, it doesn't. Um, more actions, and it's just got the name of everybody. You're in the wrong one. Right. You, want to get I, chat I think you need to, to be in chat, David. You're not in chat. You're in participants. 
Uh, Madam Chair, the result is quite obvious. Do we have to waste any more time because some councillors, after almost a year, have failed to familiarise themselves with the process? What a pleasant person you are. John, um, I'm just sort of John, the same will you way please, that people spoke to me. John, will you please be quiet? It's not helpful. Right. Everyone would like to hold on a moment and I'll speak to the officers and we will be able to give you um, the, the result. And I don't uh, appreciate um, interventions of that kind. You can close the poll now, please. Okay. Colette, if I could just mention to David. David, I think you're using an iPad, aren't you? Sorry, say that again. Dave, I think you're you're on an iPad, same as me, aren't you? No, actually, I'm on I'm on um, I'm on my main uh, computer, and that's why there's a bit of a confusion here because um, at the group meeting, um, my iPad went down, and I couldn't right. do anything with it. David, we will get a council officer to to contact you to help you. If that's you'd like brilliant. To hold I'm sorry to disturb the meeting. Not at all. Have you you haven't managed to vote? But um, what I can say is that. Um, the figures so far uh, were for the Labour amendment 37%, against the Labour amendment 62%, and one abstention. Um, they, in fact, 68 people uh, voted. The officers will be able to um, show you um, the, um, the names and how they voted, and that should be in front of you now. Yeah. Quick comment, Ralph. Um, you didn't see your name there because you voted in the in the chat box on the right hand side. You didn't vote in the polling box in the middle of the screen, and that's what. So that's a really good illustration of of the point I was making earlier. If you vote in the polling square, then your name will show up um, in the um, uh, in the, the recorded vote. I'll, I'll try again next time around, but it's it's not. It's, it's, I've never had this problem before, but it's uh, it's 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 pretty consistent. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, we, we'll get there in the end for everybody. It just takes a little bit of time and patience from all of us. Nigel. Yes, I just wanted to point out that there is another button, which is the polls button, which you can press if it doesn't come up. Um, so that will take you straight there. Indeed. But if you, can't, with, if you can't, it's the one with an F on it and yeah. two strange I circles. Just, I think we just keep it simple at the moment, Nigel. Yeah. We just stick to the, to the square we can see in the chat bar, bar, which we know. But I take your point. Thank you for your help. Right. Are we now in a position to move to the to the second vote? Um, right. The next um, vote then is an is on the first. Liberal Democrat amendment and you should have in front of you in the middle of your screen the black square and then you should get in the
chat box and you need to click on the chat on that square if you if you have to use the chat box and i know that I know that Morris Bright does have to use the chat box, which is which is why he why he is doing so. It's so and much easier with the the box in the middle. Oh, it's great. <laughs> um, so we're voting on the on the Liberal Democrat First Amendment, and you can vote for, you can vote against, or you can abstain, and then you press the submit button firmly. OK, Ralph, I can see your problem. Vote in the chat box, please. And I'm making a note of the people who are voting in the chat box and the, that will be confirmed by the officers. So your vote will be recorded. David, if you can't vote any other way at the moment, then if you just tell us how you want to vote and that will be recorded too. I've actually got the uh, black box come up on my right hand side now and Hurrah. I've managed to hit against. So um, it, uh, it, it, because I probably live in a field, I, it, it just seems to take forever. This is very slow. We don't have broadband and things like that. Here. You know, I mean, the, the fibre stuff. So yeah. uh, it has come up now and I have voted, oh, I think. Thank you. And thank, uh, you, thank you for persevering. It's very difficult when you've got a slow signal. Mm -hmm. So they tell me. Right. Um, We've got 72 votes. I'm happy for you to close. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Right, I'll start off. We had um, 72 votes on the uh, in the poll box and two and two others who had to use the chat function. The results are um, for the amendment 36, against the amendment 63, one abstention and Maurice Bright voted against and Ralph Sangster voted against. So, Sorry, can Claire, I, you're using percentages, not the actual councillors. It's very confusing when you're using. I'm, I'm giving you all the information. So, no, I'm you're, give, you're, no, you, Claire, you've used the percentage. Yes, right. I know I've given you a percentage. I've also given you the number of councillors okay. who have voted so far. And as soon as um, we are able to, we are moving to putting up the recorded vote screen so that you can see the names of the councillors and the. Um, uh, and how they voted uh, you're asking what you're asking me to do is to give you the exact numbers of who voted for what i don't have that information chair, chair that's available in, in the you chat move until you move to the it's, chat it's in the chat function it's in the it's in the chat i know function. it's in the chat function i'm just moving across to there now and and the chat function bear in mind i've got a screen here with all of this and I'm listening to the officers as well, making sure that everybody is, is, uh, has the security of knowing that their votes have been recorded. So the actual numbers of, um, of those who voted are for the um, Liberal Democrat First Amendment is 26. Against the Liberal Democrat Amendment is 45. And again, abstentions one right so i think we can now move to no we can't move to the third row we've still got to put up the there are my my um black squares up masking it so i'll just move that one down right okay so, so have you finished scrolling yet yes yeah, right Right, um, that's finished being scrolled. If everybody's happy, we'll then move on to the third vote, which is the electronic vote on the second Liberal Democrat amendment. And that will be appearing before you in all of its forms, chat box and um, poll, uh, poll box. It's with you now. So can everybody start to vote now, please? And you are voting if you want to, this motion to pass, you vote for. If you're against it, you put your little dot in the against, or you can abstain. 
and press your submit. Oh, this is awful. Sorry, I've got la Labour amendments in front of me. I have a Labour amendment. <laughs> in the middle, oh. it's got Lib Dem Second Amendment in the middle of the screen. Yeah. If in chat, scroll all the way down. Yours, maybe. Right, we have 70 responses so far. Um, I can see one or two of you. Um, different victims this time <laughs> haven't got the, uh, the pole square in front of them. So, I'm happy that would be 73 votes. Yes, I'm happy for you to close the vote. And is Morris, 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 A, Ralph, is A, Tina. Right, I will have the three people who were unable to access the poll square have all voted against. We have four, 28 people have voted for the amendment, that's 30, 39%. We have 43 who voted against, which is 60%, and we have no abstentions. And we're now going to give you um, the, the scrolling recorded vote screen with your names and the um, way that you voted. Here, right, you should have that screen in front of you now. Right, has everybody had a chance to take in the contents of the scrolling uh, recorded vote? If uh, they have frank, that. Frank, frankly, no, I'm happy to accept the vote, Chairman Stephen Giles Medhurst. Happy to accept the vote, but it just scrolls too quickly. If I can be oh. sent an electronic copy subsequent to this meeting, that'll be fine, Colette. Thank you. And your, your comments noted, and we'll do it even more slowly next time, Stephen. But thank you for letting us know that. Right, uh, moving on then to um, number four, which is the, the vote on the substantive motion. So again, um, the voting the voting elements will appear before you and you'll be able to use them or not. If not, I'm sure you'll let, let me know. So we're on to 5A, which is the substantive motion, but I haven't got the... Um, I haven't got the, the black square up. Right. Right. Um, Can I 
Right. So, so if you're voting uh, um, on the, um, the the substantive motion from the Conservative group, which is the budget, you can vote for, or against, or abstain. So. Can I, can I, at the moment, yeah. the big, big black square has come up and it's now in the chat room. You're showing 20. Is that the right place for it? Yes. Right. Oh, it's coming up there now. It's coming up right. I've still got 5A Liberal Democrat Second Amendment in my screen, Colette. Yeah, me too. I, and that sort of appeared in mine. It just uh, it just turned up after the uh, vote. Hang on a moment. For, for the actual substantial um, uh, motion, it was the first vote. The substantive motion above that, you have to go up to find the substantive motion. Right. It's come up. It's come up later than the original vote. I've already voted yeah. on the right one, and then it pops up. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. Ignore the poll whole square that's in front of you at the moment which is 5a mm. liberal democrat second amendment and in fact i've just had to vote in the chat bar myself i voted in the middle it was easy and then it went away yes yes i thought yeah so i got confirmation that the substantive vote was there originally yeah it was yeah, yeah. it's still there if you scroll up <sighs> Weirdly. Yeah. Right, this would this will take a little bit longer because there are quite a few who were not able to vote in the original. So we're holding we haven't closed the vote yet, have we? No. So um we have sixty-eight responses so far and we have 68 councillors still in the meeting i believe can we just right so i've got right It's looking as though I'd be allowed to vote again. Presumably that wouldn't happen. Sorry. It says the poll is closed. Right. You're mute, Colette, and Mr. Giles Meadows' keyboard isn't. All right. That was the numbers being crunched. I thought it was an old fashioned adding machine. Anybody remember? It sounded that? like a typewriter. Whoever was doing it hadn't heard their sound off. Right. My, my sound has been off, so it wasn't me. <laughs> There's somebody already sending it to the papers. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Right. You'll probably on, find it's all on YouTube. Um, no, I'm just trying. I'm just going to check with officers exactly where we are. You give, give me a moment while we.
Sara Beth has her hand up, uh, Chair. I'm not sure that could mean she couldn't. And now we can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, one moment. I'll, I'll be with, with Sara her in a moment. Right, Sarah, you, you wanted to speak to me. Um, I did, Chairman. Um, after I don't know if anybody else heard it, but after Councillor Giles Midhurst just said that he hadn't had his mic switched on, somebody else actually made a rude remark. Now, I heard it quite clearly because I've got headphones on. Other people may not have heard it. I think I know who made it because their face lit up along the bottom of my screen, but I'm not going to go on that because I can't be absolutely certain. Um, right. But really, sh people should not be telling other people to shut up, in other words, um, to another member. And right. they should well, remember I... Handforth Parish Council and switch their mics off. Yeah, I, I, I didn't hear it, sir, but then I'm, I've been, my fo I'm focusing on, to get to, on getting this right, but thank you for raising it. Because um, we would wish to hear, have, have well, uh, politeness Chairman, at all could, time, but thank yes, you. Yes, can we have a reminder of people not to deal with others like that? I think uh, that's implied in what I've just said, Sarah. Right, we can now show you the uh, substantive motion responses uh, with names as well as you know who they who they voted for. Stephen, if this is is this pace okay for you? Yes, but it's in again a different format to what we had a minute ago because the, <laughs> the members are all over the place. But well, I think we should just be grateful for what we've yep, got at fine. the moment, no, Stephen. I'm fine. I, I can just have an electronic version sent to me subsequently. Of course. Because... Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it is in alphabetical order according to your first name. Right. Are we all satisfied with that? I didn't see my name. I must have missed it. Uh, it's Graham. Graham McAndrew. Right. I'm sure it's there, but... Uh, it's up beyond a G. Yes, yeah. you are there, Graham, and Thank you did you vote for. Yeah. Right. So that I, motion... I didn't, I didn't see my name either, Chair. Sharon Taylor. Sharon Taylor, right. I definitely did vote, and it was... It I saw you, Sharon. Oh, did you? Okay, sorry. Yeah, you're I, there, I can see you too. And you abstained. Right. Um, then I did. The that that motion then has been carried, and I would suggest that now would be a good time to have a five-minute break and cool-off period. Okay. So, Chairman, you, um, my apologies. I don't have a hands up, so I I don't mean to be rude. Just uh, okay, jumping no in. I haven't got hands up function for some reason today. Um, is it? Can I just raise a, a point of order, please, on the previous debate? Uh, Councillor Sangster was asked to apologise to the member of the public uh, for um, comparing the campaigning on 20 mile an hour zones to uh, anti-vaxxers and climate change deniers. I think 
he should apologise um, and I hope he will do so. So I've got a little problem with my screen. If you'd like to hold, please. Ralph, would you um, apologise yes, for that well, a little bit? It's mentioned a couple of times. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to review the exact statement that I made at the beginning of my response, where I think I qualified my position as being representative of data in general. However, if I haven't made it clear that I was not not uh, focused on the representation by uh, by the uh, the uh, individual who presented, whose name I haven't got at the moment available to me, I will be more than happy to uh, apologise to him. But I'd like to review the uh, uh, the film uh, version of this before doing so. That's perfectly acceptable, Ralph, and I'm sure uh, we we will we will find out in due course what course of action. Uh, you did take so that everybody's satisfied that the protocols and right. politeness have been I'll, observed. Thank I'll you. Make it to <laughs> Thank you. As long right. as that is then made public, because certainly uh, Ken Ambrose has emailed me uh, and in, in relation to the comments that has been raised by, by Stephen. Uh, Stephen, you're not putting your hand up. I know it's very difficult. Sharon didn't sorry, put a hand up. I know that you can, and the point has been made. And we, I would like to move on now. Uh, um, and have that break and then we'll get back and we'll deal with the the rest of the business um, of the meeting. OK, so I'll see you all back at um, just after quarter past three. OK, thank you.
item 5B, which is um, members allowances 2021-22, and it's a report of the independent panel on members allowances. The time limits for speeches in the debate on, on this item are as follows. Um, the mover of the motion has five minutes. The first speaker from each of the other groups or the speaker who's been nominated um, by the group leader, five minutes. All other speakers, including the mover of the motion, when exercising their right of reply, three minutes. So can I invite David Williams to move the motion? Chair, thank you. Um, very briefly, uh, I'd like to thank the independent panel for um, providing us with this report. Um, in essence, the recommendation of the panel is that members alliances, uh, allowances uh, should align with the um, outcome of the Local Government uh, National Joint Council. There is an expectation, however, given the um, expectations of the Chancellor at the time of the spending review, that there should be a pay pause in local government. Um, it's expected by the panel that there would be a 0% um, um, pay uh, allowance change uh, for members. Um, there are also then um, no changes to the uh, special responsibility allowances. There are some changes to some of the um, carers allowances. Um, but given that uh, the council has in the past accepted uh, without demur the recommendations of the independent um, panel, uh, I would hope that uh, party leaders cross party will support their recommendations to us and therefore I move the motion at 5.2 on the order paper. All right, thank you David. Can I invite Theresa Heritage to second please? Yes, formally second Madam Chairman and reserve my right to apply. Thank you. Right, so we start the debate. Can I invite Stephen Giles Medhurst, um, leader of the, for the Lib Dem lead speaker for the Liberal Democrat group to speak and you have five minutes Stephen. I thought you were about to promote me or some might say demotion there actually, Colette. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we don't disagree with the outcome in terms of what the independent panel has said. However, as David has referred to uh, the pay polls uh, in terms of local government employee, can I just say that um, as a group and indeed as a party, we do not agree that necessarily that is the right approach uh, to the people that we indeed many of us have applauded to the hard work they've put in in the last year in terms of their commitment to ensuring the services are provided for all of our residents. So in that part, in that sense, I disagree with uh, the sentiments why there is a zero increase uh, for how hard working local government employees. But as is normally the case, we will go along with whatever the independent panel has recommended. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I can I invite Judy Billings, lead speaker for the Labour Group, please. And Judy, you have five minutes also. Thank you. I won't need anything like that. Um, I would also like to thank the independent panel, who I think do their job very well um, every year and are always keen to listen and explore issues with the group leaders. And that's very helpful. I have a bit of an anathema about uh, councils spending hours and hours discussing their own allowances. Um, I always find it somewhat distasteful. I see nothing wrong with this proposal because we're not actually debating local government pay in this proposal and therefore it has my full support. Thank you. And right, are there any other speakers um, on this topic? If so, you have three minutes and that can you indicate um, in the chat bar? Sorry, can you raise your hand if you wish to speak? I see no hands raised, so can we move to the vote? We get another chance to have a, a go at this system. So you can use the uh, the electronic form in the middle of the screen um, or at the bottom of the chat bar. Uh, of course, it's not recorded. And so if you could just go ahead, select and uh, submit your vote, please. And this is item 5B, members allowances. It's in the black square in front of you now. If you're for this, or uh, or against or abstain. And please don't touch any other buttons um, um, in, during this process. You either you, you use the square box or you use the chat function. Please don't press anything else. That, so 
right. So. Right, okay. Ron, your hands up. Yeah, Colin, I'm not sure if it's another, uh, it's a technical itch. I voted. Then, then all of a sudden the 5B screen disappeared and it's come come back again blank and ready to vote again. So I just wonder if it's just a technical hitch. Yeah, same here, same here. Right, well look, you can just vote again. Okay. And submit. Right, vote, and vote again and often. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, it, but it will only register you once. Right. It's clever okay, like thanks, that. Colette. Cheers. <laughs> right. And is that the right number? Yeah. Right, we have seven, we have 72 members um, um, registered, but we've only got 68 votes, 69 votes. So we're going to close. If, uh, if they want to vote, they're going to have to vote fairly quickly because we will be closing the votes now. Right. You're mute, Claire. We've got 70 responses in total, 69 of which were in the electronic form. So in total, you have 69 in favour. Nobody voted against, and there was one abstention. Right. Right, I can announce that that has been um, carried. There were 69 voted for uh, with one abstention. So thank you for that one. Moving on then to 5A. Um, it's a bit like doing difficulty exam questions. Some are, some are easy and some are difficult, and we're now moving. Yes, yeah, 6A. Yeah, and we're now moving to questions to executive members, um, which is very easy for those who aren't uh, having to answer them. Um, but it's relatively straightforward, let's put it that way. So can I um, go on to that item? There's a limit of one hour for questions. And if, the, if we finish before the one hour and everybody's answered, then we will go round again. Each member asking a question has the maximum of one minute to ask the question and one minute for a supplementary and each member responding will have two minutes to respond and two min and two minutes for any supplementary so straight away now to the leader of the council david and the question from the lib dem group uh, colette thank you yeah so so can i have a question from the Lib liberal democrat member please uh, Yes, Madam Chair, it's myself, John Hale. Um, before I ask my question of David Williams, I just want to make one statement. Um, earlier on, before we took the last break, you mentioned the need to calm down a bit. And I think I owe you and Councillor Barnard a prodigy for letting my frustration get the better of me earlier on. So I hope you and Councillor Barnard will accept my apology. Of course, John, um, thank you. And very graciously said. Um, Councillor uh, Williams. No problem, John, thank you. That's no problem. Uh, Councillor Williams, in July 2018, in response to a written question from me, you said that the NHS and social care are inextricably linked. So it is important that extra funding for social care is secured to complement the extra funding identified for the NHS. Uh, you then went on to say that ministers were committed to publishing a social care green paper in the autumn of 2018, which will include proposals to reform social care. 
and that the then Secretary of State for Health and Social Care had also committed to reforming social care for the future so everyone in the country has dignity and security in the old age. As you know, nothing happened. In July 2019, you wrote the foreword to the CCN's five-point plan for local government, in which it was stated that the urgency of providing a solution to our social care crisis was rightly a prominent feature of the Conservative leadership campaign, with the Prime Minister committing to seeking a cross-party consensus of reform. Again, nothing has happened. The Prime Minister, shortly after you wrote that, stood on the doorsteps of Downing Street and said, my job is to protect you and your parents or grandparents from the fear of having to sell your home to pay for the cost of care. And so I am announcing now on the steps of Downing Street that we will fix the crisis in social care once and for all. And with a clear plan, we have prepared to give every older person the dignity and security they deserve. Nothing happened. John, you're out will of you time. undertake to write John, to the Prime Minister? You're out of time. You OK, will you write to the Prime Minister about this? You're out this? of time. <laughs> John, thank you. On this question. Yeah. John, thank you for your question. Yes, yeah. you know, uh, if we look back to uh, 2018, uh, there were a series of events which I'm sure even you would agree have um, mm. uh, made the national political situation quite difficult. Firstly, there was Brexit. Then there was the general election in December eight, uh, December 19. And yes, the commitment from the prime minister. But of course, by February 2020, we were deeply uh, embroiled in uh, COVID. So what has happened since? Um, I'm very pleased to say that working with um, uh, Newton Europe, CCN has delivered another very uh, groundbreaking report, which was published the week before last. The day after that, the NHS white paper was uh, published. And candidly, between you and, I, you and I, I believe that is an important foundation stone for the integration of health and social care. So I see that as being a key step on the journey now towards the government producing its proposals uh, for integrating health and social care. Thanks, David. Um, you have a supplementary? Yeah, as, as I said earlier, the Prime Minister did say he had prepared a plan. We've heard this before. Will he commit to carrying on with the work he's doing and get the government to deliver on the commitment they have made to provide a green or a white paper? John, I'm absolutely, completely confident that later this year, the government will produce that white paper uh, following on from the health service white paper, which we should in Hertfordshire really welcome because it's all about place. It's all about population health. Some of the conversations that we had earlier this uh, uh, this morning were about that very issue about uh, making sure that our population health uh, was um, looked after and supported in the best possible way. So I'm very confident that we will see the um, uh, reforms that you're looking for and so confident that I don't feel the need uh, at this stage to be writing to the Prime Minister about it. But I will raise it once again when I have my next conversation with the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Right, thank you. Is there a question from a Labour member? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Chair. Nigel. Nigel. Uh, can I ask uh, the Leader of the Council, uh, I'm sure he uh, will understand that there's many of us across party who do still have concerns about the operation and the process of the uh, county elections and other elections on the day, on the 6th of May. Has he... Um, had any more talks or with the uh, central government about how this is going to these are going to operate because there are lots of concerns especially about for example whether schools can be used there are areas uh, i know even my own division but areas where schools are the only um voting sites at the moment so there are a great deal of uh, issues about that and and obviously the the other sites so can you just tell us what, whether you've had other, any other information so, John, uh, I'd refer you in first and foremost to the delivery plan, the election delivery plan, nice. which has been published by the Cabinet Office. Yeah. And that makes very clear um, how um, uh, candidates and activists should go about um, uh, canvassing ahead of the election and the constraints in relation to that. The delivery plan has also given some certainty to the returning officers across Hertfordshire who are working hard to ensure that safe and secure elections in accordance with the delivery plan uh, can be delivered. And the last time I discussed it with our chief legal officer, um, I understand that they were making very good progress. 
Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. And obviously, one would hope that, uh, you know, if, if you hear any more information and can take it up, you will obviously let group leaders and the rest of us know because, and I know that clearly the, the, the administration of the elections obviously is up to the 10 districts and districts, but obviously this is a concern that we all have. And I know many residents have a, a question about safety and safety of voting. So um, thank you for that. Okay. And Paul Mason, you have your hand up. Question from the uh, Conservatives. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask the Leader of the Council whether whether he has concerns about the delivery of a safe set, set of elections on the 6th of May. Well, I think first and foremost, Paul, uh, it's going to be a complex set of elections, uh, including the PCC elections and some district and borough elections which were held over from last year. And then we've got the issue of uh, the challenges that the returning officers will face, uh, as I've uh, mentioned um, to Nigel. I think it is important to recognise that within the delivery plan, there have been changes or that there's provision for changes to the nomination requirements um, and uh, some additional funding has been made available to uh, for returning officers. Importantly, however, the um, delivery plan did set out that many forms of campaigning could be carried out without increased face-to-face -face contact, including online campaigning, campaigning by telephone, delivery of leaflets by post or other commercial delivery services who are already operating, but specifically highlighted that uh, activists should not be leafleting door-to-door -door and knocking, um, uh, going street-to-street -street in order to deliver their leaflets at this time. One minute. Right, OK. Do you have a supplementary, Paul? Uh, yes, please. Go on. Um, thank you for that, David. Um, do you have any specific concerns about the behaviour of candidates or activists? Uh, I'm afraid I do, uh, Paul. I did raise with Stephen Giles Medhurst, uh, the leader of the Liberal Democrat group, concerns about house-to-house -house delivery in Watford. Uh, by someone who was assumed to be an activist, but I was assured that that was not the case. But I have to report that from Hemel to Berkhampstead to Royston, it's clear Liberal Democrats are ignoring the lockdown stay at home rules and the election delivery plan published by the Cabinet Office on the 5th of February. Indeed, I have, I have to say that such is the arrogance and disregard for the rules that the deputy leader of the Liberal Democrat group, Paul Sikowski, was photographed last week by outraged residents in Hatfield, rucksack on his back, delivering his election communications house to house. Now, the government has announced that it will amend the regulations to enable a broader range of campaign related activity from the 8th of March. But it is essential that this still takes place in a COVID secure way, in line with the guidance and the law. But One until minute. then, Let's all be absolutely clear, the government's stay at home requirements remain. So in the meantime, I will be drawing Paul Zakowski's actions and disregard for the lockdown rules to the attention of the police and the local monitoring officers. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Right, moving on then to public health and prevention. Um, do I have a question from a Liberal Democrat member? Yes, that'll be me. <laughs> um, Hi, Tim. Um, good to see you. How's your shoulder? Pretty good. You got a supplementary? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, you've beaten through that one, didn't you? Right, so um, I'm sure you follow these things as closely as I do. Um, Independent Sage has been broadly welcoming of the more cautious uh, approach from the government in the last few days, um, but has questioned the continued lack of a uh, strategy to suppress the virus, um, aside from the vaccination programme, which on its own is probably not sufficient. Um, have you seen their five pillar plan, which they published at the end of last week? Um, and would you support their views? Well, I, I have seen their plan, yes. Um, I, but I do think that um, the government's plan has got broad support of SAGE. I don't quite interpret it the way that you see it. Sorry, the independent SAGE, Tim, not SAGE. Uh, in that case, no, I haven't seen that. Uh, there are a number of groups around. SAGE is, is formed by a great many scientists and uh, 
that's the, the, the group the government's taking guidance from and I have confidence in their guidance. Thank you. Well, I, I, I would recommend you do look at it. Um, I, I mean, Independent Sage, as you probably know, was set up by Professor King in Cambridge um, in response to the, shall we say, somewhat lack of transparency about who was actually part of Sage uh, this time last year or just after this time last year. Um, Stephen Riker has written in today's Independent and um, also published a, a strategy for the suppression of the virus, which was published on Friday. I'll send you a copy. Um, a couple of the key things in there, which I, I think we is could there a question possibly. In this, Nigel? Yeah, I'm just leading up to that, Colette. Sorry. Um, <laughs> is just to see there are a couple of things in there which I think we could be doing more on in in um, in Hertfordshire, irrespective of the government's proposal. So I'll take it offline with Tim. Because uh, I don't expect you to respond because you haven't seen it, um, but I, I will send you that and see if we, if we can work together on what we can do uh, to improve matters um, on the community support mostly, uh, but also on um, uh, making places more COVID secure and um, Your time's up. crediting that. Your time is up, Thank you, Nigel. Claire. That was all. Can, can I assume there was a question in there somewhere? <laughs> well, it's uh, uh, the end not quite sure, but. Uh, I'll take the moment on. has passed. Right, moving on. Labour member, I think Lynn Chesterman, you've indicated you have a question. Thank you, Chair. Tim, um, I'd like to start by just congratulating all the staff for their magnificent efforts mm -hmm. over the last year. And I'd be grateful if you could take that back from both myself and from the Labour Party and I'm sure okay. everyone else. Um, for the first time during this appalling year, I believe the public have realised how much public health impacts on all our lives. I see that the integrated plan has finally recommended that all departments should include a public health assessment on their reports. I've asked for an update on this from yourself and your predecessor. So can you please set out a timeline as to when and how this will happen and whether there's been any reticence from other departments? Well, we've only just gone through the IP process. Um, as you know, I've been asking for something like this for, ever since I've been in post. So I welcome the recommendation. Um, and we will be taking it forward. Uh, I can't tell you precisely when that will happen. Do you have a supplementary, Lynn? Yes, please. Um, alongside that, when we've discussed it before, we've also recommended that this should be rolled out to local borough and district councils for their reports as well. How do you intend to persuade the districts to undertake this? Thank you. Well, I mean, we've we have a hit good history of working with our district colleagues, um, and and to some extent that that has been enhanced though throughout the pandemic. Um, in terms of developing strategies beyond the pandemic, I, I have to confess that in the last year, obviously the pandemic's got in the way, um, but certainly I, I think we need to resume those conversations and, and talk to them. One of the steps we did take and had already agreed, for example, on planning, uh, it seems to me important that in major planning decisions, uh, health becomes a, a public health becomes a factor and, and we, we've assumed that responsibility and have already started making plans to, to comment on major planning applications around the county. So I, I think there's some progress and there's, there's still, certainly some distance to travel, um, but I, but I, I, I I, I certainly have a sympathy with the sentiment you're expressing. Thank you. And we have a question from Conservatives, Lynn, Leslie Greensmith. Ah, I've got a question for Tim. Uh, last month there was an initiative to carry out surge testing in the EN10 area, which is largely in Broxbourne, but also covers small parts of East Hearts and Essex. Can you tell the council how this went, please? Yeah, I'd be delighted. I mean, it went remarkably well. Um, as you know, we were, were tasked at very, very short notice by the Department of Health to do surge testing after a case uh, of uh, the South African variant, just a single case of the South African variant had been identified in EN10. And I have to say our officers, our volunteers, guys from the fire service, uh, people from Propsbourne Borough Council, um, really got on top of this very quickly. And the results, I think, were absolutely staggering. When you think that 
in in Leicester, for example, they did surge testing and they, they got to about 30% of the population. Um, within a very short period of time, um, we'd issued uh, nearly 14,000 tests, um, of which over 10,500 were returned, which I think is absolutely remarkable, an absolute testament to the, the, the work and dedication of our officers. Of those tests, 462 came back as being positive. One minute. And I'm pleased to say that none of the 462 thus far, because they need to go on for further analysis, um, have come back with any sign of the South African variant. So a hugely successful operation. Um, and I thank the officers, but I also need to thank the public and Brock because actually without their cooperation, there's no way we can achieve these fantastic figures. Mm, that's fantastic. Um, much has been said about the success of the vaccine program. Is there anything you'd like to say from the Hertfordshire perspective on it, please? Yeah, I mean, again, another great success. Um, we, we, we know as we started with principal centres in Robinson House and, and elsewhere in the county. In fact, there's, there's several uh, locations throughout the county, GP surgeries, church halls, a nightclub, and all sorts of places where it's been the the vaccines being administered and um, now on to the, the over 60s, which which I'm delighted about because I had mine last week at, at Robertson House and I have to say it all went very smoothly. Um, so we're there, we're there on target and uh, obviously, you know, I think this is the way out of the pandemic. I think I, to some extent, R Rolf stole my thunder a little bit on this one. I do have to mention the fact that uh, both senior Labour and Liberal Democrats politicians had urged the government to follow the, the EU um, delivery vehicle um, and all I can say to that is thank God we didn't because mm -hmm. I think I know no idea where we would be now if we'd done so um, and on that I just also as a side really I think it's a criticism One minute. of the government and uh, so-called lack of action um, again you know They've invested £611 million in Hertfordshire, either in direct grants or, or relief from business rates throughout the pandemic. So I, I think some of the criticism of our government has been totally unjustified. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving then on to questions to the executive member for resources and performance. Do we have a question from a Liberal Democrat member? That would be myself, oh. uh, Alex, sorry. I'm trying to find the hands up signal. I think I've lost it on my yeah. screen. Apologies. It's OK, don't worry. Off you go. Uh, Ralph, are you aware of a recent change to the petition signing system on the County Council's website, which now requires you to log in and register before you can sign a petition, which is actually more onerous than signing a petition in terms of the House of Commons and parliamentary petitions? And a number of complaints have now been raised. Basically, the county council seem to be discouraging people to sign in e-petitions. And if you are aware of this, can you explain which cabinet panel this matter and change in procedure was discussed at? Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, <clears throat> would have been it would have been helpful to have heard that uh, question ahead of time because no, I'm not aware of any changes that have taken <clears throat> place on the website uh, uh, and uh, I'm un 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 unfortunately I can't answer your question but what I will do is ask officers to provide you with a written response uh, uh, in due course. Do you have a su supplementary Stephen? Yes, yeah. I, I, my only apology for not answering it, asking you and giving you information in advance is that actually um, one of my colleagues who's had to leave the meeting was only really made aware of this by a, a number of civic societies in St Albans very recently and therefore raised it at a meeting uh, this morning with me, and he would have been asking the question. But if we could have a written answer as to who made the decision to change the procedure and why it's been done and why it is more onerous, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I, I, th I think that's a reasonable question, and I'm sure <laughs> officers will provide that information in due course. Thank you. Right, do we have a question from a Labour member? Yes, that... Oh. Is it Sharon? Yes, that would be me, sorry. Um, yeah couldn't turn my camera on. Um, my question is around the inequalities budget that you announced uh, as part of the IP 
uh, Councillor Sangster. And when you referred to the money uh, included in the IP for inequality, you gave what I'm sure if one of us had given it was an enormous shopping list of areas that uh, may need tackling uh, with that budget. Um, my question to you is um, how will uh, the uh, the use of that budget be determined uh, with the staggering inequalities COVID has uh, revealed in hearts. How are you going to prioritise the spending for that inequalities budget? Thanks, Sharon, for the question. Uh, yes, it was a, it was a late uh, decision as a consequence of the availability of funds, uh, which came about uh, as a consequence of the change in the collection fund balances, which I think I referred to in yesterday's cabinet meeting. Um, therefore, we haven't drawn up a list of, uh, of proposals at the moment. Uh, we have aspirations and the list of, uh, of those items which I, I put into my uh, uh, speech today gives a broad brush approach to with the areas that we're considering. I know that the, uh, the issue was raised at SMB uh, for uh, the, directors, the directors of, of various service departments. Uh, and they are now looking at the areas of uh, concern that they mostly have, and they will bring it back through the necessary processes of, uh, uh, of discussion with the administration. And then subsequently, when we have decisions on the trajectory that we would like to take, bringing it back through uh, uh, service panels. So um, that's, that's, as I understand it, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the decision-making process will be taken. You have a supplementary, Sharon. Yes, I, I do. It's a supplementary suggestion rather than a question. You've seen uh, what you described as some unreasonable demands from the opposition, but they are genuine uh, concerns that we have about the welfare of um, of some of the communities uh, in our county. I hope perhaps, Councillor Sankster, when you're looking at the spend from that budget, you might consider some of the issues that have been put before you this morning. They're very important. And Councillor Durr is saying that uh, there were enough uh, laptops in schools. That's not the uh, that's not the reports I'm getting back from head teachers in my county division, where I've had to fund a number of laptops through my locality budget. So there are all sorts of issues. And I hope you'll look at some of the proposals in the opposition budgets and consider some of them for funding. Thank you. I don't think I need to answer the uh, the the uh, the statement rather than uh, uh, approach the question. I think there was a little question in there, but uh... I think I think the the issue is that if if we have uh, propos proposals in the in the opposition's budget which replicate our uh, initial concerns around this is your uh, answer. Yes, this is the answer around the uh, uh, around the uh, proposal. Uh, then I'm sure they will be taken to, taken into consideration. Thank you. Right, we have a uh, question Chairman, from Adam Mitchell for the Conservatives. Chairman, if I may, on a point of order. No. Oh, uh, sorry. Point of order then. Uh, on a point of order, um, uh, Councillor Taylor said that I made an assertion. I made a statement as to how many there were. I did not make an assertion. My, my, apologies, my apologies, Chairman. I thought Councillor Duris said that that had met the need in Hertfordshire. It clearly hasn't. But my apologies uh, if I misunderstood what he said. Right. Thank you, everybody. Right. Adam Mitchell, your question, please, Adam. Thank you. My question is about the pension scheme, and, it, and it's this. How resilient has the funding level of the Hertfordshire pension scheme been during the, co the period of high volatility caused by the COVID epi epidemic? Thanks, Adam. I'm sure this is a question that most of the members of the pension fund, both uh, existing and future uh, uh, recipients of, of pensions, will be keen to understand. Since 2010, when the uh, the value of the assets in the fund uh, was at a particularly low level, 74%, I think, of the uh, liabilities uh, going forward, um, good judgment has been been uh, uh, the, the policy in the in the uh, uh, in the pensions committee's decision making, and at last year's valuation, uh, the value of the assets uh, uh, in relation to the lo the long term liabilities of the fund were uh, had risen to 96 uh, percent of those uh, liabilities, um, and I think at the next meeting, the the council meeting, uh, sorry, the committee meeting coming up next week. There is going to be a report which shows that the level of, uh, of funds in the in the uh, in the fund has now reached 105 percent of its of One its minute. liabilities, uh, and that means that there are 300 million pounds more assets in the in the fund uh, than there are long-term liabilities. So 
I think that's an exceptional position to be in, uh, and I'm uh, very pleased that uh, that that report will come and support the decision making that's been taking place on a bypasses and basis from the Pensions Committee. Thank you. Adam, have you got a supplementary? Yes, I have. What steps have or will be taken to ensure that our currently well-funded scheme remains so into the future? Uh, another good question, uh, and I think the, uh, the answer to that is that over the last three or four months, uh, if not longer, we have been looking at the, uh, the profile of our investments, uh, and we are, have been seeking to protect the, uh, the benefits that have been accrued during the, uh, during the period of, uh, since uh, 2010. Um, our, uh, uh, the volatility of the, uh, of the var various investments have been looked at, and we are looking to Im impose constraints over those volatilities such that the, uh, the downside risks will be minimized and uh, provide us with upside uh, uh, additional uh, re uh, um, uh, uh, improvement. Uh, and I'm hopeful that over the uh, over the medium term, we'll be able to secure those uh, those uh, advanced uh, um, uh, uh, profits that we've uh, managed to establish without them being uh, subject to further uh, volatility in the markets. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Richard Smith, could you turn your camera off, please? Thank you. Um, right, we move on to questions for the executive member for children, young people. And families, do we have a question from a Liberal Democrat member? Yes, Ron. Yes, please, Kelly. Uh, Richard, uh, given the prime, uh, given the announcement by the government last Friday about new arrangements for visiting care homes from the 8th of March, would, the, would you confirm that this council will fully support care homes and ensure, ensure that though they are provided with the necessary support on costs and staffing, given that they are still under crisis at the moment. Uh, thank you for your question, Ron. Uh, just to clarify, uh, this isn't Theresa Heritage and it's not uh, children's question time, uh, but Colette, I, we, we understand where we are, no worries. Uh, Ron, your, that is the most important question. Funnily enough, I wrote uh, 10 days ago to Chris Badger saying the most important thing we've got to do is sort out visiting uh, for relatives in care homes. Um, I'm delighted by the announcement that by the 8th of March uh, that we will be able to have um, uh, visiting with contact, uh, proper contact, the first time uh, for a long, long time, really since last summer. Um, at uh, the instigation of a lady called Monica Mason from the Alzheimer's Society who wrote to me, uh, I asked for a meeting of the significant, um, well, let's just say here they are, the Alzheimer's Society uh, Age UK, Carers in Hearts, uh, myself, Chris Badger, Tom Hennessy. We have gathered with John Amos, um, who has been an advocate in terms of an expert user, in terms of his wife is in uh, a care home with Alzheimer's. Uh, we have sat down now three or four times to work out how we can best support visiting with care homes. And action has already been taken uh, by our officers. Uh, with uh, HCPA, thank you, with the HCPA, uh, the Harvard Care Provider Association, to make sure that care homes are prepared by March and as prepared as fully as possible to ensure we've got the best possible visiting in place uh, from that time onwards. Um, there's a lot of lonely people out there and this is one way we can uh, we can help resolve that. Thank you for your question, Ron. Uh, and now supplementary, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I just wondered how has there been any thought on how we're going to cope, cope with the staffing shortages? Do you have a specific area of concern? Uh, in Ron? care homes, generally, I'm going by statistics which show that uh, we're we're uh, across the country we're several several tens of thousands of staff short, as are the NHS and. This this demand, uh, this new system could actually require additional staffing, and I just wondered how that's going to be provided. There's, I suppose there's two aspects to this. One is, uh, do care home providers have sufficient wherewithal to be able to support the staff and the residents that they have got uh, during a time of increased expenditure for them? And the answer is yes, because we, as David Williams has alluded to in his opening remarks, uh, and, and closing remarks, sorry, closing remarks actually on the budget debate. We set out early in March of last year how we were going to support care providers for virtually anything that they needed. And that has worked well up to now. And that includes supporting care homes 
and extra staffing that they've needed. Uh, staffing per se, apart from last month when it was really, really critical in care homes because so many were uh, isolated or had COVID. I mean, we had nearly 800 care workers uh, with COVID or isolated at one point in January. Thank you. But actually, uh, staffing, I hope, as a result of the uh, increases in precept last year, increases in the uplift for wages for care workers across Hertfordshire, I hope that we will tackle some of those uh, recruitment and retention issues, that, which is why we've got uh, shortages across the country. I think we will uh, improve that situation significantly in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, now, Drita Gordon uh, for the Labour Group, your question. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Richard, a recent study that's um, been carried out by MENCAP has highlighted that adults with learning disabilities are more likely to contract COVID and also more likely to suffer seriously from the effects of COVID. Um, I wonder if you as the Cabinet member could use your good offices um, to uh, lean on government to prioritise those groups of adults with learning disabilities who've not yet been vaccinated. I think government has already done that uh, and did that last week. I shouldn't really say this as it's a public is it's in the very much in the public realm. But in the background, we were encouraging with health colleagues at a senior level to ensure that those with learning disabilities, wherever possible, wherever they were living, not just in homes, but in supported living or even with carers at home uh, with family, uh, that they received the vaccinations for the very reasons that you've just put uh, said, uh, because a number of our uh, those with learning disabilities often often have health implications as well, or, or complications of them have health complications, uh, and, and those make them more vulnerable to COVID. So that, in a sense, uh, has and is being achieved. Um, I have asked my my. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Drida, I think we've done 60 to 70 percent of all those with learning disabilities have been vaccinated and we'll work really hard to make sure they're done as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, supplementary? Uh, no supplementary, just very pleased to hear that uh, fr from our cabinet member. Thank you, Richard. I think, can I just, uh, I'll just respond around uh, those with learning disabilities. Um, you, will, you will know, uh, you probably won't know, but uh, we have some funding that will come in our direction as a result of those who will be, uh, clinically, uh, clinically vulnerable. We have another 25, 30,000 who will be shielded. They bring £14 each. We will probably invest that money with those that are shielded with LD to give them mental health support, which they will need uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Right. Uh, Jonathan Kay, question from the Conservative Group. Um, you're, mute, you're, uh, muted. you're muted. Indeed, I apologise. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Uh, Richard, I'm sure you'll agree with me that voluntary organisations have been amazingly effective during this COVID crisis. I know that many councils are strapped for cash because of the pandemic, but is there any way that these voluntary groups that have done such a good work over the past year can be supported perhaps even more by Hertfordshire County Council going forward? I, th I think it's essential, to be honest, Jonathan. Um, one thing that became clear very early on in the pandemic was that our, our volunteer sector, uh, sorry, our, our voluntary sector was fleet of foot, effective, quite efficient, got problems sorted and worked well with us and other partners. Um, and, and very early on, I and officers worked uh, ever closer with the voluntary sector in a whole range of, uh, uh, of situations uh, to encourage them to keep doing what they were doing well. Um, you'll be aware the number of volunteers came forward, but those volunteers were found roles with the voluntary sector. So those six or 7,000 volunteers who found meaningful roles, they were found them with the voluntary sector. So in the budget, I have asked that we put nearly two million pounds extra 
to go with the voluntary sector to both strengthen their organization, uh, strengthen processes which will allow them to communicate better, share data more effectively, learn together better, but also just to put more money out there to enable COVID recovery work to take place and to do so uh, as, as effectively as possible. Right, thank you. Another supplementary? Yeah, uh, before lockdown, I went out with the Meals on Wheels people, which of course is organised by Hills. And, and what came out of that for me was, was that uh, for many of the residents that receive that service, um, it, it's the perhaps the only person, the only human being they see during the course of that week. Uh, during lockdown, it must have been even more so. So I'm really pleased that whereas some councils perhaps didn't deliver meals on wheels during lockdown, uh, we did continue in a COVID secure way. Uh, and I think that's really, really important for that contact that the resident has. How many meals have we been delivering to residents in Hertfordshire during the course of the pandemic? So if I take just one, one step back from that, uh, that the we tendered for a contract for Meals on Wheels uh, year before last, uh, sorry, last year. Um, and uh, uh, Hills will deliver approximately half a million uh, meals, hot meals, to about 15,000 uh, of our older residents uh, and, and some of those with other vulnerabilities. In fact, I'm not entirely certain that anybody can't ring up Hills and, and ask for a meal, but I, I, I don't, don't, Jonathan, just, just hold the telephone. Um, and during, during the pandemic, the number of requests for Meals on Wheels uh, has, or hot meals, has increased by about 100 per day. Um, equally, there are um, morning, uh, uh, so breakfast and tea packs, and those run to, I did write the figure down here, uh, some 100,000 uh, uh, breakfast and tea packs. Now that is worth um, that we support Hills to the tune minute. of about, we support that organization to the tune of about a million pounds a year, because not only do they, uh, is this a great way of providing that contact care, if you like, guaranteed a nutritious hot meal, uh, and it's always safe as well. I've been out as well, and the guys check the temperature and make sure it's a really good meal, um, but also, uh, there's good nutrition in there, there's therapy in there, there's sports exercise in there, and it's thinking about how we can maintain contact with people all the time. It's a great organisation. But there's another 80 of those organisations that we support through the wellbeing unit. Um, and Carers in Hearts, for example, about a million pounds, and some other big, uh, big hitters, but smaller ones as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Apologies for earlier on. I'm uh, just having a, a blip. And now we really are going to ask have questions asked of the executive member uh, for children and the young people, Theresa. Uh, so, do we have a, a Liberal Democrat question? Uh, so, do we have a, a Liberal Democrat question? Um, yes, Madam Chair, Anthony Rowlands, um, taking over from Mark, who's had to leave the meeting. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm just starting to ask a question um, that arises is from the COVID winter grant scheme re report that went to the recent joint meeting and it included a very helpful appendix which told us a little about the holiday activities program which I think has the potential to be very useful to a lot of young people in the county and I'm just wondering if Theresa is able to tell council a little more about any of the preparations and progress that has been made um, given that the first um, series of activities will be at Easter. Yeah, thank you for that, Anthony. Yeah, quite happy to talk about what we call the HAPPY programme, capital H-A-P and a small P-Y, Hertfordshire Activity Programme, HAPPY. Um, so we've under we have entered into contracts with um, Hertfordshire Sports Partnership and Hertfordshire Community Foundation um, to deliver the programme for us, um, Hertfordshire Sports Partnership being the main delivery body. Um, they are... Um, seeking and working with us to find, uh, I say bodies, either um, district borough councils, community groups, you name it, to deliver a programme for us over the Easter holiday. Um, given where we are with COVID, we believe that most of our uh, provision at Easter will be um, virtual, um, but again, with the rules changing, that could change a bit. 
And um, but anything that takes place for those young people with SEND will have to be face to face. So again, we're looking at the virtual angle. Um, One we're minute. Looking to, we're looking to deliver um, um, virtually uh, sort of like holiday activity packs. And for some young people, there will be um, like food programs where they get packs of food and they're taught how to make meals. Um, each family, um, each family will receive um, a free school meal voucher in line with the county uh, paying for having undertaken to pay for free school meals for Easter. The, there will be another note coming out, but I hope that's uh, sufficient for now. Supplementary. Um, yes, I'm grateful for that answer, and I uh, maybe uh, I would hope that Theresa will be able to take advantage. I think there is another children's panel in March, maybe to, to further update the panel yeah. members as to where preparations are reached. But I'm grateful for the answer. OK, no. thank you. Can I just say, Colette, in sort of response, um, we are helping to get we're trying to get together um, a newsletter which will come out to members. So that should come out shortly. Um, so that will give a lot, lot more information. Thank you. Um, question from a Labour member. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, can I just ask the uh, portfolio holder, uh, Theresa, about um, obviously county lines, especially obviously knife crime. There's still great concern amongst many uh, parents and families in the county about uh, youth and especially youth gang crime and, and, and knife crime. And I just wondered if the uh, if uh, the portfolio holder and deputy leader can give uh, you know a view on what we can do about this or the, the latest plans they've got on this okay so um didn't get the opportunity to say earlier on but we are we do work in partnership with the police and the police commissioner are on county lines as i hope you will realize um there's currently in development a new violent strategy which covers for the county which will cover uh, youth and county lines so uh that's in development so i don't know what's in that but that is being developed um there is, um, through our, our, our SASH team, um, there is some close working with those young people on the ground, as it were, who um, are um, potentially at risk from um, crim uh, children sexual exploitation and, and the gangs, as it were. So there is a lot of work going on um, behind the scenes. I'm not quite sure um, how I can help you more at this moment in time. Is there something specific, Nigel? Um, OK, right. thanks for that. No, it was just basically that we've had, you know, obviously, and leading up to the budget, obviously, we proposed there should be more money spent on this. Yeah. But obviously, if coming up to the next children's services panel, if we can have maybe an update on where we are with that and especially there's obviously concern about coming across county lines and obviously the the link from london into our obviously our county and maybe we can have a report on that yeah can do thank you. No problem. Thank, you. thank you thank you and uh fiona hill for the conservative member group what action is being taken by this council to ensure access to mental health assessment diagnosis and treatment for young people OK, thanks for that, Fiona. Uh, a very important question that everybody's been mentioning to do today, um, the emotional well-being and mental well-being of young people. Um, as you will all know, um, that the services for emotional and mental health um, is provided for a, by a partnership across the county council. That's Children's Services, Public Health, uh, NHS, CCG, schools. So it's, it's a, a, a complete uh, delivery package. Um, but with 90% of the funding provided by the NHS. Um, we've got an emotional wellbeing board that monitors uh, this, um, the spending of this money. Um, in particular, I'll just pull out, there's quite a lot that's going on, and I know there's a report coming shortly to my panel, just pulling out a few things. So with YC Hearts, they um, are running various projects in about five districts to build resilience. That's for 13 to 17 year olds. Um, there's a project called Support You, which is part of the em Empathy Project, which is a 10 week programme for 13 to 17 year olds. There's regular support given to schools and GPs. You've all heard about Couth. You've all heard about Just Talk. The crisis support line is available 24 um, seven. And I'm told that um, the, um, the appointment system is 
running normally now. Um, so the normal uh, waiting times. So for the first appointment assessment is 28 days and then treatment will start in within 18 weeks. So that's the national um, delivery mechanism. But as I said, there's a report coming very shortly to children's services. Right. Supplementary, Fiona. Thank you. What particular measures are being taken in response to the added complications of COVID-19, taking into account whether there is sufficient capacity for increased referrals as large numbers of children return to school with accumulated mental health issues from lockdown? Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, obviously everybody recognises that children will coming uh, coming back to school will have problems, but um, as children go back on the 8th of March, we do know from evidence that their mental health will improve, uh, but the schools are mindful that they mustn't put pressure on children when they get back, basically. Spoken to some heads and they said, just let us have a bit of fun for a while. And I and I quite work, I, I believe that too. Um, the service around, um, there's a, um, a service for young people is via telephone support and online platforms. So the telephone service has been built up. Um, we're also looking for feedback from children and young people um, around our decision making. So over the COVID period, there's been a couple um, health and wellbeing service, one covered out by public health, one covered, carried out by children, young children, uh, YC Hearts. So we're listening to what they've got to say to us. Um, an all age bereavement support program has been set um, increased um, and uh, I know that during COVID turning to school uh, document was created by various um, educational psychologists for use at schools. So again, there's lots of things that are going on. Um, and again, hopefully that will come out in the report that we're bringing forward shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Right. Moving on then to questions. To the executive member for education, libraries and localism. Um, do we, oh, sorry, wrong. Co sorry, community safe, safety and waste management. Uh, do we have a question from a Liberal Democrat member for Terry Hone? John uh, Hale. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, myself. Um, afternoon, Terry. Um, earlier in this meeting, you've been praising the work done by the Fire and Rescue Service quite rightly over the last year. And I wondered if you'd like to make some comments on the recent HMICFRS report on the service. Yeah, particularly on what the, uh, that report which covered all the Fire and Rescue Services throughout the country, and uh, in doing so, it included, of course, us as well. It found that, generally speaking, the inspector that our fire service adapted and responded to the pandemic very effectively. Uh, they noted that uh, we managed to maintain our statutory uh, functions on prevention, protection and response. In addition, uh, the fire rescue service in general uh, and our chief fire officer, Daryl Keane, in particular, played a leading role in coordinating the county-wide response, both within the county council and across the local Re resilient forum, which he chaired. Uh, we used the whole time firefighters, they noticed that, predominantly to respond to emergencies with uh, while the increased availability of our own uh, on court workforce was able to uh, give extra support especially to our local ambulance trusts so we used our on court workforce who were perhaps fur furloughed uh, to do that a fire and rescue service cannot uh, carry out some additional activities as well one minute they noticed that we were driving ambulances we were assessing vulnerable people we're delivering food medicines uh, visiting residents uh, were shaking, uh, etc. This meant the communities in Hertfordshire were being supported very well. So it was very, the uh, inspector was very complimentary about what we we're doing, how we were doing it. There are some learnings. Yes, we picked up a couple of learnings on this, which we will take forward in the future. You have a supplementary, John. Yeah, I wondered if the executive member agreed with the finding in paragraph eight of the report that the service benefited from being part of the county council structure. And the events of last year have demonstrated that having the fire and rescue service as part of the county council is the right solution for Hertfordshire. Yes, certainly. Um, we, the inspector said that uh, we managed, because we were part of the county council, we could be seen to be a partner and therefore supply services and get services to and from. This was particularly important around IT, where we could get support from uh, HCC and therefore the big game for that. The other thing was on the financial side. There's no specific funds came forward for the fire and rescue service as a result of the COVID packages coming out in government, specifically the fire and rescue service. 
it all came into county and therefore any funds that were made available to county as and when we needed them for things like PPE, which we managed to cover because heavy PPE, then uh, we uh, we were seen to be better off being part of the county because of the support we could give them, they could give us. Thank you. Um, question from um, Margaret Eames Person for the Labour Group. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Terry. Um, I know that firefighters have been stepping up to take the place of paramedics uh, in driving and staffing ambulances, but they are frontline workers in their own right. What I would like to ask is, can they be placed for priority for vaccination at the moment to, pr to protect them? Thank you for that, Sir Mark. First of all, let me say that they are not replacing uh, ambulance drivers per, per se, and they are not replacing uh, those uh, medical people on the ambulances. They were really driving ambulances to free up ambulance driving amb and not on emergency services either. They were normal, normal ambulance driving so that they could free up uh, other uh, ambulance drivers to be available for other things. So that's one thing there. And so the question was around vaccination for them. Rest assured, when those and we take firefighters working in ambulances. When they came off that ship, they, we made sure they were treated exactly the same as if they were, were an ambulance driver of any sort in terms of testing, in terms of tracing, and in terms of uh, regular PPE inspections and supplying with PPE. As far as vaccination is concerned, yes, I think that they are not as vulnerable as many other groups. And we could all go through the list and say, perhaps teachers should be there. Uh, but uh, firefighters, yes, of course they do go into circumstances, and you might get four of them sitting on a, on a truck taking you there. So they are carrying PPE to protect them from that. And I think we're doing certainly, as far as the uh, Daryl is concerned, we are doing all we can to protect our firefighters in these circumstances. And do you have a supplementary, Margaret? Yes, I do. Um, you may have seen a programme on television where the ambulance uh, paramedics themselves were quite concerned that quite a lot of them have caught COVID because they weren't sufficiently protected. They were the ambulance uh, staff. The firefighters are in a vulnerable position as drivers. Uh, I do think they should be vaccinated, as I do think teachers should, actually, as a as, um, priority. But uh, So I don't think to argue <laughs> because teachers aren't, firefighters shouldn't be. But I, I would like to speak up for them because they do put themselves Was there in a question? vulnerable. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's to do with recognising that the paramedics have also been vulnerable and have caught COVID because of not sufficient protection, uh, oh, even more reason to vaccinate. But I don't know if Terry knew that. Uh, allegedly, because they've not had particular PPE. Um, not because, you, you, allegedly, it could be other reasons why they have caught COVID. Um, it's not always PPE, but certainly, if the opportunity arises, I'll let central government decide what well, the priorities because I don't know all the facts around the priorities. And I'll leave that in the capable hands of SAGE and the experts who advise the government. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Simon Block, some question for the Conservative group. Yes, well, actually, John Hale's gone and uh, has stolen a lot of my thunder regarding uh, the recent uh, inspection by the uh, Home Office, by or well, by the, the, the inspector. Um, but I just wondered, I, I don't think you were able to get all the, the benefits of that inspection out and the recommendations that they came up with. And I, and I think no supplementary, just one question. Is there anything you would like to add to uh, uh, increase the information about that inspection? Yeah, Simon, thank you for that. There's, yeah, there's, there's a couple of areas I can. I think whilst we gave some, some consideration to the wellbeing needs of staff, and this is quite important to Simon, more needs to be done to talk to staff about the, their needs and to identify those staff, of course, the firefighters, at high risk, perhaps, as Margaret mentions, from COVID, so that we can do the, give them the right support to be put in place. That was a recommendation that came, one of the recommendations that came out from Manage Inspector. In addition, it was said wherever possible, our fire rescue service, uh, we should be planning to uh, use more remote, remote working. And certainly we're doing that when we start building and looking at how we're going to develop uh, the JESA, remote learning will be one of the opportunities we look at. And finally, I think the, uh, that uh, whilst we're quick to to uh, respond, new ways of working, also meant that we were more interacting with other services, particularly the ambulance service, and perhaps we should build on that, uh, a lasting and, and reform for our modernisation of the the uh, the, uh, the um, blue light services. So I think there's some learnings which were taken away. There was over 80 comments made by Her Majesty Inspector, 
uh, most of which were very, very positive. But we pick up the learnings and we will learn from them and take them forward. So thank you for that, Simon. Right, thank you. Um, I know it's, uh, it's, it's 20 past four, but I think we'll just press on without any more breaks because it's getting rather late in the day. Um, so can I move on then to education, libraries and localism? Questions for the executive member, please. Libraries, localism, questions for the executive member, please. From a Liberal Democrat. Um, Madam Chair, Chairman Anthony Rowlands, I'd like to... From a Liberal Democrat member. Thank you, um, Chair. I'd like to, to ask a question arising from a, a really quite concerning report on elective home education that came to the recent panel. The report said that there were only 1.2 full-time equivalent officers working across county with a rapidly rising cohort. The proposal is to fund four full-time equivalent posts over the next two years. Whilst the increase in elective home education students has predictably grown over the past year from 1,518 to 1,837, <laughs> the rising number was already apparent in the year before December 2019, when it rose from 1,374 to 1,518. My question is this, why didn't the authority recognise the trend earlier and put in place additional staffing sooner to help pupils who often need external support, even when their parents have decided to withdraw them from school. Terry. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Anthony. Um, it's always <coughs> helpful if, if you're quoting numbers to give me advance notice of this, then I can actually research the answer possibly slightly better. But uh, in terms of the numbers, uh, if you go back, there was a very useful piece of work undertaken by the University of Hertfordshire with regard to the um, the reasons between elective home education. And, and this, I think the numbers have been exacerbated by COVID. And it's very, very difficult to understand the actual reasons that parents uh, choose to undertake elective home education. In, in the survey, I think from memory, something over 50% said no reason or they wouldn't give a reason, which is very, very extremely frustrating because it doesn't allow us to plan. In terms of the numbers of members of staff, um, we reacted to this when we saw the increase, but we have to actually look and make sure that we have the budget for the additional members of staff. We also have to make sure that it's not just a, a passing situation Minute. that we are confronted with. What, minutes always go quickly when I'm talking. Um, that it's not a passing fluctuation and we are seeing this um it, it it's it's a real concern elective home education i have to say because what what we are concerned about is that parents will take their children out of school seek to elect uh, educate them at home and then want to perhaps put them back into school when it suits them and they only to find that the school places that they occupied before have now gone and they're not in the school that they would have been in before so parents have to think very carefully about why and how and when they're going to undertake elective home education. It's not something that you can actually just pick up and put down at a it's whim. It's not something that you can actually just right. pick up and put down. At a whim. Thank you. Uh, do you have a supplementary, um, Anthony? Thank you, thank Chair. You. It's uh, do you have a supplementary, Anthony? Yes, please. It's definitely not that. And the report also highlighted the government's new expectation that local authorities should play a lead role in meeting with parents who are already known to children's services and also there's a strong recommendation from government that all, pa Question, all parents please, Anthony. should meet with lo the local authority before Question, considering please, Anthony. Question, please, Anthony. Uh, my question is this is there is the portfolio holder confident that four extra staff is enough or are enough well, I, I I think that I think um, we are guided by the the uh, the officers, and I would actually take their professional advice that it probably is at this time. But it is something that we uh, we keep under constant review. And the fact that the numbers are rising or have risen, whether or not they will fall back, I don't know. But the fact that the numbers have risen um, makes us have an additional focus on elective home education. It is it's a feature that is being reflected across the whole of East of England. Um, and not that long ago, we had an East of England Local Government Association Education Children's Services meeting. Um, and and th there was a concern about um, the rise of elected EHE, as we call it, and also uh, the request which we would probably be taking forward to see if there is 
um, a requirement for children who are being e elected home educated to be uh, put on a to have a register of them because um, the only requirement at the present time is for a parent to say I am taking my child out of school and not necessarily saying exactly what they're going to do. Thank you both. Um, right, is there a question from a Labour member? There is Colette. Um, I think the elective home education is a really serious debate and, and I was interested in that, although I do know a lot of parents who are really, really looking forward to not having to continue homeschooling um, on the 8th. But my question is about libraries. Um, we've talked about our marvellous staff a lot today and our library staff, particularly in the bigger libraries where they've been able to create a service of value to people through lockdown has been second to none. My worry, though, is about the small libraries, which are dependent on volunteers, because a lot of those volunteers will be people who have been quite seriously impacted by shielding and lockdown themselves and may be quite fearful about going back into the public domain. And I wonder what we're doing to ensure that our volunteer structure in our li in our small libraries is refreshed, reassured and reassimilated so that our vital small libraries can be offering the service that we need them to be doing as quickly as possible. Thank you very much indeed, Judy. And, and you'll recall in my opening comments earlier on today, I, I paid tribute to the work of all the, the members of staff um, and the library staff no, in no small measure have actually undertaken an awful lot of work um, in, and, and stepped up to the mark. Um, you'll be aware that the reopening of libraries is part of step two and should libraries should open uh, not before the 12th of April. Now that gives us um, some period of time. And what I have written to uh, Taryn Pearson Rose and Michelle Murphy, the head of library services today, just to remind them of my um, desire that we should now start to move within the, the uh, parameters of the lockdown and, and the regulations. To, to get people back into, when I say get people back into, to uh, get to get a facilitation to allow the community libraries, which are staffed by volunteers, as you rightly say, Judy, um, back as soon as possible. I'm 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 tempted to say that as I'm tempted to say that there's a good number of um, volunteer library staff who are really passionate about their libraries and are itching to get back into their libraries but equally there will be some for whom it will be a step too far and we understand and respect that and we will be going out to recruit additional people and I think I can't remember which library it was I it might have been no I can't remember which library it was but they have actually got a waiting list oh it was Cuffley Library Cuffley Library and I believe that they have actually got a waiting list of volunteers who want to step up and, and move in when Cuffley Library which has had an awful time an absolutely awful time and has been set by all manner of difficulties um, and and three cheers for Cuffley Library when it reopens but they're ready they will be ready to go I'm very very sure. Supplementary Judy? Yes I mean that's very good to hear um, but I wonder whether Terry will undertake, since this is going to be quite a big project, I think, the uh, reopening the community libraries, would he undertake to keep um, the education, localism and libraries spokespersons um, appraised of what is being considered and the sort of programme that is being put on to do the refreshing, reassuring and reassimilating of those volunteers and new ones in our libraries? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I think in response to uh, the uh, IP scrutiny, I undertook that we would bring reports back to the Education, Libraries and Localism panel um, on, on the state of libraries and how we're getting on with those, because they are, um, however they are managed, they are very precious to Hertfordshire and I appreciate what they are. And I, I welcome the opportunity, Judy, um, for you to volunteer to man one of our volunteer libraries and I will come and shake your hand and welcome you to it. OK, I might have done it if you hadn't said that. Sorry? I might have done it if I hadn't had to shake your hand, but that's Oh, all right. Okay. Well, I'll wave from a distance. All right. That's better. Thank you. Right. Uh, I think we've got Leslie Greensmith with a question <clears throat> from the Conservative group. Leslie. Yes, can I just ask the Executive Member for Education whether he welcomes a positive commitment from the PM yesterday on schools opening fully on the 8th of March? 
Thank you very much indeed, Leslie. Um, I have to just correct you marginally because um, reading the um, the instruction and the, the comments from uh, the Secretary of State this morning, Gavin Williamson, um, and it, it does actually reaffirm what um, I believe ultimately came to pass yesterday is that um, all education settings should allow a full attendance from the 8th of March. So, in fact, we are not going to see on the on Monday, the 8th of March, um, however many thousand young people, 14,000 young people all arriving at school. But what we will be doing in in that week, we will see the primary schools up and running on the 8th of March. I'm quite sure the secondary schools need a little time to to build up because they have to go through the testing. We're also making sure that the testing process on procedures are rolled out so that uh, uh, students can be tested at home by their families. And, and uh, so it's a home testing facility, but it is going to take a week to roll it out and to build up the resilience. I, I have to say, um, as part of that, that speaking to and um, speaking to parents um, and recognising what was said in uh, Theresa Heritage's response about the, the mental condition. And, Sorry, um, because there's three mics on it, I can not possibly hear. So I could let it turn up because a lot of feedback coming through with the mic. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman, I, I'm hearing other people in the background. Right, there was a comment about microphones. Um, we've had three microphones on for everybody um, that throughout this, but ca can you carry on? And let, Leslie, if you turn yours off, maybe that's what the problem is. So, um, Terry, you're almost out of time. Uh, all I was going to say is young people are absolutely enthusiastic about going back to school. They really, really want to. And we mustn't forget how resilient our young people are. But at the same time, we have to be very mindful for those children who are who may struggle a little bit when they get back into school, having spent so much time at home um, with home home learning and being, if you like, isolated from some of their friends. But it's good news and, and, and well done to the government and all the JCVI, all the AstraZeneca. Thank you, you're out of time now, Terry. Uh, Leslie, have you got a supplementary? Yes, I have. Um, are we able to offer support and advice to the school should they need it? Um, a, a, yes, we are. B, yes, we have. And C, yes, we will. Um, I have to pay tribute to um, Jim McManus, who I will need to depart <coughs> instantly um, over to another meeting where he is doing a webinar and we have undertaken a number of webinars for young people. Um, the most recent one was last week, which was uh, well received. We had another webinar earlier on, um, which Tim Hutchins um, uh, chaired, where I think they had over a thousand people um, on, on the line, which was absolutely fantastic. To, we were uh, um, diverting people or suggesting people they go to Just Talk. That is such an important facility for young people. Um, but schools through Hearts for Learning will get a huge amount of support. They bear in mind also um, that it's not quite as daunting as it was previously because schools did open up again in September. Um, so it's not the first time round. They have had some experience of opening up for their full cohort. I should also just mention, if I may, that of course we are moving into a mandatory um, education provision, so we do expect all children to be in school. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. Right. Moving on then to the ex questions for the Executive Member for Growth, Infrastructure, Planning and Economy. Is there a question from the Labour? Liberal Democrat. Sorry, and Steve Jarvis, you put your hand up. Off you go, Steve. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we're all aware of the increased incidence of, of flooding that we've seen recently, and I'm not talking about uh, blocked highway gullies and that sort of thing. I'm talking about surface and groundwater flooding and however successful we are in the sustainability actions, that's a trend which seems likely to continue. Uh, I understand there were something like 4,000 potentially impacted properties and businesses from the floods in the county last August. And when one looks at the number of investigations that have been completed, I think the total number shown on the on the council's website is 21. Now, I have enormous time for the flood risk management team. I think they're they're exceptionally professional. They do a great job. Uh, they go beyond the call of duty to, to engage with members of the public. Uh, one of them visited a, res a resident in my division on Christmas Eve. 
so I think their commitment is, is unquestionable. Uh, but what concerns me is that they simply don't have the resources uh, to address the rising incidence of, of significant funding in the county. And I wonder if the executive member agrees with me about that and if he does, what he intends to do about it. Uh, OK, thank you, Steve. Uh, good afternoon and good afternoon, everybody. Um, we have put some extra resource in the IP for flooding. I think this is an issue that's going to um, going to uh, um, increasingly concern us over the, over the years ahead. Extreme weather uh, events are happening more frequently now, and uh, I think this is an area where we've got to um, where inevitably we're going to have to um, put in more resource um, as we go forward. Uh, it's very important, of course, that flooding incidents do get reported. And of course, there's a reluctance in some quarters to actually report flooding on the basis, of course, uh, they're worried about um, impacts on insurance and all this kind of thing. But um, I have some sympathy with uh, with the um, uh, with the inference behind the question. And I think this is something we will we'll continually return to over the next two or three years. Right. Supplementary, Steve. Well, well, I'm very pleased to hear that. I noticed that, that the uh, the IP actually shows spending on environment resource planning, which I think is the area in which the flood risk team falls in, declining by 2.6 percent from 2020 slash 21 to 22 slash 23. So I'm not sure whether that's because of some technical adjustment or whether or not there's an error in the IP, but that doesn't seem uh, consistent with what. Uh, what the executive member has said is hoping will happen. I'll uh, I'll get a uh, written explanation of a breakdown of that particular figure for you. Right, thank you. Margaret Eames Patterson for the Labour Group. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, my camera is playing up. Whoops. Am I on? You are on and we can hear you. Thank you very much. I can see you. OK, um, well, um, thank you, Derek. I'm actually going to follow up um, the question that John Hale asked in his written question, which is to do with Ellenbrook Park Preservation Trust, which has been mentioned at least three times in the last four years at a DMC meeting in 2017, 2019 and 2020, because Arlington, the landowners, promised to complete this over 20 years ago, but still haven't. You kindly have replied and have mentioned that it is their intention, the intention of Wellington Hatfield Borough Council to provide the landowner with the revised heads of, heads of terms for their agreement in the next two weeks. I would like to ask if the three county councillors can be copied into correspondence with Wellington Hatfield Borough Council and that um, as we have not heard or seen the revived heads of terms yet, please could I ask that the exec member chases this if we do not hear within the next two weeks? Yes, um, I've been assured it's imminent and we can copy in uh, correspondence, uh, Margaret. I don't think that's a problem. Thank you. Oh, supplementary? Well, just that the, the, the population of Hatfield are quite concerned about this. It is the public park, the only public park for Hatfield that was proposed. And uh, we have been waiting for both Welling Hatfield Borough Council and the landowners Arlington to keep their promise. And I feel quite strongly that as the County Council, we can try to in, make sure that really does happen. Well, we're, sure we're doing our best, uh, Margaret, and I can assure you, I know officers of this authority are as frustrated as, uh, as you and a number of other members are. Right. Do we have a question from the Conservative group? Do we have a question from the Conservative group? No, and I've lost sight of Derek. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Oh. <laughs> OK, I'll well, next. Ask yourself a question, if you like. <laughs> right. Well, if there aren't any questions from the Conservative um, uh, members, we'll move on to highways and environment. Um, are you there, Phil? I'm here. Thank you. Um, right. Do we have a question from the Liberal Democrat group for the executive member? Uh, we, we do collect from myself, Stephen Giles, yes. Matt Hurst. Right. Uh, in relation to the IWP and item OP 105, 
where there is an expenditure of 8.470 million on highways correspondence. Can the executive member please explain the reason for this and how many staff are currently employed and why there is a requirement for three extra members of staff? If I refer you back to our recent cabinet panel, panel Steve, and you asked the exact same question, uh, Faisal did attempt to answer it, but obviously not to your um, satisfaction. I think that's a mis misleading figure, and it's unfortunate that has been transferred into actual fact. I will get Stephen to actually give a written response to that one, if you don't mind. And a supplementary? I did ask for a written response at the Highway and the Environment Cabinet panel uh, over, to, over a week ago. I've yet to receive it, hence the question is raised again. If it is misleading, what else is misleading within the IWP in that case? But that is a completely stupid and unfair question. <laughs> right, on that note, um, move over to, uh, any, uh, is there any questions from the Labour group? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Sorry. Assi, that's Eve. Go yes, ahead. Uh, yes. I was saying, potholes uh, is not going to be the topic of my question. Uh, uh, as uh, as trees are the world's lungs, uh, they improve and they also improve the street scene. Um, so what can the portfolio holder do to further enhance the planting along the highways and byways of Hertfordshire? Um, uh, I don't know if you were around when I actually gave a response to the verbal question at the beginning of Council. Uh, but I did explain that we are formulating our strategy in line with national strategy. We are working with all different agencies within the county council, that's property, estates, countryside, rights of way, to come up with a cohesive strategy to um, honour our pledges under the um, sustainability agenda and our pollinator strategy. Um, I, we are not giving any commitment at the moment as to what we're going to plant on the highways. I will point out that it's not always appropriate to plant trees on highways because they do tend to um, destroy our assets and also the assets of utilities. I know there are species of trees that can be appropriate, but we are very careful where we replace trees because it's not always appropriate to plant one for one, etc. But the strategy is emerging. I am frustrated myself in the time it's taken, but we're still waiting for the government strategy and it would be foolhardy for us to come out with ours without looking at what the government comes up in in the, the end of the day no, no, yeah yes thanks for that response and uh, I, I think it's important uh, for me that uh, targets are set uh, very well so for example other countries had targets of a billion trees as an example to be planted and to replace the existing ones and if we are to tackle uh, climate change and if we are to improve the lungs of Hertfordshire in our towns and this country I think the quicker and the sooner that we get uh, a strategy in place and put targets in for trees uh, would be a great thing. Wouldn't you agree? I would certainly agree, but you also fail to recognise the tens of thousands of trees we are planting across the county in suitable locations. Highways isn't always the most suitable location. If it was, then we will plant trees there. Um, you're making it sound as though Hertfordshire is not planting trees, quite the opposite. Thank you. Right. Uh, is there a question from a Conservative member? No. Yes. Right. Well, yes. Oh. Sorry. Yes. Yes, please, Chair. Sorry. Right. Sorry, Annie. Off you go. Yeah, no, it's fine. Sorry, I had trouble getting my hand up. Thank you very much. If yes, I'd like to ask um, uh, the executive member, well, I'd like to, I think you um, saw that we had cross chamber or we now cross virtual chamber support for uh, addressing the dangers on the A5183, which is the Redbourne to St Albans Road. And I'm really keen if you're able to give um, us all an update on the progress uh, made on that road. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Yes, as, as we all know, the council is very concerned about the numbers and severity of the accidents along that stretch of road, and we can only sympathise with those involved. Uh, as you know, we have had extensive meetings, including yourself, and discussions to include the PCC, who has agreed to jointly fund the feasibility study by WSP to decide on what measures are needed to make the road safer. This may include new segregated cycle way that could not be included in the tranche two bid from the active travel funds, 
uh, although not guaranteed, I'm saying it could include that as a, as a possible measure, other engineering measures and obviously enforcement if that's necessary. Uh, whilst it's wrong to say speed is the only factor here or the main contributing factor, the PCC has arranged interim enforcement measures and it's quite active in the area and is open to longer term um, enforcement if this proves to be necessary and recommended by the feasibility study. Uh, please be assured we take this matter very seriously, but we need to fully al analyse the problem before taking precipitate action to make sure we get it right and make that road fit for the future. All right. uh, supplementary, Annie? Um, it was only, um, if you've got, have you got any idea when the feasibility study might be completed, please? Uh, the last thing I heard is uh, by um, early summer. Okay, thank you. Right, that brings us to the end of questions for executive members. Moving swiftly on to item 6B, uh, written questions to executive members, standing order 8, bracket 9. Um, um, written questions uh, to executive members have been received and the questions and written replies are appended to this order uh, of business. Moving on then to item 7, 8 and 9 and 10, the time limits for speeches in the debate on items 7, 8, 9, 10 is mover of motion, five minutes, first speaker from each each of the other groups or the speaker nominated, five minutes, all other speakers, including the mover of the motion when exercise their right of reply, three minutes. So uh, agenda item seven, report from the overview and scrutiny committee. Can I invite David Andrews to move the motion, please? Thank you very much, Madam <laughs> Chairman. And if you will okay, permit me to- We should have a comfort break. I have put my hand up now for, for some minutes and we're not going to have a short and very short comfort break right Stephen I did say that uh, we were just going to press on um, unless it's impossible for, for what what is where, where do I go with this one right three minute break now please everyone Stephen, you're not responding. Can we have the three minute comfort break. Right, God dear. He's probably gone. <laughs> yeah, he's already gone anyway. Stay he with it, Killer. You're doing a great job. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> I just you. turn my screen off and go. <laughs> right. So was I. I don't know why we have to have it formal. <laughs> well. I think you're doing Brill, Colette. I really do. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but.
50 and we are uh, going to resume. David, now then, I'd just ask you whether you wanted to move the motion when um, Stephen indicated that he um, needed to leave the room for a moment. So off you go. Thank you very much. I was cut off in my prime, as they say. Um, Ma Madam Chairman, permit me to propose the report tabled by the Overview and Scrutiny Committee uh, uh, today. And in so doing, as we move towards the end of this administration, I should like, with your permission, to thank all the members for the support they've shown um, during the work of the Overview and Scrutiny process at Hertfordshire County, County Council in this, in this administration. Um, my particular thanks go to those of you who've sat on or contributed to our integ integrated plan meetings and also the topic groups over the last few years. Um, I would like to, from the report, just draw members' attention to 1.8 on the back page, substance misuse um, webinar on the 8th of March, Monday week. Um, love to see you there. Uh, an Outlook invitation will drop into your diary shortly. Um, finally, in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the superb support uh, our committee and its groups have received from the officers of this council and many, many stakeholders during this administration. Um, and particularly, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to the amazing support we've received from the scrutiny officer team. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I invite Nigel Quinton to second as lead speaker for the Liberal Democrat group? Yes, thanks, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, David. I, I totally endorse what you just said about the uh, support we've had. Um, I think it's been very constructive for the year I've been involved. Um, and thanks for your patience with me, um, which I'm sure at times has been stretched. Um, the only other thing I did want to comment on was something that came up in the discussion this morning quite a few times about the budget process. And as I know it's come up in comments back on the IP scrutiny process. Um, and I hope that I'm not quite sure what the timing will be. I presume probably I'll have to wait until after May now. Um, but if we can have a cross party approach to how we run IP scrutiny in future and how we get other parties ideas involved earlier in the process, which I think might help with um, some of the comments we've had earlier on today. Um, it was something that came up in the training we had from Centre for whatever it's called now, uh, governance and scrutiny. Um, but uh, yeah, and I know, I know David, you've, you've um, expressed a, a view that uh, is something we, we should look at. So hopefully we can do either before or after May. Right. Thank you. Right. And can I invite Lynn Chesterman, lead speaker for the Labour Group, to speak, please? Chair, I, this is Judy Billing, it's not Lynn Chesterman. I'm only um, butting in here to say that I think Lynn has had to go oh, for, right. for childcare domestic reasons. Right. Um, okay. And so she won't be contributing to this debate. Right. So, OK, um, then moving on then to the debate. So uh, speakers have three minutes. Does anybody wish to contribute to the debate? Chair, I don't have a hand Sorry. raise function, but I had put a message in the chat to ask if I might speak. Yes, you may. Sarah. Is that OK? Thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to um, speak about the same issue as Nigel Quinton uh, spoke on, but from a slightly different angle. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, I've been uh, I've been on the council since 2008 now, and every year I've asked for um, some oversight of the budget process rather than the very detailed work that uh, has always gone on in IP before. This year we've had a very successful uh, strategic overview part of the IP um, scrutiny. I'm very grateful for that. It's been extremely helpful uh, to me and I'm sure the other participants in it. So thank you for that. But I know uh, Councillor Andrews has expressed some concern about the whole process of the IP and how it works. And uh, I do hope, um, as Nigel does, that we're going to have uh, some proper um, some proper review of the IP process. Uh, there have been a couple of references during the debate this morning uh, and early this afternoon to um, opposition parties putting their ideas for budget into the IP process. I'm afraid with the current command and control approach to the IP scrutiny, it's virtually impossible to do that. So I hope that there will be a, a cross-party 
review of how the IP process is undertaken. Like Nigel, I don't expect that will happen till after the elections now, um, and it may be a different administration uh, doing that review, but I do hope it takes place anyway. And I'm grateful for uh, Councillor Andrew's understanding of uh, the difficulties some of us have had uh, through the IP process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, now I've issued the invitation to debate and I've got two hands up, Paul Sikowski, Stephen Giles Medhurst and Tim Hutchings, your camera's on. Right, off you go, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman. I, I just wanted to make sure it was me that you were expecting to speak at that point <laughs> after, after you, you listed people. Um, yeah, I just want to um, uh, agree very much with uh, what Sharon said about the, the changes to the IP that we've seen this year. I think they were excellent and uh, extraordinarily useful. Uh, I think what came out of the IP group that I that I chaired on the, the strategic overview that Sharon was a, a very valuable member of um, is that um, the, there did need to be some changes and, and it was reflected, I think, in uh, some of the um, uh, it, there was an opportunity there to start rolling some of the things in that subsequently the Liberal Democrat groups amendment uh, relied on. Um, and I, I'm I'm very intrigued to see how those pan out as we as we go forward. Um, and uh, I hope the modifications that we've seen, I reiterate the, the message that have been said already. Um, I hope the modifications that we've seen are a part of an evolutionary process and we will see subsequent changes to the IP uh, in, in future years. Thank you. Oh, um, Stephen Giles Medhurst. Uh, th thank you, Chair, and I appreciate you allowing a comfort break there after an hour and a half, one plus. Thank you for that. Um, in terms, uh, th and I think, um, uh, th David, in terms of the review of the IPRE process that's going to go forward, I have to say I haven't attended two of the, the sessions, uh, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, that was a very, very much chalk and cheese. But I have to say I did feel it was very much, as Sharon has already said, a command and control process, i.e. no more than three recommendations and ideally only one. Um, don't ask questions on this, don't ask questions on that. Um, that to me is not a scrutiny review of the budget process. We should be allowed to ask questions on any subject. Equally, I think that I certainly had concerns at the time restrictions that were imposed upon us in terms of asking those questions. Uh, and be able to delve down in it some of the issues uh, arising from that. Uh, and related to that, I have to say I do have some concessions, not concerns, and I have raised this elsewhere, the inability of us to allow um, members of the public to address uh, the council's panels when there is a subject that is county-wide that comes up. Uh, and I will use the example, and this was in relation to a school crossing control person wanting to speak to the council in relation to a report that had been brought forward in relation to body cams, but they weren't. That to me seems a way we could have engaged the public a bet for three minutes and listened to someone in that position. Uh, and so I think if future administrations, are, and I hope they will be, more open and more accountable, we can allow for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Judy Billing. Thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief. I've already raised many of these issues. I've raised them through leaders group. I've had discussions with David Andrews. Um, I raised on the um, first day of the IP scrutiny the issue of greater transparency, allowing the public to hear our deliberations in some of the small groups. But I can see absolutely no purpose in us conducting the review here and now that's been established at this time of day on a fairly fraught County Council day. So let's leave it and do a proper review um, in well in time for next year's process. Thank you. Right, are there any other uh, uh, councillors who wish to contribute to the debate? If not, then, uh, right, Nigel Quinton, you've already spoken, so I'll move straight to David Andrews to exercise his right of reply. And David, you have three minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I'll, I'll keep it short. Yes, um, I, I, I welcome the comments from the contributors. Um, I'm part of that process myself. Uh, the IP process has in the past uh, attracted attention from a number of peer authorities and has, in, has some have been kind enough to call it an exemplar. But things move on and processes must develop. 
um, and we are definitely at that stage. I can't speak for the next administration. We don't know where it is or what it is, but if I'm part of it, or even if I'm not part of it, I will very happily uh, support uh, the, the evolution, the positive evolution of, of the IP process. It is a good process. It will be better. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Right. We now move to a vote and um, it's the usual um, voting panel in the middle of your screen and voting in the chat box. And basically you're voting for if you accept the report, voting against if you don't want to, and if and, and you can also abstain. So so for, against or abstain. Um, oh, and... Checking that the chat box is okay. Yep. Right, we have a, a majority for that. Um, um, we've got 50. Oh, somebody's changed their mind. No, 50 um, f voting to accept the report. So that, that motion has been dealt with. Um, moving on to item eight, report from the Health Scrutiny Committee. Um, can I invite Seamus Quilty to move the motion? Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I move the motion, uh, the report in my name as laid out in the papers on agenda item eight. And um, I reserve my right to speak. Uh, just before that, though, I would like to echo the words that uh, my colleague um, David Andrews just said in relation to everyone that has helped, particularly in, in my committee, in the Health Scrutiny Committee. Um, we act as a, uh, a critical friend to the health world. At times it can be very fraught, it can be very complicated, and I'm very, very lucky to have the support of a very, very good scrutiny officer team led by Natalie uh, in, 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 in Natalie Rotherham. And, you know, it, it, without, without her support, it would have been extremely difficult. And I would also like to say thank you to my vice chairman at this point, um, Chris, uh, Chris, who, who is really, who, who's, who's been a, a very, very good um, vice chairman. He's worked hard, due diligence. He's, he's done. He, he, he keeps me um, on my toes, if I could say that. And, um, you know, I think we've worked very well as a team over the last uh, four years. So uh, thank you again. And I move the report in my name. Thank you. Can I invite Chris White to second? Uh, um, you have five minutes, Chris. Well, well I couldn't not after that. Um, <laughs> but uh, if I can formally second and reserve my right, yeah. Um, um, yeah. I suspect I will be speaking fairly soon. Indeed. Um, can I invite Margaret Eames Patterson as lead speaker for the Labour Group to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. I just wanted to mention something, Seamus, that it's come to my attention that some elderly housebound residents of Hertfordshire over 70 have not been vaccinated yet. <laughs> I'm particularly concerned about BAME, um, Black African and Minority Ethnic Residents, um, and those who have dementia and those who could be special educational needs at home who haven't been vaccinated. Could I ask you as chair to follow up um, how we could do a scrutiny to just um, make sure that the primary care networks, particularly who we work with and the GPs, are redressing this as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. If I could come back really quickly on that, and then, um, Madam Chairman, uh, uh, I, I think it's it. Sorry, it's not a. It's not a question and answer. Yeah. Um, oh, right, then. Margaret okay. is speaking, uh, has um, uh, voiced her 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 views as it were. She started with us two days a week at the end of last year. And then. Uh, so we're actually we're actually in debate. It's not question and answer. So, um, are there any other as uh, speakers who wish to take part, if so, you have three minutes. Silence. Um, Chris White, do you wish to um, um, exercise your right to? Yeah, to yes, in a number of ways. I mean, first of all, uh, I would like to also to thank the officer team. I'd also like to thank the NHS because um, uh, the NHS is, is, is loved, but also criticised when it comes to planning and admin, and uh, they have by and large, and most particularly recently, cooperated extremely well with uh, the committee. I would also say that uh, 
we have been careful during the pandemic not to do the routine um, scrutiny that we would have done otherwise because they had other things on their mind. So thanks to them, thanks to the officer team and, and also thanks to Seamus uh, who ha has, has been a fine chair and very easy to work with. And uh, whilst we, we didn't plan this in advance, uh, uh, Chairman, um, uh, it, it is a great committee to be a member of, both as vice chair, but also generally it's important work. And I would f finally like to thank those who sat in on uh, all day scrutinies of a technical nature. It, it's a huge watch of time and pre preparation. And so those members, including members of district councils have done that, uh, need, need our full thanks. Uh, in, in terms of um, Margaret Eames, uh, Pittson's comment. Um, yeah, I think we, we do have to look carefully at, at that list of people that she said. It's not, in fact, entirely comprehensive. One of the things we need to check out on, for instance, is uh, homeless people. I and mean, the government has been urging us to ensure that homeless people are registered with GPs. That is easier said than done in the nature of uh, the, the, the clientele that we are dealing with. So there's a number of aspects uh, that we need to track. Uh, the BAME part of it was covered at the last meeting. However, I think we retain concerns about uh, vaccine um, hesitancy there. Uh, it's not an anti-vaxxer issue, it's a hesitancy. And I do applaud strongly those people, particularly some of the mosques who produced some fabulous videos who've tried to encourage uh, certainly um, the Muslim section of BAME uh, to trust the vaccines and, and take them up. But we're not out of the wood there yet. And therefore, uh, some uh, relatively quick work uh, does clearly need to be done because we do need to get everyone vaccinated. So that would be my take on it. Uh, Seamus obviously will make his own comments. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Right, Seamus, would you like to exercise your reply, right of reply? And you have three minutes. I will, and um, I will leave the report where it is because everybody can read that. But I will say to everyone today that I will be speaking to um, scrutiny officers tomorrow um, in relation to items that were raised today in relation by, by Margaret and Chris. And we will see if we can do something quickly to satisfy those uh, queries. Thank, Thank you, you, Seamus. Right, we move to to the vote. So, if you um, the 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 uh, oh, the poll box will be popping up on your screen soon and in the chat uh, function. If you want to accept the report, vote for. If you don't want to accept it, vote against. And if you're abstaining, you press the abstain. Right, we have a majority um, uh, of votes for four, um, so that uh, that um, report has been accepted. Right, moving on to pay policy um, 2021-22. Uh, can I invite Ralph Sangster to move the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, um, this pay. I, I, I move the um, uh, the motion. Uh, in my name. Uh, th uh, this pay policy was agreed by the Employment Committee at their meeting on the 12th of February 2021. Uh, it is a statutory requirement for HCC to publish its pay policy each year under the Localism Act. Uh, the only meaningful changes to the pay policy for this year was, the, uh, it was in relation to the introduction of the 95k exit cap uh, for employees. Um, However, late, p late afternoon on the 12th of February, uh, following the Employment Committee arrange, uh, agreement to the revised policy, government withdrew the proposed uh, 95k exit cap uh, and uh, uh, somewhat uh, threw the whole situation into a bit of a, a spin. Um, I think the, the issue here is that uh, this, uh, this, this policy uh, uh, is needing needs to be agreed because we need to have one in existence. But the the whole process is going to be reviewed by the Employment Committee at its next meeting, and a revised policy will be brought forward to the next council meeting, which will eliminate the changes which have been in, in, implemented within the policy regarding the 95k cap. Uh, so uh, we, we what we're doing here is is we are approving something because we need to have it in position 
uh, but its effect will be changed by a, a, a revised uh, a, a revised policy brought forward at the next um, uh, committee uh, council meeting having gone through the necessary processes of the employment committee so all we all we're really doing here is accepting that we need one and we and we are adopting it in the interim thank you right can I invite bob deering to second please uh, thank you, Colette. Uh, I'm happy to second this. I reserve my right to speak, but at ten past five, hope that won't be necessary. Thank you. Right. Um, right. I'd like to invite Stephen Giles Medhurst, lead speaker for the Liberal Democrats, to, to speak. Stephen, you have five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, that's a great opportunity, Colette. No, actually, no, there's no issues on this one. We clearly have to have this as a policy. I'm pleased the governments seem to have had a rethink over the cap. Uh, uh, and let's move on. Thank you. Uh, can I invite Nigel Bell, lead speaker for the Labour Group, to speak? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, I support the pay policy as agreed at the Employment Committee on the 12th of February, where I was a substitute for Councillor Billing. Uh, we also take into account the government removing the restriction of public sector exit payments regulations 220 that came into force on November the 4th. We accept, therefore, paragraphs 911 and 924 of the original report have been removed regarding the process for managing termination payments. We also note 4.1 and 4.2 regarding the pay of the Chief Executive and that if any pay increase is agreed by 1st of April, this obviously will need to be updated and the Employment Committee look again. Uh, we also accept that this time and take into account the current economic situation that no increases have been recommended for senior officers. I do just have to mention, however, paragraph 7.3 on sick pay and in particular 7.3.1 uh, that the Labour Group feel that the first two days of sickness not being paid, that we only go along with that at the moment because we do understand that officers are working on this and we hope that the Council takes note not only of unison but staff views and that this will be remedied and that the first days of those two first, day, the first days of sickness will be paid in the very near future. Uh, so uh, other than that, you know, we do, I do support and I will vote for this policy. Thank you. OK, um, are there any other speakers? I've got no indications. Um, Bob, do you want to exercise your right? It's very nice of you to ask, Colette, but I think we're all on the same page, so no thank you. OK, Ralph Sangster, um, exercise your right. Thanks, uh, Colette. Just just to confirm that I, and my understanding uh, in relation to sick pay is, as Nigel has uh, mentioned, that it is being considered as part of an overall uh, restructuring of uh, uh, of pay policy. So uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm appreciative of his position. Right. Thank you. Right. We will then move now move to the vote. And again, if you uh, uh, want to accept, uh, you vote for. If you don't want to, it's against and abstaining. As soon as the screens come up, here we go. I haven't got anything. Mine was a bit slow, Colette, but it comes up eventually. Yeah. I think I'll go into the chat bar. <laughs> yeah. there we are. Sure I wanted to know that, Ralph. <laughs> 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 I was so tempted. <sighs> you have to resist. Right. Um, the votes are, uh, I've got 53-4, so that has been carried. Moving on then to item 10, which is the programme of meetings for September 2021 to July 2022. Uh, can I invite David Williams to, meet, to move the motion? Thank you, Chair. So with the papers, um, the outline schedule for the um, year from uh, September 2021 has been circulated. Uh, it has been discussed by group leaders, so Stephen and Judy. Um, I'm moving the motion in my name, namely that Council agrees the programme for Council and Cabinet meetings. And it's just fair to say that the pattern of Council meetings follows the pattern that we started in 2020, namely a meeting in October, a meeting in December, uh, the um, um, budget meeting in February, and then an annual uh, a, 
an annual meeting on steroids um, in the uh, in the summer. So um, hopefully that is supported by everybody as far then as the committees and cabinet panels are concerned. That's an indicative programme at this stage. Thank so you. I move the motion in my name, Chair. Thank you, David. Um, Theresa Heritage to second, please. Um, I second and reserve my right to reply. Right. Stephen Giles Medhurst um, invited to speak for the Lib Dems. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And this, I believe, is the last item on the agenda. Uh, I don't have, we don't have an issue with the programme meeting as currently set out. Uh, I've raised some other minor concerns with David in relation to the, the gap between the uh, November meeting and the May in terms of executive reports, but that's the minor thing. But, but as is this the last item on the agenda and there is not a further council meeting before May, firstly, on behalf of my group, I'd like to thank you, Chairman, for the way you have chaired these meetings, particularly this last year. Uh, and your forbearance and patience with all of us, and, mm -hmm. I, all, and I say all of us in, in those terms, uh, and obviously the work that you uh, and your consul have undertaken uh, representing the county council. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, all those councillors who are voluntarily standing down uh, in May and therefore not seeking re-election and for their contribution uh, to the council, whether it be for the last four years or it be for rather longer periods of time. And there are a number, I believe, on all sides of the chamber. And naturally, I would also like to thank anyone else who involuntarily is standing down come the May the 6th and the electorate will decide that equally for their contributions. Clearly, obviously, there are differences of political opinions in terms of how things should be done and how things should be weighed out. But I hope, as I have said before in the council meeting, when we've been in the actual chamber, we all have aspirations to make Hertfordshire a better place and to serve the residents to the best of our abilities. And I'm sure that all of us try to do so in whatever way possible. So I think it is a, a tribute that actually those people are seeking re-election wants to continue to to, to serve the residents of Hertfordshire in that way. Uh, and obviously I thank everyone else for their contributions. But in terms of that, I'd also particularly again like to reinforce and thank not only the senior management team, owing all the way down to other officers, but also the very much the junior officers, so many of which I've had day-to-day -day interfaces with, and the, their ability, I have to say, particularly the last 12 months, to go the extra mile uh, and I won't ne necessarily name individual out. I have actually personally thanked them and sent to their senior managers. Thank you. No, the ability of officers to ring back, suddenly jump on a team's meeting and sort something out within half an hour has been phenomenal. And it shows actually the wealth of experience and ability of staff to cope with the new environment and their dedication to serve all the residents of Hertfordshire. So that effectively, I suppose, is an end of term speech, shall we say. Uh, for that. Uh, but I wish everyone well. And I hope, obviously, uh, subject to other restrictions being relaxed, in, in the fullness of time, we're able to meet uh, face to face, or at least closer, shall we say, than through the screen. Well, I think it has some benefits of having shorter meetings in terms of briefings with officers, which will continue, I'm quite sure, virtually. Uh, but obviously, the ability to be able to have an interface and a private conversation down the corridor, shall we say, David and Judy, about things. Uh, can be of some considerable benefit on occasions, uh, rather than having the virtual meeting. Uh, but thank I thank you, you once again, Chair. Thank you, and thank you for your very kind words. They're very much appreciated. Judy. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, all of that, um, except that I think the kindest thing we could actually do just now is to let you go and have a cup of tea uh, and get away from this meeting. I, I don't know how you've done it. I, or, or gin or whatever. Um, I couldn't have chaired a meeting of, of seven and a half hours um, under these circumstances, staring at screens. Um, and so my heart really does go out to you on that. Um, I would also like to thank all the staff, uh, but I would do it um, from Owen upwards, actually, rather than um, Owen downwards, as Stephen put it. So I think it's just a slightly different um, way of looking about uh, our staffing structures. Um, last point I want to make is actually on the report we're meant to be discussing, um, which is um, that I hope it doesn't turn out to have been the fiercest fought campaign for me for the whole of the last um, um, county council. But getting that bleeding timetable changed um, did seem to be ferociously difficult. 
And I wanted to thank people for finally giving in because they couldn't bear to hear me going on about it anymore. But I do think it's actually improved um, our democracy, our opportunities for debate. Um, I just hope that when we get back into some sort of normal, we can start having some sort of normal length meetings again. I don't know why this is happening, but we've got to work on it. Uh, so I support I support the timetable of meetings. What a fabulous thing to be able to do to support a timetable of meetings. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Judy. Um, are there any other speakers? I. It's not that's not it. Well, it's an invitation, but. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, Theresa Heritage, do you wish to reserve your uh, exercise, your right to reply? How long have I got? Um, no, uh, no, I have nothing else to say. Thank you, Madam Chair, except again, can I thank you as well for your forbearance today? Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I invite David to exercise his right of reply? So, yes, I just want to add my thanks, Colette, as unflappable as ever. Thank you so much for chairing this meeting and for your term as uh, as chairman as well. Uh, I know that uh, it would have been fantastic for you to have been able to spend more time with uh, out and about representing the county. Uh, yeah. But in the time that you have served as chair, you've been absolutely superb. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'll save my words for uh, another day. I'll hand over the chair in May. Uh, right, um, members, um, the last time, can we do that vote, please? So um, we're voting on the programme uh, for the meeting in September. So we're just waiting for the um, screen to come. Oh, I got the, oh, here we are. Right. So we have got screens. So four, if you want to accept and submit and the chat function. And I've got 44 responses, 100% for. So um, I'm, I'm almost going to declare the end of the meeting. I just I need to say a, a brief thank you. I want to thank the the officer team here with me today. Um, the the council meetings couldn't happen uh, without them, and they have been so responsive to the challenges, particularly of trying to cope with the virtual meetings and, and coping with all of us too. And uh, I would say it's been absolutely uh, fabulous, but I'll say, I shall say more in May. Um, the meeting is now ended. Go home, relax. Thank you. Bye. We are home. We are home. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Colette. You've been brilliant. What we'd like to be doing is going somewhere Bye. other Colette, than home. Colette, you were superb. Well okay. done. Well done, Colette. Goodbye. Well done.